मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन मुझे सुन सकते हैं यस यू कैन गुड मॉर्निंग मैम गुड मॉर्निंग मैं बस आप सबसे आप एट ट्वेंटी एट हो गए हैं आपका एट थर्टी का सेशन है आप सबसे सब एक मिनट चाहूंगा अपनी अटेंडेंस प्लीज मार्क करवाइएगा और बिल्कुल एट थर्टी पे ही हम इस सेशन को स्टार्ट करेंगे काफी सुबह सुबह का वक्त है उम्मीद कम रहती है कि सभी एकदम से एट थर्टी पे ही ज्वाइन करें देर सवेर होना लाजमी है खासकर जबकि शनिवार हो तो पर फिर भी हम अपने टाइम पे ही स्टार्ट करते हैं इसे मैं वन बाय वन आप सभी का नाम लूंगा हालांकि जितने लोग मौजूद हैं नाम लेने की भी जरूरत नहीं है बट फिर भी आप फॉर्मेलिटी के लिए सही पर अपनी अटेंडेंस मांग करवाइए शिवशंकर जी शिवशंकर यस सर थैंक यू सर बस आपकी अटेंडेंस यस कहना ही आपका काफी है शुक्रिया ओके थैंक यू आप सुबह सुबह हमारे लिए क्लास के लिए आए उसी के लिए बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया थैंक यू थैंक यू वेद प्रकाश सिंह वेद प्रकाश जी अभी नहीं है पंकज चौहान पंकज चौहान जी हैं नाम तो मैं उनका देख सकता हूँ आगा भूषण मिस्टर नागा भूषण इज देयर नवीन चंद्रा नवीन त्रिपाठी जी हैं हेलो वी हेलो या गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग यस गुड मॉर्निंग मैम विरल चेतन विरल चेतन शिवराम राजू शिवराम राजू भरत कुमार भरत कुमार पाटिल शैलेंद्र सिंह शैलेंद्र सिंह विशाल विशाल ननकानी गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग ऋतुराज मिश्रा ऋतुराज मिश्रा शुभम विकास विकास जी हैं क्लास में आशीष आशीष क्लास में दो आशीष है मगर भी एक भी नहीं आया आवेश आवेश आयुष्मान आयुष्मान अगेन आशीष आशीष जी है वैसे अभी भी ज्वाइन किया है आप सभी के लिए जैसे आपने अभी अपना कैमरा ऑन रखा है प्लीज आपके बाद भी जो लोग आए आप आपस आपकी फैकल्टी भी आपको यही कहते हैं मैं भी यही रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा कि प्लीज पूरे दिन अपने सेशन के लिए अपना कैमरा ऑन करके रखिएगा क्लास के लिए बेहद जरूरी है प्लीज सर प्लीज मेक योर वीडियो कैमरा ऑन फॉर द फुल डे इट्स वेरी नेसेसरी फॉर योर अटेंडेंस एट्स इट्स मे कम्फर्टेबल एटमोसफेयर फॉर योर क्लास ऑल्सो शुड बी कंटिन्यू एम आई ऑडिबल कंटिन्यू कीजिए ओके थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन 
good morning good morning, good morning. Are we all? yesterday okay. was ethics and accounts and today we are going with uh, law so too heavy yesterday law. yes yes it was too heavy yesterday it was too heavy so let's me how what makes it heavy tell me the ingredient that make it heavy ethics was not at all heavy i suppose ma'am because... economics my macro okay, economics. micro Okay, then tell about me. I don't know about others. I said, well, "How did I make the recipe so heavy?" <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Okay. You. Okay, okay, okay. So don't worry. Uh, you know, uh, we need to take some pain pains for having gains. So you, uh, be assured, after this much pain, you will be having many gains in future. Okay? okay. So you can bear that. I know, right? So today you have to behave like a lawyer. okay whatever the question observation i will ask from you you have to give like a lawyer okay so you are ready to become a lawyer today yes is that so yes ma'am yes ma'am okay so let's start our session as rahul ji have already said you please keep your videos on we are repeating it again and again because it is a mandate by ibbi and also it is required for a you know life uh, life full of our uh, session can be happen just by you know seeing each other so that's very important to have a dialogue rather than a, rather than a monologue okay so let's start as you can see it has been displayed that we are going to see law general so it means that we are having the laws which are very general okay it is a day to day law not a very technical laws like you know like you have to remember the sections and all no not at all you don't need to remember any sections and as per my observation also in my examination i didn't got a single question regarding the sections and all so you just need to understand the concept that's it i will not start my slide before i can uh, before i want to have observation from your side see we are going to see indian contract act okay so a simple question to you people there are two words contract agreement are they both synonym can we use them interchangeably or are they both different things i want your observations because examiner is going to check the same in you yes please can i have a views over this uh, yes please both are different. different both are different so tell me the points of their difference if you can uh, speak that is also okay i got the point different i want the logic of the difference what is the main uh, you know thin line uh, difference between the two as when i was a layman i was in first year i used to think agreement and contract they both are same things they both they both the both words could be used interchangeably now you people tell me what is the difference between the two Yes, please. I am waiting for your reply. I will not move forward until and unless I know your understanding upon that. As a layman understanding, I am talking about. I am not talking about any technical understanding. What you feel as a layman? Ma'am, contract uh, is a proposal. An agreement is the uh, deal. Uh, agreement is a deal. Yes. contract but contract is also you know kind of both the parties are it is the proposal the... actually it is the proposal ah uh, vishal ji no it is not the case it is not the case actually not only you uh, when i i have also not done my law nca i used to uh, think the same as you are thinking upon today we will see the main difference between agreement and a contract because you know many participants make a mistake for the same in the examination because uh, examiner knows that you don't know the internal part of both of them so just understand agreement and contract they both are two very different things how now what is the difference now you were telling me regarding offer right right with uh, vishal ji so yes. suppose i offered you will you purchase my car at rupees 4 lakh 
Vishal ji told me, yes, Neha, I will definitely purchase your car at rupees 4 lakh. So that means I'm offering something and you are accepting the same. Am I correct? Yeah. I'm correct. Right. Okay. Right. So what we are doing when both the persons are agreeing upon the same thing, what is it? We are doing a agreement. Agreement is basically that both the persons are agreeing on the same thing. Now, suppose I agreed you that I will sell you my car. Suppose on the executed day, I say no to you. I will not sell car to you. What you will, uh, what you will do then? Can you go to the court that Neha oh. have breached her promise? Though she promised to uh, sell her uh, car to me, but she didn't. Can you move to the court? Yes or no? No, because no. There, there is no like, contract between both. No, we are having a contract, no, sir. We both have agreed upon the same thing in the same sense. So we are agreeing, we are doing a contract. Okay. Okay. So I, uh, before I explain contract and agreement, I think one thing I need to notify you uh, before. That is one more question on the way. Question on a question. That is, are what kinds of contracts are allowed in court? Written contract, oral contract, C, both of them, D, none of the above. A is written, B is oral, C is both, D is none. And then written contract. Written contract. So here examiner will take advantage of you of minus one fourth. How? <laughs> uh, because you people think no, if it is a contract, then that must be a A4 size paper, 12, 10 points written over there and a signature below that. But friends, it is not only that. Indian contract law give full support not only to the written contract as well as to oral contract. First point, please note it down. However, you want to note it down. We uh, we tackle both type of contracts, whether it is a written or it is a oral in courtroom. There is nowhere written that it should be only written contract over which we can have a case upon. Number four, this point is clear to everyone. That both are included, whether it is a oral or it is a written. But as I told you that oral is also, you know, oral also get full respect in the courtroom. You must be thinking that Neha, how we will prove it, uh, it in the court? How we can, you know, prove the oral things and all? So see, it is the job of the lawyer, not your job. The thing is, in written contract, definitely it is very easy to prove the things. In oral contract, it is a tougher, but it is not a impossible. And if you feel like that, no, no, oral things cannot be proved in the court. So tell me one thing. Whenever a murder happens, does murder, uh, murder uh, happens in a written form? The uh, murderer writes, I have murdered this person. No, no. Still the investigations happen and they find the real murderer. So the investigations are more in case of the oral one. But oral gets full respect in court. Okay. One point is clear. Now. Now, second point, again, I'm coming with the Vishalji only, our car uh, matter. Okay, Vishalji, we have done a contract. Uh, so, I said, you know, I breach my commitment. Will you go to the court? No, I will not say, will you go to the court? Can you go to the court? Because will is your, uh, you know, uh, itcha. Can you go to the court? Yes, ma'am. Definitely, you can go. Okay, it is your wish. If you want to go, you can. If you don't want to. You do not. So that is basically a contract. Now, one more example. I have given uh, to Mr. Raju, sir. Raju, sir, okay. I have given you one deal. Okay. If you will beat someone well, I will give you one lakh rupees. Okay, I told you to beat Mr. A. I will, I'm promising to give you rupees one lakh. I agreed that. And you also agree that, Neha, that I will beat him well. You beat that person very well. Okay, you came to me, Neha, now where is my 1 lakh rupees? I denied, Raju sir, I'm not going to pay you. Now can you go to, uh, can you go to the court? Because I breached the contract, uh, sorry, agreement. Can you go to the court, sir? You cannot go because it's unethical. Excuse me? It is an unethical contract. Like okay, unethical it agreement. is unethical. Okay, and if I talk in my legal terms, it is not under the lawful term. So only the agreements which are having enforceability in the law 
are regarded as contracts. If the agreement is under unlawful thing, that can never turn into a contract. Now I will show you the slide. Just a minute. This is our act. That is the Indian Contract Act and the enactment year is 1872. So that means it is a pre-independence act. Now, see this particular picture that shows you a total position. Now, if you see the definition of a contract, an agreement which is enforceable by law. So what is the equation of agreement? Uh, sorry, what is the equation of contract? Contract is equals to agreement plus enforceability by law. If the agreement is not enforceable by law, it cannot become a contract. So what is the first uh, ingredient needed? First, I need to have a proposal. Like I proposed uh, Mr. Vishalji to take my car at rupees 4 lakh. Then he accepted my proposal. That is the second step. Ki, yes, Neha, I will buy a car from you. Then what we are doing to each other? We are doing a promise. And they are called as the uh, reciprocal promise. One promise for the other promise. And what it needs it needs and when there are two promises that becomes a agreement because we both are agreeing upon the same thing in the same sense and when that agreement is touched with enforceability by law it turns into a contract now tell me if you have any confusion between contract and agreement do tell me you have one thing clear that both uh, oral and written contracts are allowed in the courtroom. Number one point. Second point is that only the agreement which is enforceable by law, that means which is lawful, can only become a contract. Any questions in this? I want your concept clarity. Ma'am, so will... first, ma'am, yes, so please? first, first, uh, uh, you should be agreeing on one thing and then it can turn into a contract. Yes, yes, definitely. What is contract? I am binding you and you are binding me. If you were, you are not agreed to that bindness, then how can we are agreeing on, yeah, on the same thing? You know, like suppose I'm telling you to buy my car at rupees 4 lakh. You are telling, no, no, Neha, I will buy your car, but at 3 lakh. Are you agreeing to my proposal? No. Yes or no? Not at all. In fact, you are counter offering me. Ki Neha, will you sell your car to me at rupees 3 lakh? Okay, now if I say you, okay, I agree to sell you at 3 lakh. Now we both are agreeing at one same point. The thing is, we are the both the parties should agree upon the same. And they should agree voluntarily. No force should be there. Yes, right. please. Okay, and ma'am, one more question. Yes, uh, sure. I, I, bought a, uh, I bought a 1 BHK. Okay. okay, so I made a sale agreement. Okay, okay. so okay. Th is that agreement a contract? Yes, actually, I tell you, uh, Vinalji, what is there in the market? Many people, you actually, we are the lawyers, okay? So we know their exact term. But people, uh, you know, uh, create sale agreement, that agreement, that is a contract only. Whatever the agreement is lawful, that is a uh, that is a contract. Whatever it is justiciable in the courtroom, it is basically a contract, okay. right? Whether you write it agreement, whether you write it binding agreement, whether you write it binded contract, you name it any. But there is, if I talk technically as per the law, agreement and contract are two different things. All contracts are agreement, but all agreements cannot be turned into contracts because they need the element of enforceability. That is the main thing. Perfect. So please, funda should be clear, then only I will proceed. Is, we there, don't have to rush the PPT. Small... Yes, please. Ma'am, there's a question. Sure. Uh, Ma'am, uh, uh, the, there's an example that uh, me and a contractor have mutually decided that uh, I will bring him some contract and uh, uh, he will uh, do the work and uh, we uh, and the profit will be shared between two of us. Yes. Okay. So uh, this was this thing was done by uh, on mail. Okay. We did the agreement. Uh, we did uh, and uh, I sent him some mail uh, saying this. 
एंड ही सेड एंड द मेल सेड दैट वी एक्सेप्ट योर कंडीशंस या फिर वी एग्री योर टर्म्स हां हां आई गॉट योर पॉइंट ओके सो इज दिस एन एग्रीमेंट और इज दिस विल विल इट बी कंसीडर्ड एज अ लीगल थिंग विकास जी आर यू डूइंग एनी अनलॉफुल थिंग नंबर 1 पॉइंट नो मैम सो व्हाट इट वुड बी टेल मी इट विल बी एन एग्रीमेंट इट विल बी अ कॉन्ट्रैक्ट ओके इट विल बी अ कॉन्ट्रैक्ट सुनिए it is a agreement plus it is enforceable by law so definitely it is a contract suppose you bought some work for that person a particular person and that particular person is not sharing you any money can you sue him yes definitely you could because your evidence is your mail definitely you can sue that particular person that is basically a contract you know people think why it is different it is nothing very different the thing is if agreement is lawful it is a contract simple as that you name it any suppose in your mail you have written we agree to our agreement you write it anything but in reality in the from the law perspective it is a contract that means you can fight your case under indian contract act 1872 getting my point vikas ji Yes, ma'am. So it it has nothing to do with those um, uh, judicial papers and all stamp paper. No, no, nothing like that. Nothing like that. Contract doesn't mean that it is on. I am telling you now. I give you a very simple example, uh, Vikas ji. We will see the examples from our general day to day life. Suppose I booked the auto. I said that particular person, please uh, leave me to the railway station. She uh, he said, okay, ma'am, I will leave you and I will charge hundred rupees. Ma'am, it's okay, good. It is also a contract. it is a oral contract uh, do you think i will uh, do it on stamp paper for that auto person not at all not in a written normal mode also that is called as a oral contract why i am agreeing on his terms and he is agreeing on my terms so what we are doing we are agreeing each other and we are doing a, a lawful thing law enforceable thing so it becomes a contract as simple as that right okay ma'am okay but don't worry still if you people feel ki no no we are not getting what is exactly that and what is that i am still for you uh, don't hesitate in asking question questioning is the first step to success okay now always remember offer or proposal is basically the uh, thing uh, you know ending with a question mark will you do this? that for me will you do this for me offer always ends with a question mark and acceptance always end with a full stop there should not be any comma in the full, uh, you know acceptance kintu parantu magar but if like that these things are not entered in acceptance when you are accepting that must be a proper yes now uh, see i have highlighted one my important point uh, that is whatever you are offering it must give rise to legal relationship okay so i will just give you a simple case study now you have to give me the answer you are 10 15 people okay uh tomorrow is my daughter's birthday imaginary so i invited every one of you you near uh, you uh, suppose we are in the same city okay just imagine the things and i told invited you everyone ki please come at my uh, daughter's birthday party and you also you know yes yes ma'am definitely we will be there and you are like uh, 10 persons so i just called up my uh, caterer ki please in, uh, you know increase the perfex by number 10 as my 10 more guests are coming upon and each plate is costing rupees 1000 tomorrow it is my uh, daughter's birthday party we are enjoying that but none of you turn to my daughter's birthday party because of your absence still i need to pay that particular you know 1000 rupees for 10 people that is 10000 will go in vain out of my pocket can i sue you for not coming because i offered you please come to my party and you said yes i you agreed also No, so can i uh, can i do uh, can i sue you up bhavesh no, ji saying not at all no ma'am no 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 okay Ma, to kya lifafa bhijwayenge meri daughter ke liye hazar hazar ka fir kaise chalega 10000 ka apna nahi ma'am 
क्यों अग्रीमेंट हुआ है पूरा अच्छी तरह से लॉफुल चीज है नथिंग इज अनलॉफुल देन ये तो मैम कंसेंट पे डिपेंड करता है ना कि अगले को आना है कि नहीं आपने हाँ बोला था और इस वाले लेक्चर्स की रिकॉर्डिंग भी हो रही है तो एविडेंस के मामले पे मैं मैं स्ट्रॉन्ग हूँ आप ये मत सोचिएगा कि इतनी सी बात के लिए मैम आप कोर्ट जाओगे क्या नहीं चले जा सकते कोई नहीं आप फालतू बैठे हो तो जा भी सकते इसमें क्या दिक्कत का है आप तो ये बताइए क्या ये मामला कोर्ट में जाने लायक है एस पर इंडियन कॉन्ट्रैक्ट एक्ट आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट मैम एक्चुअली डॉटर की का बर्थडे है ना तो इसके लिए हम नहीं आए तो चलेगा मतलब Exactly. This is the real answer I was looking for. It is not the business. Indian Contract Act talks about business, not a social relationship, not a domestic relationship. It talks about a legal relationship. Now I change my this part. I'm twisting my this particular example. Suppose there is someone from our uh, you know participant uh, who might uh, suppose Bhavesh ji, Bhavesh. Bhavesh ji is a very good photographer. Okay, so I told Bhavesh ji to you know come to my party and cover my party, and you know I will pay you for that uh, photography and all. And he's uh, he said yes, ma'am, definitely I will come to your party and all, and I will cover that. And we have just you know uh, we just fixed a charge of rupees ten thousand that I will pay to him for uh, doing videography in my party. Suppose if Bhavesh ji didn't arrive my party uh, because of his absence, I had to hire somebody else. Okay, at rupees twelve thousand. Now can I sue the yes, Bhavesh ji? Yes, 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 ma'am. Yes, it talks, it talks uh, business. You're yes, getting another point of difference. So that you need to understand that basically whether it is a legal relationship or it is just a domestic or a social relationship. This point is clear to everyone. Yes, ma'am. Good. Okay, whoever do the uh, proposal or the offer is called as the pro uh, promiser, and to whom the promise is made is called as the promisee. These are basically the two parties between which the contract is done upon. Now, as I told you, uh, you know whatever there is important points I have already highlighted regarding acceptance. Wh what our acceptance should be? Our acceptance should be full yes. No, kintu parantu, but if it should not be conditional. That Neha, I will buy it, but at uh, rupees three lakh. That's not a that's not a proper acceptance. That is a counter acceptor counter offer to me. So your acceptance should be absolute, unqualified. There should not you should not put any qualification or condition upon that, right? If you see the below slides, it is just telling you the you know definitions of what is promise. Basically, promise is like you are agreeing on a one thing, I am agreeing on one thing. That is basically we are promising. And what is agreement? Like when two promises match, when two promises reciprocal promises meet, it becomes an agreement. Like I am promising to give you my car, and you are also promising me to give me uh, four lakh rupees. So there is reciprocal promises, promise for each other, right? And very simple. What is a contract? That is agreement plus enforceable by law. that is simple definition of a contract whether in your real uh, you know real uh, situations you write the thing as a sale agreement rent agreement write it anything there is no problem but when there is a case upon that we will fight the case under the head of indian contract act okay there is no problem if you have written agreement so that doesn't made the instrument wrong or void okay that's still valid okay that point is clear okay now uh so before i move to this point i hope everybody have understood what is a contract and what is a agreement you know if we have to make a contract we need a agreement but for having a agreement we uh, you know for agreement we need enforceability by law also that is lawful lawful agreement we need by and if you see the above line all contracts are agreement but all agreements are not contract because there can be some unlawful uh, agreements na that can never ever turn into the contract now when i am saying that we are promising each other is this promise voluntarily or forceful yes please 
Now see a situation, okay? Just look into that case. My husband rushed towards me. Neha, I want your name on the property papers of yours. I denied. No, I'm not going to sign this property paper. I don't want to name in uh, your name. He told me, Neha, if you do not do that, I will commit suicide, okay? So can you think my position? By listening that particular point, I just signed the property paper. Was my signature voluntarily or forcefully? Forcefully. 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 Okay. So tell me one thing. If anybody see that property paper, will he able to judge that whether I have signed forcefully or I have uh, signed uh, willfully? Can anybody uh, uh, can no. anybody assume? Nobody can assume that because. Court never comes to our house. We have to go to the court and knock the doors. Court will never come to my home. If I am mum, it is a valid, uh, you know, contract for each and everyone. Because everyone thinks, okay, it is her uh, spouse, his spouse. She can uh, name that property in his husband's name. It is a very normal thing. So now we are seeing the things when it is looking a consent in the contract, but it is not a willful, you know, uh, not a voluntarily one. So let's see, check out something. Number one, a uh, first ingredient need to make a contract is consent. That is, I am consenting on the same point and you are also consenting on the same point. For example, I come back to the same example. Uh, suppose I'm telling you, please, uh, nay, will you purchase my car at rupees 4 lakh? I'm having two models in the car, Bellino and Honda. I didn't specify the model. So I am thinking back of the mind, I'm talking for Bellino. But from your point of view, you are thinking definitely Neha must be selling her Honda to me at rupees 4 lakh. Are we consenting each other? My uh, mindset is talking about Bellino and your mindset is talking about the Honda. Do are we consenting? No, not no. at all. Because we are not, though we are consenting, but not in the same sense. Your sense uh, senses for Honda and my senses for Bellino. So we will be calling at there is no consent in this particular case. Now it should not be we should have the consent. We should have a free consent. Now, what are the situations when our consent is forceful or when our consents are not free? Number one point is coercion. Okay. What is coercion? It is basically a physical force and it is not necessarily to apply the physical force. If you threaten also, na, that is equal to a physical force. Like my husband did on me, I will commit the suicide. Have he committed? No, not at all. But still he applied coercion upon me. Okay. So that sort of consent would be called as consent under the case of coercion. And main point to be noted of coercion is that it is not necessarily to commit something. If you threaten also to commit now, that is also equal to the coercion. Now, next point, undue influence. See, in our life, Every relation has some due influence. Like if your uh, if your uh, you know camera is off, so I can put some due influence upon you on your uh, camera, off your video. Oh, sorry, on your camera, off your audios. Yeah, this kind of uh, influence I can have upon you, and you can also have influence upon me. Neha, I am not getting this topic. I am doing. I am not getting this one. Can I do that? Suppose if I am saying that, okay, you have paid money to the RVO. If you need to pass the examination, each one of you have to pay me 5,000 extra. Otherwise, you uh, you won't be able to pass. Can I put this? Uh, is this a due influence? No, it is basically a undue influence. So if there is any contract in which one of the party, because you please mute yourself. This is my due influence upon you. Please mute it. Thank you. Uh, suppose, uh, suppose. Uh, uh, yes, there must be a relationship between the party, okay, and you can only put the due influence. If you are putting any undue influence, it is called 
consent taken by the reason of undue influence okay there can be n number of reasons suppose uh, suppose our doctor is telling to the patient patient is on the you know operation bed if you do not uh, sign this property paper i will uh, i will not operate you well or jahan hai to jahan hai to patient have also signed that so what uh, though he have made a signature but that is not his voluntarily signature that signature is under undue influence okay and important point to note about undue influence is that when like see in coercion there is no need of relationship of the party but in under undue influence there is a uh, you know relationship of the party like doctor patient employer employee landlord tenant teacher student so they needed to you know to uh, assume a dominance we need to show a relationship so tell me one good point if it is a like in doctor and patient we can assume the doctor must be uh, dominating teacher and student teacher must be dominating employer must be dominating what about the relationship of husband and wife whom we can pre assume that definitely this particular person would be dominating no gender biased answer i want a logical answer upon this point yes please it is the wife or the husband anyone can dominate anyone can dominate that's the good answer and as per the constitution of india when they both have given the equal status so there cannot be a pre assumption that who can be dominant Uh, I know males would be thinking no no it would be definitely wife only or who else will dominate upon so the but uh, the law, but law treats them equal so it depends upon the subjectivity of the matter that what is the real matter and then they can uh, they can conclude that who is really doing the uh, undue influence and i will tell you also why we are discussing these points in a you know coming slide i will tell you what is the reasons of this unfree consent and all now we will be seeing two things simultaneously okay one is this slide that is misdescription or you can say it as a fraud and another was the misrepresentation i repeat misrepresentation and misdescription or fraud you can say that very simple example i am going to give you i want your observation how you will react that is the real answer of this particular topics Ashish ji, are you there on the desk? I think he is not. Okay. Raman ji, are you there? Because you know yes. the persons whom I don't see their uh, cameras, I am not able to judge whether they are on desk or not. Yes, I am not. Uh, Satyapal ji, you there? Yes. Hello. Ashish ji, okay. Ashish ji is there. Because I can't see you people now, so I don't, uh, I can't relate whether you are here or not. Ashish ji, just assume a situation, okay? You are sitting somewhere very nicely, okay, on a chair, and I am passing from that uh, particular uh, place, okay? And by mistake, okay, Ashish ji, by mistake, I have hitted your leg. How you will react towards me? What was your reaction? What would be your reaction? Point to be noted. I hated you, but I hated unintentionally. Yes, please. Tell me. Ma'am, I. आप ये मत कह दीजिएगा. I will hit you back. <laughs> no, no, no. Then, then what would be your reaction? What would what would be your general reaction? देख 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 के 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 चल चल रहा है क्या और 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 मेरे चेहरे से की नेहा ने अन इंटेंशनल किया उसका इंटेंशन इंटेंशन नहीं था मुझे मारना फिर कोई कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं उसमें अगर देखेंगे चेहरे से लग रहा है इट्स ओके अगर लग रहा लग रहा है कि अगर आप अनइंटेंशनल किया है कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं है इंटेंशनल किया है तो फिर उसका ठीक है तो आई विल आल्सो से यू सॉरी एंड यू विल आल्सो से भाई प्लीज इट्स ओके बट सी प्रॉपर्ली ओके ठीक है दिस केस इज सॉल्व्ड नाउ अगेन अ ट्विस्ट इन द एग्जांपल अगेन यू आर सिटिंग वेरी नाइसली अगेन आई एम पासिंग बाय एंड दिस टाइम पॉइंट टू बी नोटेड आई एम हिटिंग यू अगेन बट इंटेंशनली 
okay that was a intentional hit now tell me your observation your reaction towards this particular point how you yes. will react yes i will react you will react aggressively what is this can't you see are you blind this that uh, yeah, and I... might be possible if i am the same gender you can hit me back again that can be a probability right yes yes so thank you so much you have explained the two topics very well okay i'm coming back to the topic that is fraud and misdescription okay okay fraud is intentional wrong your intents was wrong to malice intents were there but when i talk about uh, you know misdescription unintentional wrong wrong is in both of the things like in both of the cases i've hit the leg of ashish ji but once his reaction was different and in another situation his reaction was different why why because of the intentions and all so what is a fraud fraud is that intentionally you are saying wrong you know you are malifying the situations you are putting a wrong connotation in front of the party and if i talk to you in the second situation that is misrepresentation galti se galti karna iska simple example hai if you see below i suppose i believe that the engine of my bike is excellent okay i didn't got it tested just i'm assuming my bike is, engine is super and i sold my bike to you but when you were running my bike you found out that no engine of you know neha's <coughs> bike is not very well it is defective you came to me ki that neha your bike engine is defective our case would be under misrepresentation okay later on you can turn our contract as void just you need to prove and i will also prove my point that i thought it ki that my engine was uh, you know well in condition but if you see the prior one that is the fraud same example is given there what it is there a knows that his engine uh, you know is defective but what he pretended in front of b that my engine is absolute okay and the point is that you know b uh, b just bought it up and later on he found it defective then he put the case of fraud i tell you reality and practicality client comes to us like we give legal advisory as well so whenever the client approaches to us so they they say very clearly ma'am we are under the point of fraud but take us to the point of misrepresentation because you know like you know he reacted less upon me it's okay yeah and in the fraud he was you know you know putting a aggression upon me so many clients do this fakeness like from a fraud they move towards the misdescription are these two points okay with you fraud okay. intentional wrong misdescript uh, misrepresentation galti se galti innocent fraud क्यूट फ्रॉड गलती तो दोनों में कर रहे हैं बट वन इज इंटेंशनल रॉन्ग एंड अनादर वन इज अन इंटेंशनल रॉन्ग वॉट हैपन इन द कोर्ट रूम ऑब्वियसली द पनिशमेंट इन केस ऑफ मिसरिप्रेजेंटेशन इज लेस एज कम्पेयर टू द फ्रॉड बट यू नीड टू डिफेंड योर केस दैट यू आर रियली स्टैंडिंग अंडर मिसरिप्रेजेंटेशन नॉट अंडर फ्रॉड सो डोंट वरी फॉर दैट फॉर दैट लॉयर्स आर देयर दैट्स देयर यू नो पॉइंट हाउ दे विल प्रोजेक्ट ऑफ द केस इन द कोर्ट रूम ओके now the last one we have talked about the mistake remember the example i was thinking of balino and you were thinking of uh, honda we were not meeting at the point we were both having a mistake of thoughts with each other that is basically a mistake then thereafter comes the point second that is you should have a competency to contract that means at least you must be major that is you must be 18 plus uh, for uh, doing the contract you must be of a sound mind see the second point if i do that there is no sound am i unsound mind second point is telling na is of sound mind your uh, minds have any sound i don't have any sound no ma'am it's about mental health. mental health maturity it's about mental health mental health and you should have a rationality of the judgments you know whenever somebody see this point sound mind so they just have one thing okay that person should not be mad no sound mind is different unsound mind is different and mad person is different suppose suppose i am uh, i am ill and i have taken very heavy medications and they are so heavy that i am under sedative situation 
will i be called as a sound mind person or a unsound mind person like i am in a very you know sedative uh, they are very uh, you know sleepy mode i am into whether i would be called as sound or unsound yes bhavish ji you are being up on that i will be called as an unsound mind why because at that time my mind is not in a position to have a rational judgment or suppose if somebody have drunk a lot he is not in a position to stand also that person would be also termed in the unsound mind position okay so unsound uh, unsound does not just mean mad people only they mean by the rationality of judgment how you make upon and third one you should not be disqualified by contracting so there are many laws you know they uh, they disqualify like they have disqualified judges or you know white collar persons to enter some particular uh, 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 contracts so they cannot do that now if it is a contract so definitely everything calls for a lawful thing it should be a lawful consideration there should be a lawful object and uh, you know uh, and your contract should not be something like that which have been specifically you know declared void by the government like government have said that you cannot do cocaine or charas ganja trading that is specifically no in the government written over there or if the government have written you should be a major so uh, to conclude a contract so i cannot do a contract with a 17 year old boy or a girl and six we have discussed very goodly remember that social or domestic agreement that we discussed about like right i call you towards my daughter's birthday party that's a important point there must be certainty of meaning wo bolte hai na 10 ya 11 baje aa jaunga contract mein it can't be work like that if it is 10 it is 10 if it is 11 it is 11 you have to be certain by meaning in the case of contract next one there must be possibility of performance when i got married my husband promised me he agreed with me basically if i talk legally he uh, he agreed with me that neha i will bring stars for you but he haven't uh, done yet and i can i cannot sue him for the same why because this particular agreement is impossible to perform so the things must be possible to perform there must be possibility of the things in all one more one more uh, you know case study i would just want to discuss uh, like uh, suppose uh, my husband told me he is he himself is a lawyer as well my husband told me neha my boss is a foodie he is under corporate banking and all so he told me neha my husband my uh, boss is a complete foodie and you please uh, you know try youtube uh, recipes and all and we will try to you know uh, impress our boss so that i can got a promotion in this year and definitely if i got a promotion i will definitely give you one diamond necklace so i just rushed up all the uh, youtube uh, youtube recipes made everything whether it is biryani dalgona coffee whatever it was and his uh, boss was super happy and he promoted my husband will and uh, if you can see my neck there is just a gold chain no diamond pendant over here can i sue my husband that he have not given me that diamond pendant that he you know offered me for that can i sue him no. yes or no आप लोग ना मुझे दस हजार दिलाते हो ना डायमंड पेंडेंट दिलाते हो मेरे लिए हर चीज में नो 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 कर देते हो यू शुड पेंडेंट डालने दो यू शुड सुम एक्सक्यूज मी कम अगेन मैम यू शुड सुम I should sue him. Yes, there's somebody on my back. But what is the problem? Problem is the Indian Contract Act. They do not tackle the domestic affairs. Okay, like if I have done something for him, there is not a business attached to it, right? So our matter could not be taken into the court. But I will take it to, into the family court. No worries, right? Okay. So let's move to the another set. That is the type of contract. Till here, are you now okay with the things contract agreement? I know it is for the first time. I can understand your mindset as well. That's why we are just taking a day-to-day -day example. We are not going for a typical, uh, you know, legal language. Otherwise, things look boring, right? And uh, you, you remember me if it look heavy, okay? Just point the time when it is looking heavy. I will try to make it light, light more, right? Ma'am. <clears throat> so now, yes, please. ये जो फैमिली टाइप के जो भी मतलब चीजें होती हैं फोर्स अपन ने देखे थे अभी जो क्वेश्चन था 
कौन सा वाला एक वो हाँ, 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 हाँ. फोर्स था ना एक जो ऑन द हाँ, 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 अपना एक वो सेल डील हाँ, ले लिया हाँ, था ठीक है तो हाँ, फैमिली टाइप की जो भी चीजें होती हैं वो उसी फोर्स में आती हैं क्वेश्चन में नहीं नहीं डिपेंड कोर्जन इज लाइक कमिटिंग सम फिजिकल फोर्स लाइक सपोज इफ सम वन टोल्ड मी दैट नेहा साइन दिस पर्टिकुलर पेपर और डू समथिंग अदरवाइज आई विल किडनैप योर चिल्ड्रन दैट कम्स अंडर द कोर्जन यू नो देर मस्ट बी सम फिजिकल फोर्स विच इज हिटिंग मी इफ आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू साइन और इफ आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू डू दिस कॉन्ट्रैक्ट समथिंग बैड यू नो वॉट इज अ फिजिकल फोर्स दैट इज बीन डिफाइंड अंडर द आई पी सी सेक्शन फिफ्टीन दैट सेज इट शुड बी अगेंस्ट लाइफ इफ यू आर पुटिंग एनी थिंग विच इज ऑब्स्ट्रक्टिंग द लाइफ इधर ऑफ योर्स और द पर्सन इज टेलिंग अपॉन बोथ द केस विल कम अंडर द पॉइंट ऑफ द कोर्जन राइट ओके मैम फॉर फॉर एग्जाम्पल एक बेटा है वो बाहर जाना चाहता है घर से कितने साल का पहले इम्पोर्टेंट ये अठारह से ऊपर है मेजर है हाँ, ठीक है।, है वो और पढ़ना चाहता है बाहर ठीक है पर उसकी मम्मी है उसको बाहर नहीं जाने दिया अच्छा ठीक अब वो बच्चा ये कह रहा है कि हमारी मम्मी की वजह से हम आगे पढ़ाई नहीं कर पाए ठीक है सो व्हाट डज दिस मतलब ये कौन से फोर्स में आएगा ये नहीं ये ये एक्चुअली आप ये अगर इसमें बट इसमें देखिए ना तो कोई कोर्जन है उसकी मम्मी ऐसे कह रही है कि अगर तू बाहर गया तो तेरे को मेरी लाश मिलेगी या वो आजकल एक चल रहा है ना इंस्टा पे तेरे को बाहर जाना है मेरी लाश पे से होके जा अभी एक सबसे ज्यादा इंस्टा का एक वही रील चल रहा है अगर वो ऐसे कहती है तो देखिए सबसे पहली बात देर इज नो बिजनेस बिटवीन दे First point is this: okay. there is no business between them. Okay. In Indian Contract Act, we only tackle the situation which attracts mercantile things, a oh. business things upon. Okay? okay, this is a family matter, so it will be taken to the family court rather than a contract matter. Okay, which there is nothing like a contract in this, right? Oh. Okay. Uh, तो भाई मम्मी को बोल दीजिए जाने दीजिए आजकल education बहुत जरूरी है. It is the first and <laughs> गुड okay sir okay now please see this you have to see each and every slide properly but have a main emphasis on this because examiner can confuse you between these terms okay but if we understand the their peculiar things nobody can you know move you from the basics so number one point is void contract now what is a void means you know we need to avoid it Null it up, okay. Remove it up. Now, what is a void contract? See, simple contract. Well, I just move towards our basic example that was regarding the car and all. Today is Saturday, so you are a okay. pious person. You say no, no, no. I don't take uh, iron things on Saturday. I will take the delivery on Wednesday. Okay. I said okay. You take the delivery on Wednesday. I will. Uh, I will give you my car on Wednesday. You give me four lakh on Wednesday. what happened on tuesday night a fire was in my garage okay a fire took in my garage and the total car was now demolished now zero uh, zero uh, that one okay because of fire and all can we uh, can on wednesday you say no neha you have to give me the car you have contracted with me can you say like that to me and the fire is not from my mm -hmm. side okay it no, uh, it happened uh, like uh, on its own yes please vikas ji no ma'am matlab nahi kar sakte nahi kar sakte okay so what is there on wednesday there are circumstances by which valid contract have to be turned into void contract so point to be noted in this case on day 1 it was a valid contract today it is a valid na when we are making the contract day yeah. one it is a valid contract on the day of execution that is the wednesday 
it will be termed into a void contract because we will not be able to perform the contract as situations were not that normal as that were at the time of contracting. And the reason should be supervening impossibility. That is not in my hand. That is that should not be in your hand. And n number of examples could be there. There could be a draw. There could be storm. There could be anything, earthquake, whatever the reason. And that should be a supervening one. Not in your hand or not in my hand. Okay. So void contract day one valid, but day of execution void because situations are not same. Now we, uh, we move towards the second one that is void agreement. Now see, it is not a contract. It is just a void agreement. So if you see the definition, an agreement which is not enforceable by law, it is void from the day start. It is void from the day beginning. If you remember void contract day one, valid. Okay, day of execution, it becomes uh, invalid or you can say it as void. But what is there in void agreement? On the day when it is wrong, from the start only. For suppose, I do an agreement with a 17-year-old boy. Will it turn into a contract? Yes or no? No, ma'am. <laughs> Never? No. It is wrong from the day one. It can never be a good agreement also. It is a void agreement because in law it is not allowed to have an agreement with a minor. So it is wrong from the day start. It can never be validated, right? Okay, can anybody tell me ki suppose that particular fellow was turning 18 within 4 days. After 4 days can it be turned into a valid co contract? Yes no, or no or a valid agreement? No ma'am. Never ever. Why? That depends when you have, you know, agreementing on the thing. That day is a matter. Later on, you become a, a major. That doesn't make it, you know, validated. So when it is started, it is wrong. It will be always regarded as a wrong. That is the point to be noted. Now, I think void contract is okay. Void agreement is okay. If you see the third thing that talks about void able contract, you can see the two words with them. Void plus ability of being void. Okay. Remember that four or five points coercion, undue influence, fraud, misrepresentation. Why were they? Suppose, like my husband put up a coercion upon me, na? Neha, I will do the suicide if you will not sign the paper. And what I did, I just signed the paper in the force. So, what were we having? We were not having the valid contract. We were having the void able contract. The contract which is having ability to turn into void. And who can turn it, to, it into void? My husband or I? Who can turn it void? You only, ma'am. You only. I only because I am the aggrieved party, dukhyari party. Somebody have done a wrong upon me. So, if I am mum, if I am quiet, it will be a valid contract in the eyes of law. But if I step up to the court, prove up in the court and make the decision on my side, that type of contract would turn into a void one. Getting my point? Okay. If I am mum, valid. If I speak up and prove up in the court, it will be turned into a void one. So it all depends upon me whether I am keeping quiet or whether I am going to the court or, you know, enforcing it up or not. So, it is all dependent upon the aggrieved party. Now, illegal agreement. Basically, the things which are not legal, that is basically illegal. And illegal, I mean by that has been, you know, specifically negated by the court. That you cannot do this, you cannot do this. If you have done, like if you have kept arms and ammunition, it is basically an illegal, uh, illegal agreement, right? Then if I talk about what is unenforceable, the thing which cannot be forced, enforced, and what is the reason behind? The technical defects, not a major defect. Suppose, in a, for a contract, I needed two uh, signs of two witnesses. But I just got a signature of one witness only. So it will not be called as a void contract. It would be called as an unenforceable contract. 
if i got the second witness sign that particular unenforceable will turn into a enforceable contract right so just a technical defect that can be cured upon then thereafter the unilateral and bilateral so what is in unilateral and bilateral i will uh, explain you with a simple example the same one suppose you were taking the delivery of the car on wednesday but you were paying me on today only on saturday only so what is there one party have performed the obligation on the saturday and i have to perform my obligation on wednesday so when only one party has performed it is called a unilateral uh, contract bilateral when both the party have not uh, performed means i will also give you car on wednesday and you will also give me car on the uh, sorry uh, uh, 4 lakh on wednesday only that would be termed as a bi bilateral that means obligation is pending on both of us any problem please no ma'am unilateral contract a uh, proposal hi hota hai kya fir nahi 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 nah, contract ho gaya to proposal ka bacha so, ma'am, unilateral yes. contract can be done? Yes, very easily. Suppose, ki, uh, because uh, like, you, know, uh, you have given me the money for the car today. Hmm. You are taking the delivery on, uh, on Wednesday. So, we are already contracted with each other. Na? Just we have performed the obligations. You have, uh, we have contracted upon the things. You are performing the thing today. I am performing the thing three days later. Okay, so, uh, so the um, the contracts between a, a department and a contractor. These Achha, two. आप लोग अपनी language में बताएंगे कि हमारे ये होता है, right? ठीक okay. है. Is this a unilateral contract or bilateral? मतलब कैसा exemplify करिए? For example, उन्होंने को एक building बनवानी है. हाँ. तो उन्होंने कहा कि आप पहले building बना दो, फिर हम आपको पैसे दे देंगे. बिल्कुल बढ़िया. So, is it a unilateral contract or bilateral contract? Because services obligations to baad mein karne hai na? It is a valid contract, not a unilateral. Lekin, lekin suniye ga ek bar. Haan, unilateral, bilateral bhi baat karte hai. Aap ho offer ka pooch rahe na, isliye mein specifically bata rahi hu. Uh, when you were contracting for this building, have you uh, settled your terms that what would be the payment, what would be the commercials of that particular assignment? Have you done that? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Okay, so the terms was final. You have to make a seven story building and they will give you a rupees 70 lakh. Mm. It's just imaginary figures. You have fixed it up and now uh, they are telling first you make the building, then we will give you the money. That is the case, right? Mm. So yes, when you have the, when you have performed the thing and they have not given you the money, that would be termed as a unilateral one. That one party has performed the contract and another one just have to perform in a later time. That is just showing the obligations, whether the party, uh, both the party is, uh, whether the obligation is pending on both the party or only one of the party. That is just to show that, right? It will be termed as a normal contract. Bilateral and unilateral just show the performance of the obligation. That's it, right? Okay. Still a confusion? You do ask me. There should not be left any confusion in the mind. Ma'am, can you explain unforeseeable contract? Unenforceable? Uh, okay. Uh, Vishal ji, uh, you and me are making some contract and the contract needs to be on the stamp paper of rupees 500. Okay. By mistake, I got it on uh, rupees uh, 200 stamp paper. So, we have not done a very big flaw. Yes, it is a flaw, but a curable flaw. A technical defect is there. If I buy a stamp paper of 300 rupees more, our contract would be enforceable one. The technical defects that can be cured easily. That is it. Right? Anything else? No. Uh, what what else? The... Yes, please. Uh, suppose you are going to buy a house. Uh, in that, what happened? You uh, confirm a builder, and then builder takes some money from you. Suppose twenty percent or thirty percent, likewise. Then you make an agreement. In uh, <clears throat> then after some months, he is going to give you keys, and after that, the rest amount, what is ten percent or whatever, you are giving him. The last amount. So, what kind of contract is this? So, this is basically installment uh, type of contract. Okay. Yeah. So, if you are saying you have given some amount of, uh, you know, you want to uh, make is uh, make it understand whether it is a unilateral or a bilateral kind like that. Yeah, yes, 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 it yes, will yes. be a bilateral. Yes. Why you have not paid the full uh, money? So, still okay. the obligation is pending on your part as well. So, it will not be a unilateral one, right? 
थैंक यू वेलकम मैम सो बायोलेटरल कॉन्ट्रैक्ट भी एक यूनिलेटरल कॉन्ट्रैक्ट है जब तक कि दोनों के ऑब्लिगेशन पूरे ना हो जाए राइट नहीं बायोलेटरल इज लाइक बोथ ऑफ द पार्टीज आर पेंडिंग अपॉन द परफॉर्मेंस यूनिलेटरल मींस ओनली वन पार्टी इज पेंडिंग अपॉन द परफॉर्मेंस नो सो अगर दोनों ने फॉर एग्जांपल मैंने बिल्डिंग बना दी उन्होंने पैसे दे दिया तो ये तो बायोलेटरल हो गया क्या सेम नहीं होगा बिल्डिंग बना ली मैंने बिल्डिंग बना दिया उन्होंने पेमेंट कर दिया फॉर एग्जांपल 2 दिन बाद हां अब तो ये बायोलेटरल टर्म्स हो गए ना तो 2 दिन तक तो वो क्या हुआ अच्छा 2 दिन तक वो वो होगा यूनिलेटरल होगा तो ये तीसरे दिन वो बायोलेटरल हो जाएगा हाँ, नहीं बायोलेटरल क्या फिर तो एग्जीक्यूट हो जाएगा कॉन्ट्रैक्ट जब दोनों ने काम कर लिया ये तो बायोलेटरल यूनिलेटरल तो बताता है ऑब्लिगेशन पेंडिंग कितने पे है दोनों पे कि एक पार्टी पे ओके सो जब आप दोनों ने काम कर लिया तो ये बेसिकली कहलाएगा एग्जीक्यूटेड कॉन्ट्रैक्ट यू हैव डन द कॉन्ट्रैक्ट यू हैव कंप्लीटेड यू हैव फिनिश द कॉन्ट्रैक्ट एग्जीक्यूटेड वन राइट बायोलेटरल यूनिलेटरल जस्ट शो वेदर द व्हिच पार्टी हैव डन द कॉन्ट्रैक्ट वन पार्टी और इट इज पेंडिंग ऑन द बोथ ऑफ द पार्टीज दैट जस्ट इट शोस अपॉन राइट so you don't have to chain again again oh now my becomes the bilateral oh now my become the unilateral you don't have to do okay. that this okay. is just a technical terms like if i have to say my client okay that's that mean you are going under the unilateral thing just a legal terms just like that you don't have to change the names again and again of your contracts right okay so remember one thing well and void contract day one just bingo day of execution just nothing okay we have to avoid it void agreement shuruaat se hi galat wrong from the first day it can never happen void able contract which is having the ability to become void but who will able it only the agreed party can make it able to become a void one you need to prove that in, into the court it is a long process not in a day things and all now okay before i move this a very simple question to you whenever we do a contract so is it that ki we must pay the exact price like suppose my car is a uh, worth of rupees 10 lakh so can i take rupees 10 lakh from you or i can take rupees 1 lakh from you or i can take rupees 1 crore for that particular car can i do that or the consideration consideration means what you are exchanging for the contract that must be exact or it could be more or less exact exact okay okay so it could be more or less it could okay. be less more, but not it more could be less. less okay and one point to be noted i am not talking about mrp thing like i am having this mobile okay i bought it in uh, 40000 Yeah, uh, is it mandate for me to sell it at forty thousand only, or I can sell it four thousand, or I can sell it four lakh? Can I do that? No, yes, you can. Yes. We okay. have to. Uh, आपने जितने में agree किया है उतना main है. मैं agree का नहीं पूछ रही. मैं पहले मेरी uh, limits पूछ रही हूँ. What I can do with that? How can I price it? I can price it more. I can price it less. Or I have to price exact. That I am asking about. You can't. 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 ओके point to be seen that consideration need not to be adequate it's my will the thing is in law it has been specifically written consideration means like what we are exchanging upon like you are getting a car as a consideration and i am getting 4 lakh in a consideration consideration must be something in return not exact thing in return and it need not to be adequate it's my will if i want to sell my 40000 phone at rupees 4000 I, it's my valid consideration. If I want to sell my forty thousand four phone at rupees four lakh, it's my satisfaction. You cannot say that consideration need to be adequate. Okay, it can be more, it can be less, depends upon me. It should be something, not the exact thing. Getting my point? Yeah. Okay, and I'm and point to be noted. I'm not talking about MRP thing. Obviously, if if thing I have written a MRP of rupees forty, 
you know what is being sold in the shops obviously that cannot be sold more than that i am talking about normal things like i i find my car is very lucky so for its lucky goodwill i am charging 10 lakh rupees more that's my problem my suppose my car is having a number of 7 a lucky 7 so i can charge it more that is all dependent on me right now we have talked so much you know it's time to perform some action okay it's more than enough we have talked so much about contract 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 let's perform a contract so a very simple example to you like as i told you my husband is also a lawyer so like i have taken your class uh, yesterday only so i have uh, committed uh, with the double ar bf for today's session but can we do arrangement like i can i say my husband like you are you are also having good knowledge in indian contract and all why don't you substitute me in today's session in my place can i do that can i do that he is you know he is uh, equally good well you get i look uh, it doesn't matter us if you have committed you have to come upon yes exactly when the performance needs the personal skills the individual skills then you cannot substitute the performance okay only the promiser have to perform the thing suppose okay in this you are saying me no i cannot substitute my husband now a second example uh, we uh, we move towards the car example only i promised you that i will deliver you car on wednesday okay on wednesday i am not well i told my husband please take the car to that particular fellow uh, now will you say that no 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 jab tak neha chala kar nahi aayegi hum nahi manenge ki gaadi hamare paas aayi hai we want uh, neha to drive only will you say that or will you accept uh, the delivery by my husband yes accept the delivery we will accept <laughs> विशाल जी तो कह रहे नहीं मैम को ही चलाना के आना पड़ेगा नहीं मैं मैं एजेंट परफॉर्मेंस इज टर्म्ड एज अ परफॉर्मेंस बाय द प्रोमिसर ओनली राइट नाउ द पॉइंट इज ऑफ लीगल रिप्रेजेंटेटिव सपोज आई बॉट सम गुड्स वर्थ ऑफ रुपीज वन लैक ओके from a seller and i consume that goods i haven't paid it yet and i died okay after my death whatever is my property it is equal to 60000 rupees that i left towards my legal hire or legal representative so you came at my place first two three lines you were like bahut achhi lady thi bahut kam umar mein upar chali gayi fir on third line you were on your exact point where are my 1 lakh rupees so what do you think can you you know compel my legal hire to pay you rupees full 1 lakh or rupees 60000 what will you do that no means what well means you you cannot compel my legal hire i i suppose ha huh, obviously you cannot compel the legal hire to pay because he has been consumed the person who has consumed has already died okay so uh, can uh, can uh, that particular seller person cannot take a single penny uh, that i the disease person have left rupees 60000 as a property to that particular legal hire can't uh, seller take any penny no that is not my property na mm -hmm. I, the legal hire is the died person have left the property of rupees 60000 with the legal hire then Ha ah, then then it is it becomes a property of the legal hire now that sixty thousand oh, wow. is mine. Oh, oh wow! Debits and credits, what assets and liabilities are to be paid? Yes, sir. Liabilities and assets are to be cleared by the legal head. Okay, okay. So the point is, a oh, seller can only take rupees sixty thousand from the legal hire, though it becomes the property of the legal hire but what is legal hire legal hire is basically legal representative legal representative of the deceased person so yes seller can put his rights on 60000 only and for 40000 is like bed debts go move to the god's account he cannot compel for the rest 40000 but yes he can compel for the 60000 okay it won't be your total property you have to pay that now one more point in that when you when the seller was calling for the money with my legal representative 
so uh, my my brother was also standing there and he saw that uh, you know that legal representative is just paying 60000 and that particular seller will remember my uh, sister's name in a bad names that mari to mari 40000 or leke mari so uh, my brother was thinking to pay from his pocket uh, for my balance and all can my brother do that yes or no yes validly it could be done so that would be termed as performance by third party because he was not a party to the contract and whatever he is paying would be termed as paid by Neha only. Okay, though it is a payment by the third party, but it is payment on behalf of Neha, right? That is the third party point. And last point is the joint promisor. What it means by, see, what is joint promising of the things that uh, more than one promiser is promising for a promise. Like suppose me and my husband, we both have taken a goods of rupees one, one lakh. Okay, that means we both are jointly promising on the things. And suppose I died. Okay, now the seller can ask for full one lakh rupees from my husband because now he's not my legal uh, representative. He's a joint promiser to me. So the seller can have full rights over that one lakh rupees from my husband. So this was it. Now let's move towards next. So whenever you have some uh, doubts in any question in examination, try to apply the logic. See, law is basically logic. So you have to assume a situation that what a legal matters it could be, okay? So just think about that. Now, this is the particular slide. Um, yes, please. Ma'am, in the last slide, what is uh, agent? Agent that I told you, na, my husband was bringing car to you. I was okay, not he, bringing he the, the agent. I was the main promiser. Okay. But promiser was not performing. My agent was performing the task. Okay. But it would be termed as Neha have performed because he's performing on my behalf only. Right? right? Okay. Because, you know, uh, uh, getting car from here to there does not uh, require any, uh, you know, individual skills to that. So, in that he can do upon. Right? Now, this is the particular slide where we fetch money from our clients. Okay? Because we get them damages from the other party. Now, as the name says, damage, damages in case of breach, whenever the party, other party is breaching, what, what damages we can take from that other party? Number first, it is already telling us it is an ordinary damage. Very ordinary. Simple example to you. You told me that Neha, I will provide you 1000 goods at the rate of 50. Menika, okay, provide me on Wednesday these particular goods. On Wednesday, you denied. No, Neha, I am not having any goods. Sorry, I cannot deliver you any. That means you are breaching your commitment, right? So, what I did, I went to the market and got the 1000 goods at the rate of rupees 60. What kind of uh, damages I can calculate against you? Yes, please. The extra amount that was paid against that good. That is 60 minus 50, 10 rupees into 1001, uh, that is 10,000 rupees. Okay, it is a calculation of an ordinary damage. Next one. Yes, Viralji. Next one is special damage. The name is itself saying I am very special. And point to be noted if a question comes that whether the special damages can be covered as a matter of right, answer would be no. Why it is not an ordinary one? It is a special. So there, uh, you know, there must be notice of that special situation. Very simple example. You committed me that Neha, I will provide you thousand goods at the rate of fifty. I told you one line more. See, for as you are providing me the thousand goods, I am organizing an exhibition for the same, and that is why I am booking an exhibition hall. At the rate rupees 5,000 per day, I am booking it for one day because you are promising to give me the 1,000 goods. So, if you breach to deliver me the 1,000 goods, I can take these damages also of that 5,000 rupees of the exhibition hall because I have narrated you the special event, the special circumstance. If I won't have narrated you the special circumstance, I ca it cannot be recovered as a matter of right. So, special things uh, need special notice also, right? 
then next one is the vindictive damages or exemplary damage a very simple thing i tell you what is the exemplary damage that brings an example in the society and not in the society if i talk about in home only i'm having two uh, two uh, kids one is a son and one is a daughter elder is the son suppose if my daughter is seen i'm uh, i'm scolding my son very well i'm scolding very well to him so what my daughter is doing that day without getting a scold she is behaving very nice studying well sleeping on time eating well how that is an exemplary effect that she is seeing mummy is not in a good mood so if i do anything wrong next is my number so that is all about the exemplary ones that is to give example to the society for example it is basically in two cases only number 1 suppose if you breach promise to marry and you know you can uh, take exemplary damages ab now many youngsters like not the uh, elder uh, like the youngsters also ask me in this particular damages can we take the damages for normal hookups and breakups so no that is not for that in our society still we go for a marriage that is a irreversible thing so only damages will be allotted in case if you breach promise to marry now if you will ask that how much damages we can get upon all is subjectivity matter whether the groom is running whether the bride is running what is the day running if they are running on the day of the marriage if they are saying no uh, like two months before one year before so you know the calculation of the damages depends upon the scenario exact what is the subjectivity matter so uh, and the second one i tell you very practically second one is no of use in today's life because it na uh, not happens uh, today as the act is very old so they have not amended what the second point is telling wrongful dishonor by a banker of his customers check nowadays it doesn't happen banker directly talks us and say your uh, account has been defaulted by 10000 rupees so please uh, uh, just deposit the amount so that we can honor your check right this thing never happens in today's time but suppose if a banker have wrongfully dishonored your check then you can take a exemplary damage for the same for losing your goodwill in the market nominal damage it is very interesting you remember that old example you promised me 1000 goods at the rate of rupees 50 right you denied me on the set date on the execution date because of you i went to the market and i just talked to the sellers i got 1000 goods at the rate of rupees 40 first tell me whether i can take any damage from you yes or no you promised at rupees 50 you denied you breach i got in the market at the rupees 40 what would be the situation no we cannot take any damage because earlier you told ma'am ki i am having my right that at any price i can sell my satisfaction level ha ah, you can sell i am not saying that you cannot sell me you are uh, you are selling me at 50 i am good with that i am asking you breach on the delivery date you breach and you didn't give me any quantity now can i sue you and i got that quantity from the market at a competitive price of rupees 40 can i sue you yes ma'am because you have breached the contract yes so yes think, yes do you are having profit yes. yes 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 do you are having profit you can sue the the person because two different persons are there two different persons and there and not because of the profit i am having the right i will play up my right though his breach have given a profit to me of rupees 10000 but when the party have breached though it does it didn't give me a financial damage it gave me a you know a mental trauma that for one hour i was in a tension where will i get the quantity this that i will project so many things in the court that we can easily get the damage point is what when you have done a commitment you have to be true upon your commitment if you breach you have to pay the price because you know we have to start uh, we have to uh, set standards in the market no is wrong like breach is breach whether it gives me profit and loss that doesn't matter i have a right against you that is the case right remote damages you know dur daraj ke 
like suppose i i have to give you damage for your wrong not because the damage you suffer because of another parties that i am not for i will give you the direct damages not the indirect ones only the uh, you know upfronted one not the related ones and all i hope this is clear yes ma'am yes ma'am now what are the remedies that we have talked about the damages now what are the remedies well, number one remedy is right to resign the contract like you are saying i don't want to do contract with you i am also saying i also don't want to do contract with you second right to claim damages we have seen the damages and all right to continue the contract suppose the thing is so important so we can uh, bring a plea in the court that we don't want any monetary damage we want the performance of the contract to continue to the contract we can do that and uh, fourth one is suit upon quantum merit see quantum is related to quantity okay suppose you are a painter i am having four rooms okay you came to my house for painting my, my rooms and we have decided that every room would be for uh, say 5000 i will pay you 5000 for each room so that is 20000 in our all so you painted my two rooms today okay uh, you uh, painted two rooms in totality okay and next day what happened a earthquake came and my house collapsed okay so what will you do uh, after coming the next day to me will you ask me zero money 20000 money or 10000 money do i need to repeat the case no oh, ma'am okay what would you do to, uh, towards me jitna kaam kiya utna hi de do exactly give me the payment as per the quantity but whatever the quantity of work you have done that should be of quality also okay so yes only 10000 would be given upon suit for specific performance some things you know like you uh, you can uh, in some of the cases you can put a plea that i want a special uh, specific performance of the party you can put a plea it is all dependent upon the court whether it will allow that or not and last is suit for injunction basically bringing a restrain order suppose the other party is not uh, doing what i am telling so i cannot uh, you know uh, i cannot take her hand and let her do the work so what i will be bringing i will be bringing the restraining order upon them that is basically a injunction and suit is the kind of action ma'am or what yes suit is basically case we normally call it okay. suit uh, suit is basically cases only right okay so uh, now uh, you know in corporate languages rather than cases we use majorly the word suits well, what i found na like corporate they majorly use the word suits only rather than the cases and all now what is uh, the which are the contracts that need not to be performed number 1 point is novation do not read the lines just understand what does novation touches to you it touches to the word innovation am i right novation innovation just stick to that word what is there suppose there are three parties a b and c a have to take uh, 10000 from b b have to take 10 10000 from c three of them set together on a table a uh, b says c a you have to take 10000 from me and i have to take 10000 from c so why don't you you know remove me in between of you and why don't you have a independent contract between a and c so what is happening is there there is a innovation thing coming upon a new thing is coming earlier what was the what were the contracts the contracts were between a and b and the contract was between b and c now after this innovation the contract is between a and c something new is happening point to be noted not the majority will work upon all the three party should agree upon the same then only the things will work out so, uh, second is the recession recession is nothing nothing new is coming out just i am also telling you i will not sell you the car you are also telling me no uh, no kine i will also not uh, you know uh, uh i also don't want to purchase car from you so nothing is new whatever was the old has been cancelled from both the party sides third is the alteration you know we do alteration na sometimes we bought t-shirt of l size 
but it is it doesn't fit us so we bought a size of m so there is just a simple change not a major change in the contract suppose in contract i have written over there that i will pay you by cash but later on i change the term that no i will uh, i will you know pay you by the check and uh, bank transfers only so that is a major change a very simple change is not a drastic change in the contract last one is the remission remission is to let it off to wave it off the thing suppose you sold me a garland it is of rupees 1000 okay and at that time when you were selling me i was just having 900 बोलते हैं ना 900 लेना हो तो लो नहीं तो खत्म करो नहीं लेना मेरे को सो द पॉइंट इज यू ऑल्सो सेड ओके नेहा गिव मी 900 हंड्रेड आई जस्ट वेव ऑफ दैट रुपीज हंड्रेड तो वॉट यू आर डूइंग यू आर रेमिटिंग समथिंग यू आर रिमूविंग दैट रुपीज हंड्रेड तो रेमेशन इज लाइक यू आर वेविंग माई परफॉर्मेंस ऑफ रुपीज हंड्रेड दैट इज बेसिकली अ रेमेशन नाउ आई विल एक्सप्लेन यू टू थिंग्स दैट इज इंडेमिनिटी एंड गारंटी i i know you people know guarantee just i repeat what is a guarantee basically it is a tri party agreement or contract you can say we uh, you know generally in our language we use them interchangeably agreement and contract what happens in the guarantee there are three parties one is the debtor one is the surety one is the creditor i am a debtor i went to the bank that i want this money and i also take my uh, with me uh, mr surety and that part a particular person surety is telling see if debtor is not going to pay the creditor creditor i will pay you on his behalf only when he default okay so what is there the primary Breaking voice. Your voice is breaking, ma'am. <clears throat> Excuse me, come again. Voice are not. Voice are not. Uh, okay. Okay. I repeat myself. So I would be repeating the guarantee part, right? Okay. 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 Basically, a tri-party agreement, tri-party contract. Parties are basically the debtor, that is the borrower; creditor, that is basically the lender; and surety is a person who is giving the assurance. Assurance. So, what is happening? Debtor is taking money from the creditor, and for that particular money, the surety is giving his assurance that if the debtor defaulted in the payment on the said date, I will pay on his behalf. so the primary liability of the payment is of the debtor and secondary uh, liability of the payment is of the surety just that so this is basically a contract of guarantee the tri party one and what happens in indemnity it is just a two party contract in this uh, the other party don't say that i will pay on his behalf no he don't say for uh, i will pay on behalf he just promises that if he does not pay you i will get your payment done by any of the house not he never say that i will pay from my pocket he just uh, satisfy the other party that i will see up to the things and it be at your side that is it and generally we execute indemnity bonds sometimes mostly yes yes you are very right sir yes at only right sir then there is the contingent uh, contract can anybody tell me what is the meaning of contingency what is contingency unforeseen circumstances ke karan jo hota hai unforeseen yes very good upon that and the and the circumstances which are not in our hand okay that are basically contingency now what is a contingent contract a contract which is dependent on some contingency okay for a very simple example suppose i am a farmer you came to me neha i want to buy 1000 uh, 1 lakh quintal from you i said okay yes i will sell you 1 lakh quintal if this year rain would be of you know 5 cm then i will definitely give you 1 uh, lakh quintal of uh, you know wheat so suppose if the rain happens only for 2 cm only can you say me neha give me 1 lakh quintal wheat as you promised can you say that no ma'am 
no why because our contract was dependent upon a contingency and point to be noted contingency should not be under your control and contingency should not be under my control it is you know self item should be there and uh, you know whenever we are doing the contracts like that we can uh, do on several basis either on contingent happening like i said for you know contingent happening of uh, uh, rain or it could be on contingent not happening suppose i am taking a marine insurance and i am saying that see if my ship does not come to the port then you have to pay me rupees 1 lakh i am telling to the insurance company so what is this contingency dependent upon event not happening my whether my ship is ret uh, returning not or my ship is sinking in mid uh, between only so the event could be happening or event could not be happening that depends upon your you know clauses you have put in in the agreement and uh, sometimes uh, the clauses uh, the contingency can be dependent upon the future conduct of the person like i have written a will that i will uh, give this property to my daughter only if she will uh, marry to mr a up uh, now it is a probability if she will marry to mr a she will get the property suppose if she marry mr b she will not get the property so it is dependent upon his uh, her future conduct how she will behave in the future and it can be time specified also like i have written if my uh, daughter do not marry to mr a till the age of 30 i am not give uh, i am not ready to give any penny from my property so it is a time bound contingency and last one is that impossible contingency sorry impossible uh, uh, the agreements which are contingent on impossible events like suppose uh, if you see the b illustration a is agreeing to pay rupees 1000 to b if b will marry a's daughter and the name of the a daughter is c but when they were contracting upon the thing c was dead at the time so can it ever become a contract never ever why it is a void agreement from the day start it is wrong so the the impossible things would be turned into a void one and you said that uh, uh, in case of contingencies things should not in our control but in case that mary is seen example you are giving daughter can marry because things in is her control later on he can uh, get separated and enjoy the money no i can i i am i am pretty enough good in that i will put 10 more clauses in the uh, you know uh, that particular notes and all see if she remarry other the property will re reverted to me now you will be sell, uh, telling me ki what happened if before uh, you know giving the divorce she has sold the property and take the money so i will put a clause in the that deed that uh, that property could not be sold you know okay. there can be n number of transaction now the point you were telling that uh, marrying is under her control and the point is yes it is allowed as per the as per the law that but it is not under my control you know like getting him i cannot force her to marry upon yes it is under her control but the thing it is her choice whether she want to or whether she don't want to if she want a property then he have to marry the mr a that is okay it. Like the control can be in a single hand only. Like yeah, yes, 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 yes. Okay. It is uh, actually it is a uh, it is given because you know many of the times we make wills na we put contingency also that I will you know me kar dunga jaydat se agar isne jad bahar shadi kar li they, there are you know we when we draft there is, so that comes under the contingent contract only right. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, most welcome. Now the point is of agency. I hope you all know that what is agent. Agent is basically a person who is running, uh, you know, uh, who is doing the work on the behalf of the principal. Like what I am. Have you contracted with me for your sessions? No, not at all. You have just contracted with RVO. Okay, double F, uh, double A R V F R V O. So what I am. I am agent of double A R V F. Whatever I am acting, I am doing. How I am doing it as as an agent of double A R V F. Okay. So what is the duty of the agent to work on the basis of the uh, of its principle? And I should not cross my authorities. Whatever the you know R V O has given me the authorities, that is my boundary limit. I cannot uh, you know work under than that less than that or more than that i have to be in the my authority style 
Now, there can be n number of ways where we can make up the agency by writing, by orally, by necessity, by many of the ways we can make an agency. Like necessity, I tell you very easy example. Suppose I'm sending my goods via a railway, okay, and you didn't came on the railway station to pick up the goods. So what will happen? I send you the goods via railway and you didn't reach the railway for picking up the goods. Then what will happen of our goods? Who will take care till the time you go to the railway station? Ma'am, can you repeat on the platform? Yes, please. Can you repeat one once more? Railway? Uh, can you repeat? Repeat. I'm asking, I send you some goods via railway, okay? okay. You didn't uh, came on the railway station for picking the same. So who will have the authority to, you know, preserve that particular goods until the time you come upon? Will the they on the platform? The person the the railway storage. Uh... Exactly. So what the railway storage person will be become to me, they will become a agent of mine. Okay, and yeah. that is called as like agent by necessity because situations are such they cannot throw my goods on the platform. They will preserve the goods as like, you know, under my name as Neha Bandari, they will be keeping the goods as my agent. So there are n number of ways to open our agency. Now, understand this two points well, examiner is going to, uh, you know, confuse on the two points that is sub agent and substituted agent. Okay. Now, what are sub agent and substituted agent? See, I, there is a principle under which comes the agent. Suppose I am an agent and I have a lot of work. So what I did, I just appointed some agent under me. I repeat agent have appointed a agent under him. So there is the principle, there is the agent and it is the sub agent that is agent ka agent is the sub agent. So that is basically a sub agent. Now, what is a substituted agent? Again, this is the principle. Again, it is the agent. Suppose I am an agent and I'm not feeling well. I just called my principle that see, I'm not feeling well. Please appoint someone as I'm not able to do up my duties. So what the principal do, he have appointed another agent, but now this another agent is not under me, in place of me. That means he's a substitution of me. So that another agent would be called as a substituted agent, not a sub agent. So that is basically taking my place. Now, how can agency be terminated by N ways? By agreement, by renunciations, by death, by insanity, by insolvency, by completion of the project, by timely finishing of the things, uh, by dissolutions, by destruction of the subject ma matter. Like if we both are saying, I don't want to be your agent, you are also saying, yeah, I also don't want you to be, uh, to be my person. So we can end the agency in N ways. Now we have talked so much. Let's tackle some questions. First one, please. I repeat myself the yesterday point. Invest time in reading the question. What is uh, exact point to make it a contract? Free consent is needed. Lawful consideration is also needed. It should not be a void one. And there is nowhere in the law written over that the contract should be in written form only. So answer is A. Second one for you. It is to confuse you people. You know, many times examiner gives question like this. So please read the question well. Because of calling not unnecessary. Read the question well is only the key to come up to the right answer. Can I have the answers, please? I know it looks uh, quite, you know, confusing one. And such sort of questions are coming in the exam. But very good, you people are dealing it very well. Yes, misunderstanding doesn't matter a lot. So answer for this one is D. 
Why? Why misunderstanding? Very simple example. You are selling me a garland, a pearl garland. And I myself, I'm myself misunderstanding that this must be definitely, you know, the Basra Motis, the, the highest level of the pearls and all. So that is my problem. That is not your problem, what I'm assuming in my mind. So that is the misunderstanding. It is not a necessary feature. This is the most simple one. I know you all will give a right answer to this. The thing which are impossible. Ma'am D. Exact. Huh? Which one? B. B for Bombay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Bingo. Yes. Yes, it was void because impossible things cannot be projected upon. So the, that needed to be, a, you know, void one only. D for Delhi. D for Delhi. Innovation point should strike in your mind. Innovation. Okay. Yes, answer is D. That is substituting an old contract for a new one. Bingo for that. Innovation. You know, such is a, uh, such is the standard of the uh, you know questions in the examination. So just you need to remember the basics. You don't have to take a deep dive. You just have to swim at the upper level. And the you know as uh, I will just today uh, we will uh, you know just save our ten minutes so that we can uh, discuss exam as well. And it is uh, it would be really important discussion for the exam purpose. So the point is examiner is what is the weightage of uh, law in the examination? It is a total weightage is of nine marks. You know, we are going to see like uh, till 130, we are going to see law only. Okay. So it is a, it is having a weightage of uh, nine marks and I'm telling you just have the basics clear in you and you will be through with this nine marks and that nine. Uh, can you tell me the percentage of this nine marks? Can you tell me? Paper is of 100. 100. 9%. 9%. Really it is 9% or something else? Ma'am, according to 60 marks passing. That is important. Apna focus is 15%. <laughs> yes, our focus should be 60. 100 thoda lane apne go. Apne ko to, apne ko 60 pe concentration dal na hai, hai? So it is of 15 per percent. So just grab the areas which are soft for you, where you can grab marks easily. Okay. Now we'll see auction. I know many of you must be knowing what is an auction. Uh, basically, uh, there is a, it is also a tri-party thing. The three persons are needed for that. One is vendor. Another one is the auctioneer and auctioneer is basically the agent of the vendor. Vendor is basically the main seller. The goods belong to that particular vendor. And then the bidders, we need that. And we need the highest bidder that would be turning himself into a purchaser. Now, what should be the authority of the auctioneer? Obviously, if he is an agent of the vendor, whatever he have to do, he should be do in the interest of the principal. He must follow the instructions of the, he must follow the instructions of the, you know, vendor. He must conclude all the proceedings very well and all, and he have to abide by the laws and all. And what are the duties? See, vendor has a duty to give a proper legal title, to deliver uh, goods in a proper condition. Purchaser, he have to adhere to the conditions and he have to pay for uh, whatever he have uh, bought upon. And public, they have to maintain the decorum, no nuisance at the time of bidding of the things and all. Then remember these two points that we have seen uh, in the contract. That is basically the misdescription and uh, misrepresentation. Remember that? So it is yes. the same point. Suppose if an auction, the auctioneer or vendor is doing any, uh, you know, fraud or any misrepresentation. So then that, that fraud, that auction can be turned into a void one. Okay. So these are the two points. I'm not explaining again here because that are the same points. Now, 
how does it happen whenever there is about to happen a auction they need to have some advertisements for like uh, for that and in advertisements you tell about their description their condition what are do and don'ts in time of bidding the things what are the eligibility conditions for becoming a bidder that you all uh, you know advertise in your uh, catalogs and all and what is rostrum do you people know what is rostrum Yes, please. Do, don't see the Google meaning. Anybody knows no. what is rostrum? No, ma'am. Rostrum is nothing. Basically, that you know that uh, cemented platform that we used to have in our school, where we stand yeah. that raised cement platform, where we used to go there and speak our debate and all. So that is basically a rostrum uh, where you know auctioneer stands and he do the whole auction processes. So if auctioneer put any of the statement on the rostrum, it is called a legal statement. That statement has a legal effect and a binding between the parties. So uh, auctioneer have to take a due care, due caution while he is speaking on the rostrum. And then, uh, you know, the last one, basically you have to conduct the sale in whatever the terms and conditions, there could be a reservation of price. Like suppose I, the vendor, I am telling to my auctioneer that my minimum bid, bid should start at rupees 5,000, or I can say that my goods should not be sold less than 50,000. So auctioneer have to take care of both of the things and right to bid. Uh, suppose if you are specifically negated that you cannot bid upon that, so you cannot bid upon that. And you cannot, uh, you know, sometimes uh, there can be a bidding agreements like you and me are jointly bidding up the things. So that is all agreement between you and me. And memorandum of sale, it basically is a document that records the total process of the auction, tells us upon like what were the bids that came upon, who were selected, and a bid could be concluded by either fall of a hammer or by ringing of a bell or by saying one, two, three. So it depends upon, you know, auctioneer will narrate you each and everything. How will it conclude upon? Now, what are the rights? Rights are basically to receive the remuneration, to indemnify the auctioneer, to compensate him because he is doing work for the vendor only. Now, now we are having 10 minutes. Uh, we will, uh, you know, uh, we will take a break on 10.30 and we will be meeting exactly by 11, right? So 10 minutes are there. We will be going for constitution. Now, what is the constitution? That is basically, uh, you know, you know that who is the main hero behind our constitution? It is Mr. B. R. Ambedkar ji. And as you know, like till today in, uh, in the whole world, our constitution is the longest written one. And we offer only single citizenship, not unlike, you know, like Australia, because, you know, with the developing country, we need to be changing uh, the things upon. Adult suffrage that we have talked about that, you know, that is of 18 years age after 18 years of age, we are, we are having the, you know, point of contract and 18 years is considered as the main age to do anything like we can vote for our, uh, you know, uh, that uh, elected persons and all. And last one, India as a domestic democratic, that means we are by the people for the people of the people. We are socialistic. Our country is for society. We are sovereign. That means we are not under any monarchism system. We are not under any king's rule. We are having a proper government. Then we are secular. What is the meaning of word secular? That means India does not profess any particular religion, but it allows its citizen to profess whatever the religion they want to, and we are a republic state. So in this, I always ask a question. Have you seen the movie Super 30? Yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Nobody has seen that movie Super 30, Ritik Roshan. Yes, ma'am. Based on the yes, professional. Have yes. anybody seen that? No. Okay, you people don't Dekha, watch Dekha. movie. So that is basically uh, the Republic state. 
वैसे प्रधानमंत्री जी के बेटे है नहीं बट अगर होते तो भी वो प्रधानमंत्री के बाद प्रधानमंत्री नहीं बन सकते थे द थिंग इज वी आर हैविंग अ रिपब्लिक स्टेट ओनली द पर्सन हु इज यू नो वोटेड अपॉन दैट कैन बिकम दैट यू नो दैट इज अ रिपब्लिक state not like the king's rule that after the death of the king the prince will become the king that is not in our country so we follow that you know one thing about just for the knowledge purpose you know who have written our constitution our constitution is hand written who have written it it is mr prem bihari rai zada ji and you know till today in the museum of our parliament its hand written copy have been preserved till now and they have been kept in helium cases and all so it is very beautifully written written in a calligraphy and there was you know there is also written that how many pens were used to write that total constitution because our constitution is very big in number now now we'll see the fundamental rights this uh, these we have seen in our school times you know in our civics uh, subject we all have seen this you all know what are the rights that is the right of equality we all should be treated equal there should not be discrimination there should be a right of freedom i can sp do my speech anywhere i can associate anywhere i can assemble anywhere i can roam anywhere i can settle anywhere i had these right of freedoms tell me one thing first what is the meaning of word fundamental they are not rights they are fundamental rights what is the meaning of word fundamental they cannot be taken away by someone okay these and there are bond, something uh, jaise hi aap matlab these are bond matlab jan se dadhikar minimum jan se dadhikar very good basic basic, 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 basic necessity the basic necessity the basics yes ayushman ji our basics without we without which we cannot live so that means what like uh, aapne jo kaha i think vikas ji told that it can never be taken back from us right okay. you're right so that means in any of the scenario it cannot be ta ever taken from us everybody say yes to that yes yes okay so if this question comes in the exam that uh, can our uh, fundamental rights can be taken by the government your answer would be no in this case no ma'am uh, government can take them only you were telling us that nobody can take from us only in case of emergency exactly in case cases mein hua tha na jab lagi thi emergency yeah tabhi to hum bar bar bol rahe the right to assemble anywhere only in situations of emergency our fundamental rights can be withdrawn by the government if you see the point number 19 where was the right of assembling anywhere when we were under the lockdown where was the point of you know right of roaming anywhere so they can be taken but there should be a proper reason for taking that there should be a emergency situation right against exploitation we nobody should exploit us we should have a right of religion whatever the like i am a jain but it's my will if i want to profess christianism or any other religion that is my will okay cultural and educational rights i tell you when the constitution was made not much emphasis was on education but as we have developed so gradually we are putting the points on the education a lot it depends na when we made it the constitution that time the scenario was different we were you know just left by the britishers so we were in a very low standard situation we have to develop a lot that time but now as we are a developing good one so now the education we have make it like most important without which we cannot live upon now suppose if somebody hamper my fundamental rights i have writs against them and what are they called as right to constitutional remedies i am having a five constitutional remedies number 1 it is habeas corpus see these all have been you know pasted and copied from the uk laws so that's why the names are like that what is habeas corpus means to have a body like this body i have been given by the god to me nobody can detain my this particular body suppose if police came to me and he detained me in the jail the thing is 
without any justification nobody can detain me and if there is no justification they will get a good you know punishment uh, by the law so if somebody detain me i can take a action of uh, writ of uh, habeas corpus against that particular person second is mandamus suppose if any officer is not performing a duty i can but that duty should be in public uh, that should be a public duty okay i can put a writ of mandamus because we are paying taxes why we are paying that so that we could have a good infrastructure we could have a good life that's why though we earn 100 rupees and exactly 30 goes in the government pocket right so that 30 is for having a good life so if it is not there then we can put a writ of mandamus then thereafter understand these two writs that is the prohibition and certiorari one together now uh, we will understand prohibition and certiorari by you have heard this saying precaution is better than care yes yes what is precaution what is precaution savdhani taking Doing care anything in advance savdhani bilkul taking care that. in advance bimar padne se pehle okay and what is hmm. care after getting ill okay so p for prohibition p for p for precaution c for care c for certiorari okay what happens okay. in this when you are seeing the higher courts it is not the high courts it is the higher courts suppose i am a higher court you are a lower a lower court what i am judging upon you is that you are you are handling some matter and as a higher court i am feeling the matter you are judging upon is you you are overstepping your authority that matter is not under that should not be under your court okay that should be under some higher court okay. so what i can do i can transfer the matter from the lower court to the higher court okay point to be noted is that lower court have not taken any decision on that matter okay so before the lower court can take the decision i have shifted the matter towards the higher court that is a precaution thing now what happened in certiorari again higher court is thinking the matter going under the lower court is not under his uh, you know jurisdiction so what i am doing again i am transferring the matter from the lower court to the higher court but here there is one problem and that is lower court have taken decision on the matter getting my point i have to take a care bimar pad gaya dhyan dena he have taken the decision on the matter so first i will, the higher court will do what he will quash the decision he will cancel the decision thereafter it will transfer the matter to the higher court point to be quoted uh, noted is that in both the situation the case is being transferred from lower court to higher court but in prohibition the lower court have not taken the decision but in case of certiorari the lower court have taken the decision but what i am doing the higher court i am first cancelling the decision then i am transferring to the higher court and the last one is quo warranto suppose if you ask me the meaning neha what is debit and i am not able to answer you what is debit won't you doubt on my degree that neha is a accountant she is a lawyer she is a rv and she don't know the meaning of debit will you doubt me or not definitely you will doubt me ki whether really neha as ca or not this is called that we are checking upon the authority whether you are sitting in this public office are you really worth for that so you know it looks very easy to talk here that we will do co warranto or prohibition or certiorari but it is very technical process it is not easy to put a writ against someone you need to have some solid evidences only then only you can get these constitutional remedies and last is the directive principles see point to be noted there is a difference between the directive principles and the fundamental rights fundamental rights are the basics with without which we cannot live about okay and if somebody takes my fundamental rights i can go into the court but point to be noted for uh, directive uh, we call it dpsp okay not dai puri sev puri it is basically the 
you know, directive principles of state policy. So what is DPSP? It is basically the principles, but they are not justiciable in law. Okay, suppose if I'm not having any particular directive principle applying on me, I cannot go to the court. They are not justiciable in courtroom. They are recommendatory. They are not mandatory. Fundamental rights are mandatory. They are just recommendatory in nature. They are basically the Gandhian principles. They are basically the international peace uh, principles, community principles, like, you know, we should have equal pay for equal work. There should not be cow slaughtering. As Gandhiji was thinking that, you know, there should be upliftment of the cottage industry. We must save the nature, things like that. And in, if I talk about the international peace and all, like, for example, we should uh, save the, uh, we should, uh, you know, not let the company uh, countries to fight. We should have a good liberalism on them. There should be good relations between the countries and all. So, for exam purpose, how you will take up this particular topic, you just need to just have a single reading. That is enough for the exam purpose. You don't have to learn anything because I also understand we are humans, not computers. So, before exam, just give a thorough reading. It is just talking about being good for India, doing good for unemployment things, like doing good for the maternity things. Like prior, there were only, uh, you know, relief for three months. Now, there is a, a compulsory relief for six months so these are just the recommendatory changes not the mandatory one so it is exactly uh 10 uh, 33 i'm three uh, minutes i've crossed the limit so we are meeting by exact 11 okay take a good break come and okay. recharge we will take the session again by 11 right okay, okay where is that person is that too heavy no no was that too heavy? Not no, 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 ma'am. Okay, so whenever the things are turning heavy, just tell me. Not the time, ma'am. Not at all. Time to take the break. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we okay. see you by exact eleven. Okay. Be okay. exact by the time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Welcome back, everyone. Yes. Is everybody yes, on the desk? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I hope everybody is recharged now. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So let's see the other parts as well. There are basically three branches of, uh, you know, government has basically three branches. They, yes, please. Anybody saying me something? Okay. First branch is legislative. What, what is the work of the legislative? Is to legislate the laws. And in legislative branch, it comes upon the Rajya Sabha, Lok Sabha, right? They legislate the laws for us. And then there is the work of the executive team. What does they do? They need to, you know, uh, they need to execute the laws. That is their uh, uh, work. And what is the, who is the head of the executive team? It is basically the president. Thereafter comes the vice president. And on the third number, it is the prime minister. But you know what actually happens in reality. Basically, the prime minister only leads up in executing the laws and all. And thereafter, it comes the works of the judiciary. Suppose executive committee is executing the laws, but there are persons who are not following the laws. So the judiciary things help in, you know, by punishing the wrongdoers, they can let uh, the, you know, execution of the laws very well in the country. Then we will start with tort. Okay. Before I switch over to tort, I need your, you know, uh, like, uh, I need your, uh, I will not say exactly consent. I just need uh, the knowledge of yours. Are you now able to judge what is an agreement and what is not an agreement? Or what is an agreement, what is a contract? Are you able to do that? Yes, yes. Okay. And do, do not be confused if you have written sale agreement. So that will be agreement only, not contract. No, it is a contract only. That's just, you know, the term you have used upon. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't make a problem to tackle it under the Indian Contract Act. And one thing more important, remember, uh, like, you know, I have uh, like uh, not only the written contracts, the oral contracts are allowed totality in total, uh, you know, perspective of, uh, of defending in the courtroom. It is allowed. Yes, it is tougher to prove it in the court, but it is allowed uh, thereof. I have one last case study before I move to tort. Suppose, not supposingly, really, my children exams are on their way. I promise them, ki if you bring, uh, if you bring 90% in your exam, I will get you a Xbox or a PlayStation, whatever you say. Suppose my son, uh, son scored 98% in the examination and still I have not got him a PlayStation or a Xbox. Can he sue upon him? Uh, if you are uh, like looking for his age, suppose his age is 90, then first, can he sue upon me? Yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Naveen ji shayad khud baut playstation khilte hai. Tabhi wo itna bada wala yes kya hai. Nahi ka sakta. What about others? No. Shal ji to keh rahe hai ma'am paise bachao, 25,000 mat lutao, aap to mat karit bao. Cheek hai. Anybody else? Nahi ka sakta. Ma'am. Yes please? Nahi ka sakta su. Son nahi ka sakta na? Bhai maine socha mother bhi lawyer, father bhi lawyer. So thoda to khun us mein bhi law ka hai hi. So, he can think upon, but he cannot do. For this reason, he cannot sue us again the same point. Okay, so he can't sue us again the same point. He cannot sue us again the same point. There was no legal relationship with us. It is regarded as a domestic relationship. Why? He is bringing the scores for him, not for me. Though I persuaded him for the same, but it is still not a business relationship at all. So, you know, what will happen in the real examination? Uh, you know, examiner will try to confuse a lot uh, among these uh, through your uh, uh, domestic uh, agreements, through the social agreements. So be strict to the point that we will only consider the legal things, the uh, business things only. There was one of the very famous cases in the contract act only. It was uh, known as Balfour versus Balfour. What happened in that particular case? The husband was being, you know, transferred to the country Siolon. Okay. 
तो वेन हजबेंड वॉज गोइंग टू अन अदर कंट्री लिविंग हिज यू नो वाइफ अपार्ट फ्रॉम हिम सो ही वॉज वेरी इमोशनल दैट टाइम so uh, he promised uh, his wife that see i'm going to see you alone so definitely for that i'm i will be you know like monthly i'm giving you 1000 uh, 1000 dollars suppose so now words i will be giving you 1500 dollars the wife said okay he just wiped off his tears and said a big bye to his husband and his husband was in ceylon one two months he was giving 1500 dollar as expense for uh, uh, to his wife but on the third month he just gave uh, 1000 dollar only can his wife sue the husband that he has offered and she accepted ki yes now you will be giving me 1500 dollars can his wife do any case in this regard yes ma'am is giving okay what about others okay no no ma'am answer is no where is the business standing over here it is still a domestic thing ghar mein vaada maine bhi apne kitton ko vaada kar rakha hai tumko ye dilaungi tumko ye dilaungi pata hai wo log mere pe case nahi kar sakte why but ma'am nominal damages honge na usko kya cheez kya cheez usko damages bhi to honge uske basis pe kaise damages फॉर uh, एग्जाम्पल वो उस पंद्रह सौ के बेसिस पे उसने नहीं उसने हाँ तीन सौ डॉलर का उसने एक ई एम आई बांध के रखा हुआ है ठीक है ठीक है उस पंद्रह सौ के बेसिस पे अब वो ई एम आई नहीं भर पा रही है तो उसके जो उसको उसको जो लॉसेस होंगे उसके लिए तो फिर वो रिस्पॉन्सिबल है तो आप एक बात पॉइंट बताइए by what authority he is increasing his आई ई एम आई है हजबेंड टोल्ड दैट अब फिर व्हाट हाउ द कोर्ट हाउ द केस विल बी डिफेंडेड इन द कोर्ट कि भाई क्या बोलते हैं ना ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ लव एंड अफेक्शन बिकॉज आई एम डिपार्टिंग फ्रॉम हर सो यू नो इमोशनली अपन कभी कभी कुछ ज्यादा ही किए जाते हैं तो आई जस्ट टोल्ड हिम फॉर एक्स्ट्रा फाइव हंड्रेड डॉलर बट वॉज देर एनी लीगल बिजनेस बिसाइड दैट की दैट ही इज मेंट टू पे द फाइव हंड्रेड एक्स्ट्रा नो इट वॉज जस्ट अ इमोशनल कॉल दैट्स इट इमोशन में तो आदमी क्या क्या नहीं फेंक देता अपन नहीं फेंक देते क्या इसे लॉट हम ये करेंगे वो करेंगे मैंने भी सच में मेरे सन को कहा था आई विल गेट यू आई एक्स बॉक्स बट वेन ही रियली गॉट द नाइनटी परसेंट आई वॉज लाइक बाई आई आई शुड गेट हिम आई एक्स बॉक्स इट्स ओके बॉट द स्कोर्स फॉर हिम नॉट फॉर मी यू नो ये प्यार मोहब्बत के वादे कोर्ट में नहीं चलते कोर्ट अंडरस्टैंड बिजनेस वो फैमिली कोर्ट में चल जाएगा जो आप मैटर बोल रहे हैं ना दैट विल बी अंडर द फैमिली कोर्ट दैट विल नो आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट इंडियन कॉन्ट्रैक्ट एक्ट ओनली द एक्ट दैट परसेस टू द बिजनेस विल सब्साइड इन दैट पर्टिकुलर थिंग अदरवाइज दैट मैटर विल बी ट्रांसफर टू द फैमिली कोर्ट नॉट सो प्लीज कीप वन पॉइंट वेरी स्ट्रेट नो डोमेस्टिक एग्रीमेंट्स नो सोशल एग्रीमेंट्स अगर इन पे अगर मुआवजा मिलने लग गया तो सबसे द फर्स्ट पर्सन विल बी आस्किंग कम्पनसेशन इज फ्रॉम द पॉलिटिशियंस हु एक्सेप्ट लॉर्ड ऑफ द थिंग्स आई प्रोमिस टू डू दिस आई प्रोमिस टू डू दिस एंड दे नेगेट लॉर्ड ऑफ देर प्रोमिस बट वी डोंट केस देम वाई दे आर जस्ट सोशल प्रोमिस दे आर नॉट अ बिजनेस गेटिंग माई पॉइंट बट मैम वो तो रिटर्न में वो अपने उसमें जो प्रमोशन में लिख के देते उसमें लिखते हैं ना पार्टी के उसमें क्या बोलते हैं वो वो लेटर वो जो क्या हाँ, बोलते हैं हाँ, उसको आई 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 वाज 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 फॉरगेटिंग फॉरगेटिंग द द नेम एक्चुअली एक्चुअली कुछ एक कुछ ड्राफ्ट जो बनता है उनका वादों का घोषणा पत्र क्या होता है घोषणा घोषणा पत्र पत्र ही बोलते हैं कुछ और बोलते हैं कुछ इंग्लिश में नाम है मैं भूल रहा हूँ उसको मैं इंग्लिश और हिंदी दोनों का ही भूल रहा मैनिफेस्टो 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 एक्चुअली द राइट 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 आप बता दीजिए कौन से वाले पॉलिटिशियन पे आज तक केस हुआ है यू गिव मी वन नेम हम कर नहीं सकते या आप नहीं कर सकते व्हाई फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल ये कोई आपका फंडामेंटल राइट नहीं है सेकेंड इट इज जस्ट अ प्रिंसिपल जैसे डायरेक्टिव प्रिंसिपल डीपीएसपी लिखे हुए हैं इट इज जस्ट लाइक दैट दे आर नॉट जस्टिसबल इसी बात पे मैं आपको एक बात बताती हूँ देर वॉज अ केस वन वन ऑफ द पार्टी आई डाउट वॉट आई रिमेंबर बट आई रिमेंबर द एग्जैक्ट केस नेम्स कुड बी मिस मैच देर वॉज अ केस इन यूपी साइड ओके एंड द मैनिफेस्टो वॉज ऑन स्टैम्प पेपर यस 
what they did that ati i think it was mr ajit jogi or what uh, not yogi ji not yogi ji i think it was i think ajit jogi ji they have printed the manifesto on the stamp paper that see if we are going to win we will do this and if we don't do this it is on the stamp paper you can sue us if it is written on the stamp paper na then you are bounded by that manifesto is not something to be bound upon so it happened once in a history what i what i remember this has been abhi mp mein wo wale uh, elections chal rahe hain uh, uh, parshad wale matlab jo local bodies ke local authorities Achha. ke Achha. to hamari society ne kya kiya hai ki uh, unhone jit, uh, paise to unhone virodh kiya tha sare chunav ka but yeah. unhone abhi uh, log sare aane lage unke paas candidates to unne sare candidates se ek uh, isi uh, agreement pe sign karaye hain acha ha stamp paper pe वही तो आप जीते हो तो आपको ये सब कराना पड़ेगा तब तो देर बाउंड ओके नॉर्मल ले यू नो दैट ए फोर साइज मैनिफेस्टो के नॉट बी पुट इन द कोर्ट दे आर जस्ट अ सोशल प्रोमिस दे विल जस्ट एस्केप दे आर नॉट अंडर द इंडियन कॉन्ट्रैक्ट एक्ट दैट इज द प्रॉब्लम बट दैट स्टैम्प्ड मैनिफेस्टो is under the you know indian contract act why when you are writing when you are getting something stamped that what is stamping means that you are bounding with something so oh, that is uh, you know uh, justiciable in the court room so i hope aaj thoda sa law aapka friend bana hoga i know it was a stranger to you before but see law is very logical and very general in nature and good part is that you are having the laws which are very general in nature not you know that complicated ones like transfer of property indian stamp act they are very technical and specific as well and i am again telling you you don't need to learn any sections there is there is no question in the you know i didn't attempted any question in the question paper related to section so i will teach only what i have preached myself okay no fake uh, things i will be giving to you people so no, no, we need to yes please uh, actually ma'am Um, do we need to remember the article that which fundamental right is in this article see if your memory allows you i am telling you very true thing right if you can do it easily do it otherwise do why i am telling you because i am also like you only i have also cleared this exam and so it is not feasible course is so voluminous ki we cannot remember learn each and everything it is not practical i am telling you in your exam many questions can be solved from the professional logic and you know logical thinking and all so do not worry we don't have to do any rectification we are not computers we are humans we cannot learn so many things remember the things like after this session you should remember in your mind contract and agreement are different that should be a, you know uh, you don't have to learn this thing that you should uh, you have understood that thing that should be there right okay now the next topic very interesting one tort if you go and google the word tort it is basically twisted a very simple example today i am having session from morning 8:30 to 3:30 for you people i am till 1:30 only okay there is a neighbor to me who is uh, you know listening to music and the empire that he is using to listening is like he is crossing the limit what is normally allowed as per the municipality he is listening in such a high volume that you are not able to hear me my hear me properly as he is like same walled uh, neighbor to me so tell me one thing can i do something to him can i do that yes ma'am legally yes. like uh, as yes. a person i can say please <clears throat> lower down the volume thing like that still he is not listening to me how uh, what legal action can i take against him is uh, you can raise the fir fir against him fir pollution ma'am yes please against noise pollution you can sue him against noise so one thing i want to know is he doing any criminal thing with me mm, no is he doing any crime with me no 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 he is not doing crime so that means he will not come under crpc that is criminal procedure code so that means he is not doing a crime to me he is not doing uh, doing a criminal wrong to me but he is doing a civil wrong to me that comes under cpc that is civil procedure code so these type of things are called tort okay 
like he is not doing anything he is not beating me nothing like that but he is doing a wrong which you know which is not letting me live in my society well peacefully so how what what things i can do let's see upon the principles of tort tort means basically the civil wrongs only the first principles there can be questions in the exam related to the you know principles the first principle is demonum sine injuria i repeat they are the latin phrases demonum sine injuria it means there is a damage without injury damage without injury now a simple example for this i am i am running a school okay it is running very successfully i am minting a profit of say rupees 1 crore per year out of that school sooner uh, you know just adjacent to me a new school my new competitor came just adjacent to my building and whatever he is starting school he is starting in a very legal way he is not overriding any of the limits and all so because of that new competitive school the my you know my revenues the uh, profit i was minting of uh, 1 crore it shattered to rupees uh, 60 lakh only because of that new school so that means i am getting a financial damage am i right earlier my earnings was 1 crore now my earnings are 40 lakh only so that means now i am having a financial damage of 60 lakhs am i right or wrong because of that neighbor yes okay can i sue upon that yes no. no what do you think give me a logic if you are saying yes then a logic if you are saying no then also a logic it's about fair competition ma'am it's about fair competition exactly i cannot sue him though i am getting a damage but he is not giving injury on my legal rights he is not crossing his limit so though i have to bear the damage but i cannot get any you know uh, compensation for that because he is not overriding my legal rights okay now second one is just a vice versa what it says for injuria sine damino means there is a injury but there is no damage i repeat injury is there to my towards my legal rights but i i don't have any sort of damage for that example i am basically you know a flower lover or a garden lover person so i have really maintained my lawn very well very good flowers very good greenery very good trees in my garden so there was a stranger he came uh, he just opened the latch of my gate he entered my home he was taking a round of my garden he slept in my garden for 2 hours and just he was he have not plucked a single flower or he have not bought any damage to my property i just saw him from the balcony and as i saw him i just rushed towards the downstairs and just stopped the person can i do any action against that particular person point yes, to be noted he have not given any damage to me no damages you can i can why yes. gate crashing so, yes please gate crashing gate crashing and he trespassed my property privacy my private man. property yes please anybody privacy. saying privacy privacy yes trespassing basically trespassing basically though he haven't plucked a single flower but what he plucked off he plucked off the trespassing thing it is not allowed so what was the earlier case there was a financial damage but there was no legal injury in this case there was zero damage but there was a financial injury uh, sorry there was a injury on my legal rights so yes i can definitely sue on the basis of tort injuria sine demino now third principle says for principle of vicarious liability now what is vicarious liability you know normally the rule says if i have done wrong to you then only i should be the liable person to make your loss good upon 
but there are some situations where the loss is made by other and it has to be borne by other parties. Simple example, suppose my son was playing a cricket and by mistake, he hit it, uh, the, you know, uh, glass pane of your window. So <clears throat> the wrong was done by him, but I need to pay that particular damage from my pocket. That is the other party have to pay your wrong. Now. Anybody saying in between? Okay. Fourth one, voluntary non-fit injuria. So uh, in last I've seen that uh, less of uh, you people see movies and all. So what about IPL, whether you see or not? Yes. yes. Vishal ji is saying yes. Okay. Yes. Or also Viral ji is also saying yes. So chicken. That's good. I am also IPL watcher and I'm uh, based at Jaipur. So, you know, some matches happen in my city as well. Assume a situation. There is a match between CSK and uh, and RR, that is Rajasthan Royals. I went as a, spec, uh, a speculator there, a spectator there. And I was sitting and Dhoni was batting and he made a good shot. Good shot went direct to uh, direct for a six. And that six directly went here on my eyes. Can I take any, uh, you know, re reimbursement from either Dhoni, CSK or any other, you know, fraternity? Can I take that? No, ma'am. No. Aap na to mere ko 10,000 dilwaate ho, na diamond pendant dilwaate ho, na koi muawza dilwaate ho. Aise kya matlab, mere se kya galti ho gai aisi? So the point is, you are right. Yes. Because when I'm sitting as a spectator, so that means I'm, you know, I'm aware, I'm voluntarily permitting myself and I know these sort of injury can happen in the ground. So I'm voluntarily saying yes for this. Now, again, uh, when it is a to uh, tort, so we will twist the situation. Again, I'm there, again, CSK and RR playing and I'm sitting, now Dhoni ball is not coming on my eye. It is basically where I'm sitting, there is a shed over my head. It just crashed on my head. Then can I sue anyone for this? Yes. Or just I have to yes, yes, take that pain yes. also. Yes. Yes. And yes. God, you people are in my favor. So yes, I'm not sitting for free for getting hits only. Now this time, yes, yes, definitely the stadium authorities only. Because when you're organizing a match, that means you should, you know, have good infrastructure facilities so that you can conduct the match. Now I can take the compensation easily. Ma'am, uh, 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 ma uh, um, uh, giant wheels are in the Yes, we voluntarily ja ke hain. but we are not allowing them voluntarily to uh, agar accident hota hai to. Kya kya matla? I didn't get your point. Come okay. again. We are voluntarily ja ke hain usme. Correct. Usme accident kabhi bhi ho sakta hai. Correct. But agar us kuch accident hota hai, hmm. then can we sue the authorities? Ab pehli baat hai, nuksan kaisa hua hai? How the harm have happened? It can be two way. First. आप खुद ही इतना डर गए झूले से कि आपको आ, कोई अटैक आ गया तब आप है ना बेसिकली उस दर साफ लिखा हुआ होता है कमजोर दिल वाले इधर ना बैठे ना बैठे और सबसे पहली बात इफ यू हैव बिफोर एंटरिंग टू दैट पर्टिकुलर व्हाटएवर द एंटरटेनमेंट पैलेस द प्लेस दैट इज इफ यू हैव साइंड अ फॉर्म एंड देयर इज अ क्लॉज इन दैट इफ एनी मिसहैप happen in there, then we are not responsible, enter the slide on your risk. Tab toh wo company bilkul hi bach gai. Getting my point, wo jo sign karwa lete na paper apne se, ghuste hi, apan jo padhte nahi hai. Usme agar aisa koi clause hai, tab toh wo company bach jai ki. But, ab isme important but ye hai, but if the wrong is due to the infrastructure problem, jhule ki kadi tedi ho gai thi, ya toot gaya, then chai wo usne kitna bhi form barwaya ho, they have to repay the damages. Because we are sitting for, you know, ki thik hai, agar apne ko dar lag raha hai, apni galti se ho gaya, that is something else. Aap hi dhe dhang se jhule pe nahi baithe, aapne belt kol di nahi bhai, mein toh aise hi lagaunga, tab aap responsible ho. But if there is infrastructure ka problem, hai, definitely that company is responsible. 
तो देखिए पता है आप लोग जैसे एक क्वेश्चन पूछ रहे हैं तो मैं आपको पॉइंट फुल बात बताती हूँ वेन एवर दीज सॉर्ट ऑफ मैटर्स आर देयर तो वी नीड टू इन्वेस्टिगेट व्हाट काइंड ऑफ केस इट इज व्हाट इज द बेस लाइन ऑफ द केस देन वी कैन गेट द सब्जेक्टिविटी ओके इस मैटर में तो कंपनी गलत है ओके okay, इस मैटर में तो हमारा कंप्लेनेंट ही गलत है बिकॉज ही हिमसोल वॉज रिस्पॉन्सिबल अगर बेल्ट नहीं लगाएगा तो, तो गिरेगा ही गिरेगा so that all matters so a lot of a lot collective uh, factors are there to come to the you know point of decision yes please is your query solved yes ma'am yes ma'am ma'am can you explain second one second so, one yes sure so with second one i will also you know one by one free i will explain first one also number one first one says demonum sign injuria that means there is a damage but there is no legal injury no legal injury means the other party have not overrided your legal rights like i have given you the example of you know that school i was running minting a profit of rupees 1 crore and some days later uh, any competitive school just came by my next side and because of that i am incurring a losses of rupees 60 lakh per year i cannot do any sort of you know uh, implications upon that because in that case there was just a financial damage no legal injury on my rights but second case is a vice versa that is injuria signed demono that means there is a injury but there is no damages injury like some person have just you know trespass my property just have a good look of my property though he have not damaged my property but still he have damaged my rights of privacy so definitely i can take action against him of trespassing my property that this is the second point you were talking about of na yes ma'am okay is it uh, is it good or do i need to explain more okay it's okay okay it's thank you so yeah. much okay now let's move to the fifth one there are two points strict liability and absolute liability strict liability has been propounded by a famous case you know some cases are so famous that they uh, you know that they just uh, the laws can be changed with that uh, orders and all so it was the case between the rylands and the fletcher after that the strict liability came upon now let's see what happened in that case there were two parties one was rylands and another oh. was yes please okay one was ryland and another one was the fletcher what was there ryland was having uh, you know ryland was having mills and fletcher was having mines so for running the you know mill uh, very you know economically ryland want to make some of reservoir in his uh, in his mills and all so he called up some engineers and some architects for the same engineers and architects were making the reservoir for the ryland and when they were going underground so what they see the they basically the engineers and architects saw some uh, open shafts that were going towards the mines of the fletcher but uh, they didn't did anything for the same and they didn't reported the same to the fletcher uh, sorry ryland also and they let that uh, shafts open they don't bother at all so what happened the reservoir was done and now it is the final day of testing the reservoir so how the things were done the water was going down and down from the reservoir and as it reached the ground level the water from the open shafts went direct to the uh, fletcher's mines and that uh, by that fletcher incurred uh, huge losses in his mines and that's why he you know he just uh, filed a suit against the ryland but ryland ka said let's see i am not the person who have made these uh, reservoirs and all you must take the callers of the engineers and the architects it is they they people they are responsible for the same but house of lords just uh, you know ordered in this particular case that yes though the reservoir was made by the engineers and architect but it was made for you so you are the ultimate responsible person not that particular engineers and um, engineers and that uh, architect 
in that case, there comes up, uh, you know, there propounded a principle of strict liability. It says if it, it applies to the individual, okay, not to the companies, strict liability. It applies to the individual that if any individual is doing any non normal usage of the land or whatever the property is having and any wrong done th thing done upon that, then the owner of that property would be responsible for the wrong. And yes, op uh, making a reservoir is not a normal usage. It is an abnormal usage of the land. So by that, Ryland have to pay money to the Fletcher. They have to do that. And later on, Ryland also did the cases on the engineers and architect because it was their fault, you know, by which uh, so much uh, huge amount of losses incurred by the Fletcher and all. So after this case, it came upon the strict liability concept. Now, second concept is absolute liability. In this, you remember one thing specifically, it is regarding the individuals. Second, it is only when, when there is non-normal usage of the place. Next, absolute liability. Point to be noted in this basically what is happening, it is applicable on the enterprises and the point is that uh, the enterprising are, uh, prices are doing the business, which is not normal. Like they're uh, doing the business of the hazardous substances, like, you know, fumes, gases and all. I think someone was uh, here from MP. I think Vikasji, you are from MP. Gopal Grass tragedy. Yes, 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 yes. So can anybody narrate what exactly happened in the Bhopal gas tragedy? Ma'am, a uh, uh, factory tha, uh, uh, chemical fertilizers. Ka. Correct. And uh, uh, methyl isocyanide was used. Yes. And uh, due to their technical negligence, there was a wall of methyl isocyanide. It was open. It was open. And it was open in the whole city. And uh, the, the gas is really poisonous or uski wajah se bohat se logo ki death ho gai thi. Exactly, exactly. So for that particular things or basically bhai wo company ka tha, hai na? Exactly. It was not an individual thing. So that's why strict liability cannot be propounded on the same. So for the enterprises related liability, it is the, you know, absolute liability. It applies only on the enterprises. Whoever are doing any hazardous substance business and all. So, like uh, they, he said that there was a negligence on their part and due to which lot many people have to suffer the same. So, if something happens like that, then the enterprise is liable to all the persons who have, who have been incurring any of the damages because of that uh, hazardous substance and all. So, that is basically the absolute liability. Now. Now, as I told you that I give legal advisory plus uh, being a lawyer also, I tell you very, uh, very true thing to you. You know, sometimes I also have fights in some restaurants or some malls or some showrooms or with some person. And I also say them a very normal thing. Let me see you to the, uh, see you in the court or I will sue you. I say it, but I tell you a true a truth that in my back of my mind, I always think who will do the suit, who will go to the court, who will, uh, you know, there were uh, like uh, less people of you see the movies, but uh, remember Davini, Damini movie, Tariq yeah. pe Tariq, Tariq pe Tariq, it is true. Tariq. Yeah. If you see uh, the district courts, it is not less than a Kumbhka Mela, you can uh, mist there up, you can, uh, you know, you, you will think what it is. Like, you know, there are heaps of files, you know, when uh, not only me, you people also, how we used to assume court when we were kids by seeing in the movie, very beautiful room, big hall, very airy thing. Everybody is sitting, listening, two persons are standing, calling the witness and that. I know, I hope some people have seen the courts. Is that so? Not at all. So the thing is, I am being a lawyer. I will say to my client, whenever a client approaches to me, Kineya, this is the matter. I always tell him one thing, go and do the out of court settlement. Otherwise, you know, ye pure saal ka matter gaya. why? Because we know the truth of the law system and as well. So if a client approaches me and he's not ready for out of court settlement, then second advice I give him is basically arbitration. Okay. 
Why, why arbitration? It is basically the method to solve the problem by non intervention of court. It is not only, you know, cost saving. Now, people, how we are living our life, we don't want to save cost a lot. We have to save time a lot. So, it is a time saving thing and as well the cost saving thing. So, important thing to be noted for your exam purpose is. In arbitration agreement, like in contract, what I told you that it is no matter whether you are having a oral contract or a written contract, both will get the same respect. But in case of agreement, the uh, arbitration agreement must be in writing. If it is not, then you cannot go for arbitration. So, I am repeating it again. Arbitration agreement, that is a contract only. It is written agreement over there. Arbitration contract must be in writing. If you are saying I have done an oral contract for arbitration, it can never take you for the arbitration proceedings and all. And there are some disputes which we cannot take for arbitration. They are like, you know, criminal offenses. We cannot take murder in the arbitration segment. Murder will be solved through CRPC only, not through the arbitration. Or if it is a judicial process or a child custody process that uh, follows their separate act. So, we cannot take for the arbitration purpose. Or if it is a guardianship matter, it will go through the guardianship act. Or if it is an insolvency matter, who solves the insolvency? What is the code behind the insolvency? IBBI, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code of India. IBC. Okay. Insolvency bankruptcy code that came after uh, that, you know, Vijay Malia ji. So, uh, oh. you know, we people, like you people, LNB people, I and the PNM people, we get good amount of work in IBC cases because there is a mandate to appoint two land building uh, land valuers. I, uh, Raju sir must be doing well. Yes, sir. Yes. In IBC, we are at good demand. And yeah. sir, you can uh, evaluate a, any of the asset class. Right, sir? And uh, the matters like intangible assets and all, because, you know, uh, they are also solved uh, through their own act. So, these matters are not arbitrable in the, for the arbitration proceedings and all. Okay, now there yeah. is a question. I'm just removing it. Tell me, if I have to appoint the arbitrator, how many arbitrators I should appoint? You know, one looks quite uh, like, you know, very, um, one looks not decisive. I saw that when we have to take opinion, we don't take an opinion of one, more than one, so that we have different views of the people. So, how many should be the number? Should it be even or odd? Odd. Odd number. Nobody, I hope nobody is telling odd. you four. Okay. Why? What will happen in even? Even number. four persons to you know push the car. But you know what was happening? Car was not going anywhere. Why? Do aage se dakka de rahe the, do piche se dakka de rahe the. So please have a odd number, not have a even number. Even uh, number. The arbitrators. Is somebody saying me something? Because I'm uh, listening some voice in between. Do uh, anybody having any query? Okay. Oh. Then thereafter comes the point of expert determination, not only in arbitration, in our profession also, you know. In some cases, in valuations also, we need some experts, as I told you yesterday also. Point to remember, expert opinion is just an advice, not an order. We are the final authority. It is we who have to see whether we are taking that advice or not. That's a recommendatory, not a mandatory. So, expert uh, determination is just piece of advice. You know, so it depends. We can take it or we cannot. It, it all depends upon the matter. Now, as you know, like our domestic courts are so expensive. So, see about the international courts. They are way expensive. So, there are international commercial arbitrations as well. So, so to solve the problems of, you know, uh, international matters and all. And what is the main principle behind the arbitration process? It is basically that we, uh, you know, that we do not have uh, intervention of courts in that, and there should not be, you know, increase of number of piling of uh, files and files. Interim measures of protection. Ma'am. 
yes please uh, ye jo uh, arbitration hai is, is it some kind of matlab jaise court hota hai waise hi hota hai ki kaise hota hai matlab wo ki hum jab hum appoint karte hain tab arbitration hota hai ye kaise suppose kari apan dono hai theek hai we both are doing any contract theek in fact main aapko bata rahi hu main apni jo valuation report bhi sign karti hu main usme ek line likhti hu if we will be having any disputes that will be solved through arbitration and that will be in jaipur hota okay. hai na apan apne caveats to likhenge report mein apne ko to apna kya hai apan ko khud ko bacha ke chalna hota hai to so, see agar suppose kariye aap aur main hu main aapka valuation kar rahi hu theek hai maine ye baat likh di ki bhai if uh, in future we are having in dispute any disputes so the first way we will go through arbitration and if the, it doesn't solve the purpose then we will go to normal courts and all right सपोज करिए अपन दोनों में बीच में कुछ डिस्प्यूट हो गया ठीक है उसके बाद ही अपन करेंगे ना अपॉइंट पहले से क्यों करेंगे थीक. ये तो अपना अजम्पन है कि देर कैन बी अ प्रोबेबिलिटी कि अपने में कोई डिस्प्यूट हो अगर अपन शुरू से ही सोचेंगे डिस्प्यूट तो होगा ही होगा तो मैं आपके साथ कभी काम ही नहीं करूंगी ठीक है ये होता है ना ये तो प्रोबेबिलिटी है इट मे इट मे नॉट बी तो अगर कोई डिस्प्यूट होगा उसके बाद अपन ना अपॉइंट कर लेंगे आर्बिट्रेटर को इजिली नहीं मैम मैम मैं क्वेश्चन अलग है मतलब आर्बिट्रेशन इज समथिंग कि जैसे कोर्ट होता है मतलब कोर्ट एक जो जगह होती है प्रॉपर उनके ऑफिस होते हैं मतलब जैसे अपन जाएंगे या जस्ट आपके साथ ऐसा कुछ होता है आर्बिट्रेशन कि अलग होता है एग्जैक्टली exactly कोर्ट नहीं होता बट कोर्ट से कम भी नहीं होता एग्जैक्टली आंसर इज दे अगर आप सोचेंगे वो बिल्कुल वैसा वाला इतना ऑफिशियल माहौल बट आई टेल यू इट इज वेरी फॉर्मल प्रोसीडिंग इनफॉर्मल नहीं है आर्बिट्रेशन बहुत फॉर्मल प्रोसीडिंग है वैसे का वैसे होता है कॉलिंग ऑफ विटनेसेज होता है कॉलिंग ऑफ एविडेंसेज होता है द थिंग्स आर वेरी फॉर्मल बट इफ यू विल से कि नया एग्जैक्टली कोर्ट होता है कोर्ट से उन्नीस बीस होता है ना जैसे अपन वर्ड बोलते हैं उन्नीस बीस डिफरेंट है तो खाली उन्नीस बीस डिफरेंट है उन्नीस आर्बिट्रेशन है बीस वो है अपना कोर्ट इट इज नॉट एग्जैक्टली कोर्ट यस प्लीज थर्ड पार्टी एजेंसी रहती है क्या रहता है लाइक कोर्ट का विजुअलिटी आ रहा है कि वी हैव टू हायर अ लॉयर देन वो जाएगा कोर्ट में फिर प्रोसीडिंग्स होंगी अभी आर्बिट्रेशन में क्या होता है कि कुछ आर्बिट्रर हायर हम लोग करते हैं अब देखिए इसमें भी मैं आपको रियलिटी बताऊं इट ऑल डिपेंड्स अपन ने आर्बिट्रेशन एग्रीमेंट में व्हाट व्हाट क्लॉजेस वी हैव रिटन अपॉन लाइक हाउ वी विल डू दैट सपोज करिए अपना मैटर लैंड एंड बिल्डिंग का है तो डेफिनेटली वी वांट टू हैव सम आर्बिट्रेटर हु अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट इज लैंड बिल्डिंग थिंग्स वैल्यूएशन ऑल अबाउट सो इट इज अंडरस्टैंड वन थिंग वेल वेन यू आर डूइंग एनी एग्रीमेंट try to read clauses of each of them that is very important for the future proceedings so it all depends ki ha apan log hi karte hain like main apan complainant aur defendant hai na apan hi karenge koi third party aage nahi karegi ye ab ab aap kahoge main agar karunga to wo mere liye bias jo hoga aur aap wala karoge to aapke liye bias jo hoga apan ye bhi kar sakte pata hai normally main aapko waise bata rahi jo practically kaisa hota hai jaise mere do parties hui कंप्लेनेंट और डिफेंडेंट की एक एक तो वो उठा के लिया है आर्बिट्रेटर और हमने क्या किया थर्ड आर्बिट्रेटर का बोला कि ये जो दो आर्बिट्रेटर्स है दे विल डिसाइड हु वुड बी द थर्ड आर्बिट्रेटर नॉट द पार्टी सो टू गेट अ अनबायसनेस ओपिनियंस सो इट मेजरली मैटर्स अपॉन वॉट द एग्रीमेंट यू हैव ड्राफ्टेड दैट इज द मेन थिंग तो बेसिकली आप uh, कुछ भी कर ले आना लॉयर के पास ही पड़ता है क्योंकि हम ही तो आप कहाँ से ढूंढोगे आर्बिट्रेटर्स ज्यादा से ज्यादा ऑनलाइन ढूंढ लोगे आर्बिट्रेटर्स मैम हमारे सारे सवाल थोड़ा सा मैं मतलब एक शायद क्लियर नहीं हो पा रहा है मेरा हाँ बोलिए बोलिए उसका एक वो होता है ना कि लॉयर सॉरी सर सॉरी सर आई जस्ट वॉन्टेड टू नो दैट देर इज अटेन हाइरार की लेवल इन कोर्ट्स क्वालिफिकेशन रिक्वाड फॉर आर्बिट्रेटर 
and what is the location what is the place where this arbitration is going there because it is not under court na ha 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 so it also depends upon like see agar aap indian law ko dekhe to it does not lay any specific qualification of a arbitrator agar aap dekhenge na ab main aapko practically batau main jo majorly dekhti hu jo hamare idhar ka hota hai ki jaise basically kya hote hain ye jaise retired wale judges ये आर्बिट्रेशन में चले जाते हैं बहुत सारे जैसे ना लॉयर्स भी आर्बिट्रेटर में टर्न अप हो जाते हैं तो जितना फॉर्मल कोर्ट की प्रोसीडिंग्स को देख रहे हैं ना उतना फॉर्मल नहीं होता दैट इज कोर्ट प्रोसीडिंग्स आर तो हंड्रेड परसेंट फॉर्मल बट येस इट इज आल्सो नॉट फॉर्मल बट इट इज नाइनटी परसेंट फॉर्मल नॉट टोटली टोटली इतना वो नहीं है कि ऐसा ही होना चाहिए या ऐसा ही नहीं होना चाहिए ऐसा नहीं है इनका भी बेसिकली एक आर्बिट्रेशन का भी एक पूरा पैनल बना हुआ है उसमें से आप सिलेक्ट कर सकते हैं देर आर लिस्ट ऑफ द नंबर्स हु आर आर्बिट्रेटर्स देर यू कैन सिलेक्ट दैट येस आई वॉन्ट टू मेक दिस बट इफ यू रीड द लॉ देर इज नो प्रॉपर डेफिनेशन ऑफ बिकम देर इज नो कोर्स कि भाई मैंने ये कोर्स कर लिया अब मैं आर्बिट्रेटर बन सकता हूँ ये बेसिकली अपने वो नहीं होता था पहले के टाइम में पंचायत बैठा देते थे तो पंचायत वालों की उनकी वो क्वालिफिकेशन थोड़ी नहीं देखते थे जस्ट यू सी देर यू नो यस ही इज अ पर्सन ऑफ मेरा वीडियो चला गया है क्या यस वीडियो लेट मी देख सच ओके okay. तो जैसा पंचायत में नहीं होता था कि नहीं ये बड़े हैं बुजुर्ग हैं तो ये बहुत uh, मतलब वो होंगे रिनोन तो इट इज नॉट पर्टिकुलरली दैट पंचायत बट बेसिकली यू नो मेजरली ओल्ड जजेस रिटायर्ड जजेस सम इनफैक्ट ब्यूरोक्रेट्स एज वेल ऑफिसर्स आल्सो द रिटायर्ड वन मैं तो मेजरली उन्हीं एक्सपीरियंस से आर्बिट्रेटर बनते हैं इन फील्ड वाइज ये एंड इट ऑल्सो टू बी सीन की भाई मैटर क्या है मैटर इज टू बी सीन अपॉन अगर आप ये कहीं पे भी देखेंगे कि इनकी क्वालिफिकेशन क्या होती है वो आपको कहीं पे भी नहीं मिलेगी क्योंकि लॉ में कहीं पे भी नहीं लिख रखा कि इनकी क्या क्वालिफिकेशन होना चाहिए मिनिमम क्या होना चाहिए बट इट डिपेंड्स हाँ जैसे अब मैं अगर कोई इंटरनेशनल केस है तो डेफिनेटली आई वॉन्ट अ रेप्यूटेटेड आर्बिटेटर हु इज हैविंग सर्टेन ईयर्स ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस बट इनके लिए कोई अपर लिमिट और लोअर लिमिट लॉ में नहीं लिख रखी है आई अंडरस्टैंड आपको क्या कन्फ्यूजन दिमाग में आ रहा है आई अंडरस्टैंड दैट कि यू वॉन्ट टू भाई कोर्ट तो आते ही अपना दिमाग में एक पिक्चर आ जाती है यही कोर्ट है है ना आपको देखना है आखिर ये आर्बिट्रेटर की पिक्चर कैसी दिखती होगी उसमें भी क्या वैसा वाला कटघरा खड़ा रहता होगा क्या नहीं इतना भी वो नहीं है ठीक है बट हाँ क्योंकि आप उसमें देखिए सीआरपीसी के मैटर्स है ही नहीं ठीक है उसमें मैटर्स कैसे लगेंगे मेजरली सिविल मैटर्स लगेंगे तो नॉर्मल सा एक रूम होता है और अभी तो कोरोना की देन वाइज जैसे अभी अपन वर्चुअली बैठे है कितना ही वर्चुअल आर्बिट्रेशन भी चला था आपको भी पता ही है वाली बात तो हर चीज वर्चुअल चली थी तो नॉट नेसेसरली एक ही रूम में होगी अच्छा एक पॉइंट हो सकता है इन फ्यूचर वी मेक वैल्यूएशन सो दैट वी हाँ हाँ जरूर लिखना चाहिए आई ओ भावेश जी मैं हर रिपोर्ट में लिखती हूँ नॉट अ सिंगल रिपोर्ट आई लीव विदाउट दैट बिकॉज इट इज इम्पोर्टेंट आई हैव टू सेव माई सेल्फ मेरी कंपनी बॉम्बे में कोई डिस्प्यूट हो जाए वो मुझे बॉम्बे के चक्कर कटाएगा बॉम्बे के वकील वैसे ही इतने महंगे तो मैंने क्या उसके लिए सीधा सा भाई आप जयपुर आके आर्बिट्रेशन कर लो इजी है मेरी खुद की सिटी है बिकॉज यू नो वी हैव टू सेव आर सेल इसलिए तो यस डे आई वॉज टेलिंग यू दैट वी हैव टू टेक ई एल एंड एम आर एल फ्रॉम द क्लाइंट ई एल में अपन लिखते क्या है अपना वर्क स्कोप अपना एफ एंड बर्ड अपने कमर्शियल सो इट इज इम्पॉर्टेंट फॉर आस right so shall we move because you know we'll be exceeding the time limit but uh, you know you can google it later on there's no problem uh, but the, for the court wise uh, sorry court wise no sorry for the syllabus wise you just need to remember there is a need of a non intervention of court that's why we go for the arbitral proceedings aur aap bhi arbitration ki baat kar rahe hain bahut sahi cheeze hoti not only arbitration there is a conciliation process also there is a mediation process also If you will think, uh, Ayushman ji is raising the hand. Please, Ayushman ji, can you speak to me? Yes, ma'am. Just a quick question. I mean, witness can be one of the arbitrators, not. No, 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 not at all. ऐसा नहीं कर सकते हैं, Ayushman ji. फिर तो फिर तो केस ही उनकी साइड है. केस भी. No, witness भी, uh, can be uh, from our side and uh, their side, ना? So. नहीं नहीं, you are, are arbitrator witnesses. can be the witness. You are telling that. No, I was asking a witness can be the arbitrator or not? Not at all. 
not at all then though you then you know na the decision would be the damn biased one you know if the judge and uh, you know advocate is same then uh, you know it is very uh, tough to prove the things wo to fir one sided ho jayega to wo to independent hi rakhiyega see uh, ja, arbitrators are the independent persons they cannot be connected to the case directly right suppose mera kya mera video abhi bhi nahi aaya नहीं यार जस्ट मिनट ओके सी अपना मैटर में चल रहा है ठीक है व्हाट इज देयर सपोज वी वी आर हैविंग अ डिस्प्यूट्स टुवर्ड्स सम लैंड ओके सो बट यू नो इट इज दैट इट टेक्स लेस टाइम देन अ कोर्ट बट सी इट विल स्टिल टेक अ टाइम ऑफ फाइव टू सिक्स मंथ्स एट लीस्ट राइट so i want to have some protection towards my property so i can put a point of a interim measure uh, towards the arbitration that see our matter is going but still i need to put some interim measures for my property that can be done upon there's no problem in that and you know if as a arbitrator arbitrator is overstepping the jurisdiction or the authority then that can be challenged because they have to work in their authority only they cannot override it now whenever you will be seeing in the future times a uh, listing about arbitration conciliation then you should be thinking what is the difference between both of them they both are doing the same work but still people say them very very different so yes there is a big amount of difference between the arbitration and the conciliation and the points of difference are first arbitration is a legal proceedings and conciliation is not at all a legal proceeding it is basically an informal proceedings and you know this our uh, arbitration is way formal way formal not exact court but not less than that to a very great extent and whenever we need to have arbitration we need to have agreement for that and not only agreement we need to have a written agreement for that but for process of conciliation we do not require any written agreement and thereafter now the important point of difference between the two now what is the basic difference whenever the arbitration proceedings are done arbitrators re uh, react uh, you know uh, not in a negotiated way they just you know unbiasedly they just tell their uh, orders and all but what happens in conciliation the matter is solved with negotiation suppose i am a conciliator you both are the parties okay one party is asking for 50 but another party is ready just to pay 30 only i went to the party who is calling for 50 i said see ye samne wala party 30 se zyada nahi lega main zyada se zyada 40 mein settle kara dunga fir i went to the another party you are just ready to give 30 only but ye samne wala 50 se kam nahi lega i will get the things uh, you know settle in 40 so how i am solving the problem by doing negotiations okay i am not giving any independent opinion i am you know negotiating the parties then i am coming to the common decision but this thing does not happens with the arbitration arbitration gives the opinion independently he don't go in any of the negotiation that is the main criteria of difference that's why arbitration is formal and conciliation is informal one thereafter the last one for the general law evidence laws of evidence before we speak about uh, laws of uh, evidence i need to have a simple idea of you people whenever you see a scene of court in movies what what the scene comes upon you know court from yes please court is like he is having a blindfold his eyes and works on evidences only like this ki blindfolded so he kai need like this aur taraju haath mein right right ma'am anda kanoon hai picture so the point is a black lady standing with a taraju she is a blindfolded why because she is not seeing anything she is seeing whoever is putting in the taraju the more that is the winner is uh, have you uh, really seen that uh, lady in front of a court tell me really in real aspect i am talking about 
after uh, doing my law i went to the court just for looking at that lady but i was not able to find her physically but definitely i founded her virtually everywhere how because see the main hero of the court is evidence only you know we we just do some discussion with judges also so they also put a point neha that we know that this party is right and this party is wrong but we will never give the favor in the right party until and unless we get evidence for the same so that that black lady the lady of evidence is virtually present everywhere ayushman ji is asking anything to me your hand is raised ma'am uh, i was uh, i raised my hand earlier excuse me raise i raised my hand earlier ma'am okay 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 so that is showing uh, ki still i am not solved uh, first solve me then yes, move ahead you can the low, you can lower the hand also yeah, okay ready. thank you okay okay so now let's see about the evidence first i will tell you a clear funda what really happens in evidence then we will see the lines and all see common funda is that suppose you and me we both are the parties uh, one who do the complaint is called as plaintiff complaint plaintiff and towards whom the i am doing the complaint is called as the defendant because obviously when i am doing a complaint then you will be defending yourself so there are two party, uh, parties plaintiff and defendant up uh, definitely who will win am among us that is the party who is who is having more evidence okay now who is having a burden of proof who have to prove the thing in the case so the point is suppose a situation where none of the party brings a evidence who will be losing the case that is the only party he have to prove the case in the court a simple example i am telling you a desires you know these illustrations are not are made illustration they are directly from the bare ex because nowadays what is happening with examiner he is trying to frame questions in the exam from the bare ex illustrations so see them properly before going to the exam a desires court to believe that b should be punished for a crime which a says that b has committed so see if none of the evidence is coming in this case who must be losing the case definitely a because he is pointing finger on other so if you are pointing finger on another then you have to prove the same so a must bring the proof upon this case suppose a sues for a land which is in the b's possession and a asserts that yes this particular land have been left by the will of c and who is c c is the b's father so i you tell me who will lose the case if no evidence is come upon this particular case do not read the case just give the answer by your own personal assertions a is telling this uh, property is mine okay and that property is in b's possession who is b b is basically son of c and a is telling no c have given me this property if no evidence come in this case who will win the case definitely b will win the case so who is having the burden of proof it is definitely a otherwise b is standing on a very comfortable position now suppose if i am telling a particular fact towards the court suppose i am uh, i am saying that uh, a prosecutes b for theft and wishes court to believe that b have admitted the theft to c so a have to prove simple rule is that whoever is pointing out the finger have to prove the same i am saying that you have done a, committed a theft then i have to prove the same not you suppose if i am trying to prove a, uh, a specific uh, you know fact in the court room like i am saying i am getting this property as you know uh, dying declaration may uh, have been made by b so before uh, declare before proving the dying declaration i have to prove the death you know there after only i can prove the dying declaration so these things are the connected one first i will prove the death then i will be proving the dying declaration then there are some exceptions suppose a is accused of murder which he have done but he is saying that see i have done because of unsoundedness of my mind 
So in this case also, it is A who have to prove that at the time of doing murder, he was of unsound mind. These are the exceptions. Only in these cases it happens so. <coughs> Suppose some particular fact is under my knowledge only. So it is only me who have to prove the thing. I am traveling in a train and TT came upon and I am not able to show him my ticket. So it is not TT have to prove. It is I have to prove that I have really bought the ticket. It I have missed upon. Not that uh, TT will do the, the stuff. He will definitely put a charge upon me. That is the straight thing he can do on me. Then this is as per the limitation act. What is there? Suppose. There is a person who was alive within seven years. Okay, people used to see that he is the person. And don't ask me why it is seven year only because it is written in the law. So we have to go with the law. There was a person who was alive within seven years. And uh, you know, somebody is telling, no, this person is now no more. He's dead now. So the simple rule, whoever is affirming have to prove that how can you say that this particular person is dead upon and the down one is the 108 is exactly the opposite of the vice versa of the above suppose there is any person whom we whom sorry above uh, above is the 30 years sorry not seven years Suppose there is any person whom we have not heard for seven years, he is missing and suddenly some person says, see this person is alive now and I have seen that particular person, so who will prove it? It is the person who is affirming the fact that will prove the same. So in this you see the 10 or 12 things but all the funda is same. Whoever is putting up the point finger, he have to affirm the same. Suppose if uh, suppose there is a relationship between you and me like teacher and student or a partner or a landlord tenant. So what happens? Suppose I am telling I am not your partner. So I am telling her that I am not your partner. Then I have to affirm it that there are something wrong between us. That's why we are not a partner now. So whoever is affirming thing, he have to confirm the same. Now this is important. See that. Uh, because you know the examiner can create a confusion in this. Suppose, uh, first of all, what is a good faith relationship? Suppose if my father sell a piece of land to me, will I doubt over that uh, transaction? Yes or no? No. No. I, I nowadays I don't say brother. मैंने एक बार brother का example लिया था. एक पार्टिसिपेंट ने 15 मिनट तक मुझे लेक्चर दिया था मैम आजकल भाई भाई का नहीं है काइंग का गुड फेथ मैम भाई पे तो बिल्कुल नहीं है इसलिए आजकल आई डोंट आई हैव स्टॉप गिविंग अ एग्जांपल ऑफ ब्रदर आई जस्ट स्टिक टुवर्ड्स द फादर एंड सन और फादर एंड अ डॉटर सो इफ माय फादर इज सेलिंग मी समथिंग डेफिनेटली दैट्स अ गुड फेथ ट्रांजैक्शन वेयर आई कैन ब्लाइंडली साइन द पेपर्स बिकॉज़ आई नो माय फादर इज नॉट गोइंग टू डू रॉन्ग टू मी but suppose if we are having any dispute because of this good faith transaction in the future, whom do you think? Who should uh, confirm uh, you? Who is having a burden of proof? Me or the father? You. It's not me. It is the dominating party. Yes, it would be my father. Why he is in a position to dominate me? Okay, so how the court sees the things? He need to see that uh, who is the dominating party in that particular relation, and that's how they will decide that who is the party who will prove upon. The last one is the presumptions and conclusive evidence. Yes, Viralji. Yes, Viralji. You, your hand was raised. Okay. Um, I come mere, back. Uh, mere question. Ma'am, ye, ye jo, uh, Okay. Ma'am, ek ye jo, uh, kagaz ek, mujhe, aap, jo abhi, uh, alive se bataya tha, usse mujhe yaad aaya tha. Ye, ye alive, uh, iske pehle jo slide thi na, ke saath saal tak ya tis saal tak jo wala case tha. Haan. So in a movie, uh, there, uh, Kaga's movie came and that was probably real in that movie. I missed this movie, I really. Kaga's? I didn't see this movie. It's the case of Khun Bari Bang, right? I didn't see that. Okay, so what was the case of Khun Bari Bang? Actually, a person's death is 
मतलब ऑन पेपर तो अब उसको वापस मतलब वो लड़ाई लड़ता है ताकि मैं आपको दिखा सकूं कि मैं जिंदा हूं हां आई थिंक आई आई हैव अ ब्लर मेमोरी ऑफ दिस काइंड ऑफ मूवी व्हाट यू आर टेलिंग ना इस पंकज त्रिपाठी ऐसे ही जॉली एलएलबी में भी जब अक्षय कुमार पार्ट 2 हां 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 दैट आई कैन रिमेंबर वो पिक्चर मैंने नहीं छोड़ी थी वो तो हमारी कॉम की पिक्चर है हम कैसे छोड़ सकते हैं लॉयर्स की पिक्चर थी राइट जॉली एलएलबी में भी पहला केस था अक्षय कुमार का जिसमें वो एक अलाइव प्रूफ करता है हां हां राइट 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 तो इज दिस मतलब ऐसा होता है कि इंडियन केसेस में मतलब मैं बताऊं ये क्या ये क्यों है सेवन ईयर और थर्टी ईयर इसका लॉजिक बताती हूँ देर इज अक्ट कॉल्ड एज लिमिटेशन एक्ट अब जैसे सपोज करिए कोई जना मतलब मिल नहीं रहा है ओके सम पर्सन इज मिसिंग तो उसकी प्रॉपर्टी कैसे डिवॉल्व हो अब उसके रिश्तेदार तो कहेंगे या तो वो मरावा मिल जाए तो कम से कम हमें प्रॉपर्टी तो मिले और वो प्रॉपर्टी क्या ना वो यूज कर पा रहे ना वो कुछ कर पा रहे दैट्स व्हाई देयर वाज अ लिमिटेशन एक्ट कि एवरीथिंग नीड्स अ लिमिट सो दे हैव पुट इन अ लिमिट लाइक पेइंग अगर 7 साल तक नहीं मिल रहा तो मतलब गया काम से अब आप कहो मैडम एग्जैक्टली 7 साल के बाद रिश्तेदारों ने तो प्रॉपर्टी यूज और कर ली और वो एग्जैक्टली exactly आठवें साल पे आ गया अब क्या होगा ऐसा होता है क्यों नहीं होता पिक्चरों में ही नहीं रियलिटी में भी होता है देन थिंग्स नीड टू बी सीन व्हाई ही डिडेंट केम फॉर अ लो सो लॉन्ग पिक्चर में तो दिखा देते कोमा में था वो ये दिखा देते ना पिक्चरों में तो सोया पड़ा हुआ तो कैसा आता तो थिंग्स नीड टू बी सीन फॉर स्पेसिफिक एरिया की भाई क्या रीजन था क्या नहीं था और हाँ वो मेरे को वाला ध्यान आ गया वो बेसिकली यही था कि आप है ना वो लिमिटेशन एक्ट के अकॉर्डिंग अगर आप सात साल तक नहीं हो तो फिर आप नहीं हो फिर आप आप अपने आप को फिर आपको कागज में अपने आप को पैदा करना पड़ता है यू you नो know, आप नेचुरली तो पैदा हो नहीं सकते वापस तो हाउ यू हैव टू टेक रीबर्थ रीबर्थ इन द फॉर्म ऑफ पेपर वो वाला उसका सर्टिफिकेट का नाम भी होता है ना जो जीवन जीवन प्रमाण हाँ तो दैट इज द थिंग अगर आपको पता हो रिटायर्ड लोग भी हर साल अपनी हाँ। सैलरी के लिए जीवन प्रमाण देते रहते हैं क्योंकि बैंक का तो हमें क्या पता मरा हुआ वो बैंक में पैसा जाए जा रहा है जाए जा रहा है एक एक का थोड़ी ना फाइंड आउट कर सकते हैं तो उसके लिए करना पड़ता है ठीक है ओके मैम मैं मूवी में देख लूंगी पक्के से ठीक है लास्ट स्लाइड वेर इन द डोमिनेटिंग पार्टी इज बैड लाइक uh how is that uh, uh thing matlab can you explain that yeah okay why not sure aur main aapko vice versa bhi bataungi kabhi dad bhi galat ho sakte kabhi main bhi galat ho sakti hu things are see ab aajkal ki life aisi nahi hai ki apan aise nahi bolte acha father bhi aise ho sakte hai you know you know how kind of life we are living upon you know the things are you know on relations the trust is going day by day day by day so the point is suppose what my father have done the land was of rupees 1 uh, crore he sold me in rupees 1 crore 50 lakh and obviously i was a very lame and i was not knowing what is municipality rate what is this rate and what is that rate i also signed the thing mere ko it is papa papa mere se thodi zyada lenge but ho sakta hai na my father wants to you know deceive me up and like in the situation father would be on the responsible situation and now i am telling you the vice versa not every time father is a, is only on that situation suppose my father is 95 year old okay and i am just 35 so that can be a possibility na in this situation i can be dominating party because he is not able to see well he is not able to listen well what i did i just put his uh, thumb on the thumb pad and just have taken the impression in this situation seeing his age i will be regarded as a dominating party and he would be regarded as a normal party so it is all dependent on case to case right okay you are thinking in that way how can father do the wrong thing in that way you are thinking upon no 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 i was just uh, confirming uh, just because he is the father he is dominating is it uh, that or uh... yes it uh, tell me one thing अगर लेट आते हैं तो पापा आपसे पूछते हैं भाई लेट क्यों आए कहने से आया तो आया मेरी मर्जी नहीं ना no. और <laughs> अगर अपन पापा से पूछे पापा आप लेट क्यों आए आ गया पापा कह सकते हैं तो ऑब्वियसली इज अ डोमिनेटिंग पार्टी राइट ओके ओके अच्छा 
आपने पूछा मैम आप मैरिड हो गया मैंने कहा हाँ मैं बिल्कुल वेल मैरिड हूँ मैंने आपको अपना मैरिज सर्टिफिकेट दे दिया ओके आई शोड यू माई मैरिज सर्टिफिकेट आपने कहा नो नो मैम पता नहीं लग रहा ढंग से शो मी योर रिसेप्शन फोटोग्राफ आपने देख ली नो 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 मैम शो मी योर मेहंदी फोटोग्राफ वेर इज योर हल्दी फोटोग्राफ वेर इज योर संगीत फोटोग्राफ देन ओनली आई विल से यस नेया इज मैरिड वेल is it needed or my uh, that particular my marriage certificate is a confirmation marriage certificate marriage certificate marriage certificate yeah got my point if you will see the marriage certificate you can presume lot of things that is my conclusive evidences okay so now we are moving towards general law 2 just a minute please now i will tell you the ways uh where where we can earn money as a register valuer you know valuer bande hi sabse pehla point jo dimag mein aata hai kaam kahan se aayega aur kaam karna kya hai you know why we are taking so much of pain and gain we are, we need to do all the need, need to know all the things just a minute <coughs> aap logon ko to bahut sare bank bhi hire karte hain हम लोगों को बैंक हायर नहीं करता प्रॉब्लम ये क्यों व्हाई बिकॉज जो भी ये लोन्स होते हैं ना उस पर बेसिकली कोलेट्रल में प्रॉपर्टीज होती है बहुत कम लोग होते हैं जो शेयर को गिरवी रख के और लोन लेते हैं तो हमारा उसमें कम वो है आप लोगों का उसमें हैंड ज्यादा अच्छा है बेटर है क्या चीज क्या चीज रिटर्न रिटर्न में ही पूरा हो जाता है आपका तो अरे अब आपको क्या बताएं चलिए अभी नहीं तो लंबा हो जाएगा सेशन और आप लोगों का खाना लेट हो जाएगा ठीक है सो नाउ इन दिस वी विल बी सीइंग द स्पेसिफिक सेक्शंस रिलेटेड टू आरवी आई एम टेलिंग यू आफ्टर आरवी आपको लगेगा ये करूं वो करूं इधर जाऊं उधर जाऊं इसका भी काम कर लू उसका भी काम कर लू लेट सी किस किस का काम करना है अपने को यू ऑल नो दैट IBBI is our uh, registration authority. Under that comes the RBOs and the RBs. Okay. Yesterday we have seen that there are three asset classes. LNB. Ah, uh, Viral ji, you have something to ask. Thoda nee, mere se hand is raised. Okay. Then one is the SFA. That is uh, I have done in that. Then LNB, you are pursuing that and PNM, right? Plant and machinery. Thereafter, कहाँ पे जरूरत है valuation पे? देखिए वैल्यूएशन वही काम आता है जहां पे इट इज अंडेटरी ओके कोई रिकमेंडेटरी के लिए साइन के पैसे नहीं देगा जब लॉ ने कहा है मेरे को रिपोर्ट चाहिए ही चाहिए चाहे एक दो रुपए का ही डिफरेंस हो तो भी वैल्यूएर की रिपोर्ट इज अ मस्ट सो सी व्हाट आर द ट्रांजैक्शन दैट नीड रिपोर्ट ऑफ बेसिकली द वैल्यूअर्स इट कुड बी द एम एंड स्कीम्स इट कुड बी द इन्वेस्टमेंट इट कुड बी अ फंड रेजिंग it could be sale of businesses it could be the dispute resolutions and all what are the acts that are regulating it it could be the companies act it could be the income tax it could be the sebi rbi ibc and i am telling you very good work is in ibc you know good uh, amount of work is there if suppose there is a litigation on going on there also there can be court can order for a valuation thing in finance like this majorly go for we people that is sfa people like if somebody have to do the fair valuation as per the indian accounting standards or isops or the price uh, allocation or the impairment then also we, they need a valuation work now this is we the the person standing over is we कहा जाऊं इधर जाऊं उधर जाऊं स्टैट्यूटरी वर्क करूं इंसॉल्वेंसी में करूं या फेमा में करूं आईबीसी में करूं सेबी में करूं तो देखिए एवरीवेयर देयर इज वर्क यू नीड टू सी व्हाट काइंड ऑफ कनेक्ट्स यू यू हैव इफ यू विल से नेहा काम कहाँ से आएगा तो मैंने कल भी शायद बोला था काम खाली कनेक्ट से आएगा आपके प्रैक्टिस में काम कनेक्ट से ही आता है मैंने मेजरली आई आई माइट बी रॉन्ग आप लोगों का बैंकिंग सेक्टर में बहुत बोल बाला है व्हाट आई हैव सीन एम आई राइट मतलब आई वाज आई वाज यू नो देयर वाज अ इंसिडेंट समबडी आई आई वाज अकंपनीड बाय समबडी इन अ कार एंड जस्ट वी वर टॉकिंग ही वाज ऑफ यू नो हेड ऑफ सम रेप्यूटेटेड बैंक इन जयपुर 
So he asked me, uh, me, what, what do you have done? So I said, just recently only I've done my register value or course and this and all. So, okay. Are you a register valuer? I want to appoint someone. I need someone, someone's uh, legal consultancy on that. Man, go, okay, I can give that easily. So say, they say, are you a land and building valuer? Man, go, no, I am a SFA valuer. So I have seen majorly banks are uh, pushing a lot because you know, all the mortgages are majorly for properties only. Now let's see section 247, okay? First answer, such a simple question. This sort of question comes in the exam. What would be your answer? Simple question. Who appoints us? Board of Directors. Okay. What they are asking? Law me kya likha hai? Companies Act me kya likha hai? If you will read Companies Act, usme it has been clearly mentioned. It must be by audit committee of board. Ab me apko sabse maze ki baat bata. Maine aaj tak kam se kam 50-60 se to jada reports banai di hai. Not in a single valuation report. I have written that I have been appointed by audit committee. What line goes in my report? In absence of the audit committee uh, of the board, I have been appointed by board of directors of the company. I am telling you practical things that are written in law, I am telling you that are written in law, and what happens, I am telling you that are in law. If you have a question, you have to write in the audit committee. And practically, I have told you that. Now, if you look at the practical part, आप लास्ट लाइन देखिए जो मैंने अंडरलाइन कर रखी है सी द लास्ट लाइन व्हाट इट इज टेलिंग लॉ हैव टोल्ड दैट इट मस्ट बी अपॉइंटेड बाय द ऑडिट कमिटी और इन इट्स एब्सेंस बाय द बोर्ड ऑफ डायरेक्टर्स व्हाट दिस पॉइंट आई हैव अंडरलाइन सो इफ सम क्वेश्चन कम्स दैट कुडंट कंफ्यूज यू ओके आई टेल यू दिस रजिस्टर वैल्यूअर्स एंड वैल्यूएशन इट इज इन इट इज इन यू नो अ कंपनीज एक्ट ओके so companies act have different chapters. So I tell you the chapter number of uh, registered values is chapter number 17. Simple question coming on your way. To which chapter in the companies act does uh, register value belongs to? Option A, 1717. Option 2, numeral 17, SEV and TWEN. Option 3. Roman number 17. What would be your answer? Roman number 17. Bhavish ji, 1717 nahi It would be Roman number 17. Many persons do mistake in that. Majorly people go for 1717. Please remember it would be a Roman number 17. Now, what are our duties? Obviously, if I say 10 things that is less upon, the main duty is that whenever you are doing a valuation, do an independent, unbiased valuation. Your, bio, your valuation should not be biased at all. If we are doing any misrepresentation, remember that unintentional fraud. Galti se galti kar dete hai agar apan valuation mein. So, the amount is 25,000 to 1 lakh. Ab is mein bhi mein aapko badiya baat batati hu. EL mein, I always write a point that my reimbursement would be equal to my penalty. Agar mein ek client se 40,000 fees liya hai, to mein 40,000 ka hi bukhtaan karungi. Not more than that. You are getting my point, what I am trying to say, uh, you know? So you can do it. Caveat is uh, always refer to the, you know, rules of the government and go for caveats in that way only. Suppose if I'm doing an intentional fraud, then the penalties would be starting from 1 lakh to 5 lakh. And, uh, you know, imprisonment could be also there for up to one year. Then... Obviously, if you are wrong, convicted, you need to refund the remuneration. You have, uh, if you have, uh, you know, you have to pay to the damages to the person, whoever uh, 
uh, incurred losses because uh, of your report and the last point is uh, regarding that particular punishments only now we'll be seeing some specific sections related to rvs uh, how how we are doing the work in that see what happens suppose like we are governing majorly from the companies act so suppose there is any kind of compromise or arrangement with a creditor or the data or a, or a class of members. Now, what is a compromise or arrangement in a layman language? Suppose you are having a company. Okay. I am a, de I, I am a debt to you. Okay. Mene aapko paisa diya hai. Aapki company chalane ke liye. And for that, you have committed me to give me an interest of rupee uh, of uh, 12%. Okay. Later on, you are saying, no, 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 I am not going to give 12%. Uh, my, uh, you know, my health of business is not allowing me. So I'm only able to give you the interest of 10%. So if you want to make such change, then we have, we will come under the section of section 230. Now you got it. What is compromise and arrangement? Suppose I'm a preference shareholder. I take interest of uh, rupee uh, of interest of 7% from your company, but the company financial health is not that strong. So company is telling Neha, now we'll pay you 4% only. You cannot pay, you cannot do it easily. If you have to do it compromise, you have to have a meeting with me. And first I should ascend to that, then, then only this change could be done. Otherwise it is not an easy change at all. Then when whenever we are doing things like that we have to submit with the tribunal the list of these things we you need to you know submit your latest financial opposition your if you are reducing your share capital you have to give that and you are doing any cdr cdr is basically corporate debt structuring that is you are changing you know from 12 percent you are changing to 10 percent so you have to give each one of them <laughs> and important we have to, there is a must to give the valuation report by whom you and me. Okay. That company will be appointing you and me for having a valuation report that will be also accompanied uh, to be given it to the tribunal. Then suppose for that compromise or arrangement, there needs to be a meeting. So to whom the uh, notice should be given. It should be given to the all the members, all the debenture holders or all the creditors to whom they are related to. And with them, they also need to give the detail of the compromise or arrangement, what kind of compromise we are thinking upon and also our valuation report. Yes, it is a valuer report is mandated to be given along with the notice so that they can acknowledge by what kind of changes are uh, you know supposed to be done in the future. Then, what are the powers of tribunal? See, tribunal can supervise these changes in all. So, tribunal can make modifications in the in the scheme. Okay, they can change low or high. But if tribunal is thinking, if we do modification or if we not do modification, nothing is going to happen for this particular uh, you know arrangement. Then it can order for the wind up also. So the, this is all dependent upon the tribunal how he will do up the things and all. Then what are the documents uh, to be circulated for the meeting ordered by the tribunal? It is again, what is the draft proposal? It is uh, uh, whatever, you know, the uh, R report, that is the register value report needed to be given upon. Then suppose the tribunal is telling that it needed to have a winding up. So <clears throat> then such liquidator shall within 60 days from the order Submit tribunal a report containing the following. So the number one point is what are the assets of the company? What are the nature of the assets? And again, our valuation report. So these are the sectors where we, uh, you know, our work is there. Our work is a our work is a mandate here. So we'll definitely get work in these sections. And with that, they also have to tell what is our issued capital, what is subscribed, what are our contingency, how many debts uh, due to the company, uh, if we have given, if the company has given any guarantee to the third party, all needed to be told upon, what are the list of the contributories or uh, any details of intangible assets, 
or any holding subsidiary companies, legal cases filed by us or against us, all the bureau should be given with that. Now, then what happens in section 92? What it provides, suppose there is some transaction happening between company and its uh, creditor directors and uh, what is happening with it, you know, uh, like there is some acquisition of uh, assets for consideration other than the cash. Mother, that uh, the person is not giving the cash. He's taking equity on the basis of that assets. Then also it needs uh, required a register value report. It is also mandated by section 192. So here also we are having our work. Then banking regulation. In banking regulation, you just have section 5.9. They just speak about what is a secure loan and what is not a secure loan. So basically, the, uh, the loan which have been secured by a security is called a secured loan and which has not been secured by that, that is called an unsecured loan. Whenever after, uh, you know, doing your exam, exam, clearing your exam, see these sections. Where we get to work under these sections. So have a read for these sections. Right? These are the sections. Just a minute. So I tell you, uh, many people would be fraternity would be telling you Kamini, Kamini, but as a kuchbi ni. It is the people, uh, you know, it is we. We can do it wala hota. Just you need to have the good connects. Like I will just give you a very simple example. Suppose if you want to work for IBC cases. So definitely you want to have a, you need to have good licensing with the IPs, insolvency professionals. So it is a B, like practice needed to have connects. Then only the practice could be goodly established upon. Have you ever heard what is surfacey? Have you ever heard what is surfacey? Banking mein sabse jada ye term lagta hai. Surfacey laga do. Surfacey kar do. Achcha. Nahi suna. Koi baat nahi. Aaj sun lije. Kitti chije pehle tak nahi suni thi. Kitti chije sun li. Account ka debit credit sun liya. Kya kuch nahi suna aap mein. Thik hai. So the point is what is surfacey? As a layman I will tell you first. Then we will see the technical things as well. Yes, yes. Sh Shiv Jankar ji. Very true. NPA cases. What is a asset for a bank? Basically, if he have given loan to somebody, so basically that's an asset. He will uh, take the money later on. Okay. Suppose if that debtor is not giving money to the bank, what it would be for the bank? Non-performing asset. NPA, the asset which is not performing for the bank. So after 2002, bank have got a good thing that is surface -y. What helps in surface is, suppose if you have any secured asset, secured asset, that means the loan you have given, that's a secured loan. You can easily apply the surface. Let's have a touch base upon that. I will uh, point us, it is just for your last minute reading, okay? Uh, first, we, uh, we will go through PPT, then I will tell you how to use this pointers and all. Okay. Point to be noted. See, I have highlighted for you people only. You see any of the acts in our country, there is a one line written over there. This act applies to whole of India except Jammu and Kashmir. This, this particular act, Surfacey came in uh, year 2002 and it is the first act which have mentioned it extends to whole of India. There is no exception to JNK. And after that, you know, uh, 372, 371. Now, so all the acts are applicable to all the India, whole of the yeah. India. No and exception for J. Yes, sir, Raju sir. So, what are these for? Earlier, what was happening? Bank were lending money, okay? And as a protection, they were having uh, security from the datas. But what was happening when the datas were defaulted? It was not that very easy to. Uh, everybody, can you please mute yourself? That will help me and you as well. Since you are the co host, you can mute uh, someone. Ah, I'm doing that. I'm doing that only. Okay. So the point is. So when bank is having any secure debtor, he has him full right. Ki if he defaults, I will use his security and reimburse my payments and all. But the, uh, is it so simple? Not at all. 
see the real scenario how many you know dates you have to take in the courts thereafter you can you know touch their property money uh, cannot be realized so easily that's why in 2002 came upon the surface act it has really taken the process very easy so one point you need to remember it extends to whole of india next point just a minute okay suppose you are my debtor i am bank you are not paying to me so what i will do i will ask the borrower to discharge full liabilities within 60 days from the date of the notice okay like i have given you the notice you are my debtor suppose you are still not paying me you are failing uh, failing to pay so by the borrower the secured creditor gets full right as detailed in the act matlab i uh, through surface i am having full rights upon you then what will happen borrower if borrower is not paying as per notice within 60 days then bank can take the possession of the property the secured asset bank can take over the management of the secured asset bank can appoint any person to manage that secured asset these all are the rights with the bank and but the preconditions are the debt must be a secured so that means surface can only apply for the secured asset not for the unsecured one and second very important debt needed to be classified as an npa when a debt is uh, regarded as npa can anybody tell me what is the is, he is not clearing his liabilities or he is not yes. when the debtor is not clearing his liability against the bank so default should be of how many days anybody 2 years surface is very good and very current it is 90 days okay uh, if your default is more than 90 days your aging of your debt is more than 90 days then it turns to be a npa and third point required is that if the outstanding dues are 1 lakh and above and more than 20% of the principal loan and the interest due on then also you can apply the surface so these four are basically the all the points that needed to be done there only the surface can happen upon and yeah. important that if suppose i have taken a secured loan and as a collateral i have kept my agriculture land as a security then that cannot be we cannot do surface on the agriculture land that is a point to be noted somebody was saying something ma'am uh, ye uh, jo aap uh, npa ke liye 90 days zaruri hai but uh, the yes. case is uh, bankrupt hone mein company ko uh, bank shayad 90 days deta hai aisa kuch hota hai kya nahi 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 wo wo to 180 days hota hai ab dono ko kaise mila rahe ho Oh, we are talking about surface C, not IBC. IBC next topic है अपना. You are getting my point. What we are doing right now? We are doing the surface C. What happens in the surface C? Surface C is a, a facility given to the banks who have given the debts and not only the debts, secure debts. मैं bank हूँ. I have given a debt to you, and for that debt, you have kept a collateral with me, security with me. So what what kind of debt you have you have I have uh, against you secured debt. If you defaulted in paying me more than ninety days, I can take action upon your security. I can sell it, auction it, do it, whatever, whatever the money comes upon, I can satisfy my amounts. You know, after surface is a big revolution for the banks and all, but it is only for the secured asset. Suppose your one is the unsecured asset, then the things would be you know. Lot, lot it will take a longer time not like a secured one so uh, uh, any anything you want to ask regarding that uh, what you were thinking in mind na that was ibc insolvency bankruptcy code that is the next topic we are uh, touching upon okay yeah. and th that is 180 days not 90 days okay moratorium is for 180 days so i am uh, i am a company and i am an npa for a bank and i'm For a company, you okay. are a NPA for a bank. Okay. Okay. So I'm saying that I'm being bankrupt. Okay. So, uh, yeah, then I have to dissolve. It will take a little time. Hmm. But he wants to auction in 92 days. Who wants to auction? 
कौन ऑक्शन करना चाहता है नाइनटी टू डेज में ही बैंक बैंक ऑक्शन करना चाहता है तो सी इसमें क्या क्या पॉइंट होगा पहली बार If you are under IBC का CIRP, I hope you know what is CIRP, Corporate Insolvency Resolution Process, or you are under liquidation. आप तो वन एटी डेज का मोरोटोरियम लग जाता है दैट इज अ टर्मानेंट सॉरी यू नो टेम्पररी यू नो एवरी थिंग स्टॉप एंड एट द टाइम ऑफ मोरिटोरियम बैंक के नॉट अप्लाई सरफेसी सब कुछ रुक जाता है सिर्फ एक सौ अस्सी दे डे वो सीआरपी की प्रोसीडिंग्स चलेगी नॉट एल्स देन दैट मोरिटोरियम का मतलब ही ये होता है एक टेम्पररी यू नो सस्पेंशन हो जाता है राइट सो विल टॉक मोर वेन विल टच बेस द आईबीसी राइट अच्छा नाउ इंटरेस्टिंग पॉइंट सी द सेकेंड पॉइंट थर्ड पॉइंट वर्ड इट इज टेलिंग द आउटस्टैंडिंग आउट ड्यू आउटस्टैंडिंग ड्यूज आर वन लैक एंड more than 20% of the principal loan and interest now i give you a st- case study suppose the unpaid amount is uh, rupees 80000 okay and the principal loan is rupees 4 lakh can it be termed as a, a surface ke liye theek hai ye 4 lakh ka loan tha aapne 80000 pay nahi kiya no, Can I do surfacey? Bhavesh ji, why not? 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 Why But it is less than one lakh, so we cannot apply the surface fee. So you have to see both of the things. It should be minimum one lakh or one lakh plus twenty percent of that. Okay, that both the things should be seen simultaneously. So please see that thing properly in the examination. Now, how the sale proceeds will be appropriated whenever the asset, uh, the security would be sold. Obviously, first it would be uh, towards the charges, cost, expenses incidental towards the preservation or protection of the assets. Okay, then, then whatever the money comes upon that needed to be given to the secured creditor. Then whatever surplus, we say normally, sachi bataun, kabi surplus bachta nahi hai. But if it is written in the law, if there is surplus, then it would be paid to the entitled person. That whatever the rights and interests, we need to see that that then it will be paid to that. So a secured creditor is standing on second. First, uh, it would be paid the incidental charges. Then who is a borrower? Borrower means a person who have been granted. Uh, you know finance uh, assistance by the bank or who has given any guarantee suppose i have given any guarantee for your debt okay and you are not able to pay the debt then i the surety will be also counted in the field of uh, borrower only and then suppose if i have created any mortgage or uh, hypothecation or pledge or uh, as security for the finance assistance then also i will be regarded as a borrower only or if i have uh, you know become a borrower by the surface company then also i will be regarded as a borrower only so it is very easy to say mortgage hypothecation or pledge can somebody tell me the difference between the three of them ek hi thali ke chatte patte bolte na apan jaise orange lemon ek hi family ke hai ye but can you give me the exact uh, you know thin line of differences between three of them ownership Mortgage, difference na? hypothecation and pledge what is the uh, you know difference between three of them i mean mortgage ownership remains at the owner like uh, if i am owning anything it will remain at my ownership but it will be given to someone later on in any case he can change the ownership and he can change the action in case of hypothecation ownership will remain at the bank end i am using that particular thing but the ownership at the bank end like if i am having any bike i am riding the bike but the ownership at the is at the uh, bank end this is my understanding and yeah. pledge i don't know now mortgage 
mortgage is for the immovable properties okay we uh, we mortgage on the immovable properties so it has gone okay now what about hypothetication and pledge it is for the movable properties how what is pledge mere ko aapse paisa chahiye tha apni sone ki chain aapke haath mein de di ye lo meri sone ki chain mujhe aap 1 lakh rupaye de do so what we did is the pledge maine apni chain ko girvi rakha theek hai ab pledge ho gaya aur apna mortgage ho gaya hypothetical you know it is basically called as a constructive delivery how i again need to have loan from you but i don't have any gold chain so what i did i am giving you a constructive delivery of my shares share mein aapke haath mein nahi dungi share to mere usme hi rahenge mere wale kya bolte hain dmat mein hi rahenge but main paper mein likh dungi ki whatever the loan i am taking that is against these securities so i am not giving you a physical delivery i am giving you a constructive delivery okay so mortgage immovable property maine apni zameen girvi rakh di zameen thode na aapko laake de deti hu nahi immovable property hoti hai us pe apne mortgage kar li pledge main aapko physical delivery deti hu lijiye meri chain and give me the money and hypothetication रियल डिलीवरी नहीं होती है कंस्ट्रक्टिव डिलीवरी होती है डिलीवरी इज नॉट ऑन फिजिकल बेसिस इट इज ऑन द पेपर बेसिस और ऑन द कंस्ट्रक्टिव बेसिस दैट इज बेसिकली द डिफरेंस बिटवीन द थ्री नॉन परफॉर्मिंग so the hypo there is a board on the factory uh, compound wall so this property is hypothecated to so and so bank you are saying that it is only for uh, mobile property but, see uh, the point is like in that also like we uh, sometimes like uh, my husband is also bank lawyer only so he also says that you know this word mortgage mortgage is what in hindi it is girvi कोई चीज को आप गिरवी रख रहे हो तो लैंड को आप उसको वो जो आप प्रॉपर्टी बोल रहे हो आप उसको मॉडगेज भी बोल सकते हो उसको हाइपोथेटिकेट यू आर नॉट गिविंग द यू नो फिजिकल डिलीवरी ऑफ द थिंग्स यू आर जस्ट गिविंग अ कंस्ट्रक्टिव वन यू आर नॉट नेमिंग द प्रॉपर्टी इन हिज नेम लाइक माय प्रॉपर्टी इज वर्थ ऑफ अ करोड़ एंड लोन इज जस्ट ऑफ टेन लैख रुपीज सो आई वोट बी गिविंग द टोटल प्रॉपर्टी टूवर्ड्स दैट आई वुड बी मॉडगेजिंग अ पार्ट ऑफ प्रॉपर्टी right suppose you are taking on total property of yours then you will be hypothecating it getting my not, point not you are all, the generally, total property yes uh, simple example i am constructing a rice mill so i will invest some money and bank gives some amount for that then uh, yes. was, then it is under hypothecation only yes please yes please come again no i i am constructing a rice mill for example Paddy you are constructing a a rice mill rice mill I, rice mill. Rice mill. Rice mill is okay. 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 Uh, for which I am taking some loan from the bank. Okay, I am investing some money, and bank is giving loan, and they say that it is under hypothecation only. So that means you have given the total right of the property to the bank. But in mortgage, we never give the total property to the bank. We give a specific portion of the property. That is the major difference. in my mortgage is not a total giving of the property just a specific part of the property we mortgage upon not the total yes. property right i you, you are saying hypothecation is for mobile property not no, no, no. no 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 movable yes it is for movable also or immovable also both, but both. there is just a constructive delivery आप भाई हाथ से तो डिलीवर कर नहीं सकते जैसे इफ आई हैव टू टेक लोन अगेंस्ट माय शेयर्स सो आई विल जस्ट डू द हाइपोथेटिकेशन ऑफ माय शेयर्स because i can't give them a physical delivery and what you were saying na sir wo total wo rice mill ka jo aap total ke naam pe uh, you are taking the money then you will hypothecate your total property with the bank that would be the thing right now next is non performing asset as we all know the asset which is not performing is called as the non performing and remember the days of 90 days okay that is the aging of the asset 
property it could be any movable movable it could be any depth it could be any receivables it could be any intangibles point to be noted it cannot be the agriculture property that is very important now what is a secured asset the asset which have been secured by a security is called a secured asset and who is a secured creditor who gives loan for a you know who gives loan uh, in, in uh, for by taking some collateral that is basically a secured creditor who is a which is a secured debt the debt which is secured by any security interest and what is a security interest it is basically any right any title interest of any kind which is created in favor of the secured creditor is called as the secured interest now this is important note this point suppose i the borrower i am finding ki bank is doing surface on me and uh, bank is doing wrong thing on me i want to appeal for that so how many uh, days i get if i have to apply to the drt i have to i got uh, you know 45 days within which i can appeal towards the drt and if i, I have to appeal to drat that is the higher authority drat appellate tribunal then i receive 30 days it is first time in the law that the drt is getting more days as compared to the appellate tribunal i have highlighted in uh, in red because i expect a question in the examination so appeal needed to be made in 45 days in drt and 30 days in case of drat and what is drt and drat debt recovery tribunal drat debt recovery appellate tribunal now i will ask you one question suppose i have to give a loan to a company okay can i check how many charges are existing on the company still going can i check that can i check that yes yes through roc i can check it very easily right i just have to pay a minimum fees and i can check that very easily can i check any charges on individual don't tell me civil no no ma'am no so say it yes now it is sir sai now what is sarsai sarsai is basically central registry of securitization asset how it happens see suppose if uh, if navin ji came to me he i am a bank and he came to me neha i want to take a loan from you maine kaha okay take the loan and i have just uh, you know i have just approved his loan as soon as i approve his loan i need to enter it in sarsai that is not the responsibility of the borrower that is the responsibility of the lender okay i need to write that navin ji this particular loan loan going upon this so whenever you have to you know like uh, if you go in the another bank navin ji if you are going to icici bank icici bank will open the sarsai and he will see that how many charges is applicable on you and suppose i am hdfc bank so they can see that already a loan of this rupees is going on hdfc bank also so it you know this is a very important thing and bank is doing uh, you know regularly it is a mandate and days are like you know like uh, today i have approved i have to enter your name within 30 days if i miss to enter your name in 13 day 30 days then i get additional 30 days to enter your name in the sarsai it is basically a register for individual purposes and all so that you know there cannot be fraud activity things like that now for your exam purpose how you will prepare for your exam on the last time when you are going for your exam you will just open this that is basically tell me a uh, uh, bank to give a time limit of how many days 90 days uh, remember uh, he need to give a time limit of days to borrower to pay the entire loan 60 days exactly 60 days is for converting into a npa okay then Does account needs to be NPA or we can do surface or normal account also on NPA only. On NPA only. Exactly, bingo. Minimum amount due. 
one lakh or one lakh or twenty percent. Twenty percent. Exactly. Forty-five and thirty for DRT and thirty days for DRAT. Super, super. Companies registered and. Act applicable to remember. I have just highlighted the line whole of India. Okay. Okay. This question uh, came uh, in one of my participant examination. This particular surface and IBC is common with us also. You know, these two are common with us also. The act is applicable to whole of India. Now, see this particular point section 17A. What it is all about. See, as I told you that this act is applicable to Jammu and Kashmir also. Okay. In Jammu and Kashmir, there is no DRT. There is no drag. Now, how will they, uh, how the grief will appeal to appeal at where they will appeal at. I'm telling in Jammu Kashmir, there is no DRT or drag. So, where they will appeal at. Delhi में करवा दूँ हाँ I could Delhi ना 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 I could so if any city is not having DRT so हर city के पास एक district court तो होता ही है every city has a district court so they will apply to the district court and if the city is not having a DRAT then the Jammu Kashmir people will apply for DRAT things to the high court DRT the lower court is it so we will apply to the district court and for the drag thing we will apply to the high court can all properties uh, be enforced except agricultural land all can be enforced super super so ye to answer isi ke andar likha hua hai search sahi charges within how many days 30 within 30 days you need to enter the uh, name of the person and if you forget to enter the name then you get additional 30 days so that is a calculation of 30 plus 30 right so you know when you are going for the exam you don't have much time to see each and everything if you will see these pointers you are done with this ppt okay so now i'm uh, going towards the last ppt of the day means my day because uh, after that another faculty would be looking for you now can anybody tell me why was ibc needed in india there was no regulation of these uh, value uh, valuation and all just that please come there, again there was no regulatory body or there were no regulations matlab jiska jaisa man kiya waisa kaam chal raha tha pehle acha ये बात है क्या? But आपको पता है who is the main hero behind IBC? रमन जी आप बताइए कौन है main hero IBC के पीछे? मालिया जी? Yes, मालिया जी ही है exactly. Okay. ये बात लगा कि भाई उन्होंने तो पूरा झटका दे दे कि कितने जने bye bye Tata कर गए थे India को छोड़के. See the position. Of India before IBC. Yes, it was year 2016 when the IBC came upon. See how much time we need to take to resolve insolvency. We were the highest than the Pakistan, Brazil, South Africa, see UK. How well they take the things. They can resolve the insolvency within a year. Kete na jada strictness bhi kabi kabi bhot achyoti kabi kabi bhot karaboti hai. So if you see, UK is somewhere very strict upon. So and we were on 4.3. And if you will see, are resolving in. Uh, sorry. <coughs> He were, uh, we were on the 136th rank and in global recovery rate, we were on, uh, see how much, 25. Mala, if we had 100 loan, we would have to take 25 rupees in that way. But after this, insolvency bankruptcy code, there was a big revolution in the country, you know, lot many things were resolved upon. Now, corporate resolvency in India, First, 1956 was there, Companies Act. Thereafter, SICA was there. Thereafter, RDTBF was there. Thereafter, came upon the surface. 
there upon came upon the uh, companies act 2013 and now the hero came upon that is the ibc after ibc many uh, become redundant like now we don't use sika now we don't use rddb we spe specifically go towards the ibc that's a straight gate and like uh, see ibc is for corporate insolvency for individual response uh, insolvency we are having this these particular acts now can you tell me why it is a code not a act why it is not a insolvency bankruptcy act why it is a code can anybody tell me these are standard practices which are to be followed these are not enforceable by law i think aisa kuch act matlab these are not enforceable by law how can that be possible sorry 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 they have to be enforceable by law but okay not act okay anybody else see code is a supremo you know acts are not supreme if you see for uh, you know criminal things civil things what we are having we are having codes we are not having any act crpc criminal procedure code cpc civil procedure code so that's why we have to bring a revolution in the insolvency uh, uh, space so that's why we bought a pro, uh, code because code can override the acts but act cannot override the code and you know whatever the laws were there for insolvency it is basically a consolidation of the same so code is the supremo that's why it came in that faces also now as this one person was equal to every one of them now thereafter there was you know it is like single law for ibc not one have to go for sika rddb things like that a person just have to go directly to the ibc and his matter will be solved upon then now what are the characters to uh, characters of uh, this basically code number 1 corporate debtor now who is a corporate debtor basically the company who has taken any you know money from us that becomes a corporate debtor like i think uh, vikas ji was telling na a company ne loan liya hai wo loan nahi de raha so that become a corporate debtor only now who is a financed uh, creditor finance creditor is a person who gives the money for running the company okay so that comes you know if i have to run a company i need a finance so whoever gives me the finance to run the company that is called as a finance creditor then it comes the operational creditors like i do not only need finance to run my company i also need creditors who give me money for uh, you know have a uh, for uh, letting me do the normal operations like uh, i need to purchase something so for that somebody if gives me you know uh, the goods on credit that uh, that person would be called as the operational creditors irp that is interim resolution professional whenever any matter is gone in ibc a crp matter is there so they just uh, you know either the corporate debtor or whoever is the applicant or the authority can appoint irp for resolving the insolvency matters then there comes the resolution professional they both are the same what is the only difference is that resolution professional is been confirmed by the coc suppose there is a irp in our case and he is charging 1 lakh rupees coc that is the committee of creditors is telling no he is too expensive we are uh, appointing our rp that is a resolution professional he is just charging 50000 so that is basically the rp that's a uh, short form whenever you are coming in the practice you would be calling them in short names like cd fc oc irp rp coc committee of creditors it is basically the committee of the creditors basically it is form of you know the finance creditors this we will discuss in the coming slide then related party that is related to the company they could be the directors and all that are the related parties then icd it is called as the insolvency commencement date suppose under ibc 
12th July has been regarded as the insolvency commencement date. So that would be the, you know, the signature date on which that particular companies uh, into the, you know, resolve uh, insolvency processes and all. Then uh, I think Vikas ji have asked me about that 90 days. So Vikas ji, it is the moratorium. Moratorium is what? Temporary suspension of the activities. That means in this time, if a moratorium is given to a corporate debtor, it is normally of 180, to 180 days. In this time, there is separate, uh, temporary suspension to all the activities. Means they cannot sue anybody. Nobody can sue them up 180 days. They will only think about their, uh, you know, resolution for getting out of insolvency and all. And just a point to be noted is that 180 is the normal days given. Suppose you are not able to resolve the process, then you get 90 days extra. So 270 is the upper limit. 90 days also you will get if there is any, uh, you know, base uh, for that. You cannot take uh, 90 days just you want that. There should be base for taking that days. Resolution plan. When it company Then we need to make some, you know, escape plan. How can we escape this insolvency? That is basically the resolution plan. Liquidation. Iska kuch nahi ho sakta. Isko, uh, basically, I tell you the thing is that resolution plan is like a invent ventilator is there where you know the paying upon ki abhi ji jayega, ji jayega. So that is basically a resolution plan. But if the doctor feels no, this patient cannot be cured at all. It needed to be liquidated. Iska kuch upaya nahi hai. Isko to aap band kariye, liquidate kariye. That is basically a liquidation. To liquidate your assets. Payment order we will see in the coming slide. Appellate authority we will be also seeing the same in the coming slide. Ma'am, IRP and RP bata dijiye ek please. Haan, haan, zaroor se. Main IRP. देखिए जब ये वाला प्रोसेस स्टार्ट होता है सीआरपी की प्रोसीडिंग स्टार्ट होती है तो एप्लीकेंट या अथॉरिटी ये अपॉइंट करते हैं कि भाई दीस ये बेसिकली आईपी होते हैं इंसॉल्वेंसी प्रोफेशनल्स होते हैं जैसे आरवी का एग्जाम होता है वैसे आईपी का भी एक अलग से एग्जाम होता है ठीक है तो जो भी ये एग्जाम क्लियर करते हैं जो भी आईपीस प्रैक्टिसिंग आईपीस होते हैं उनको है ना कोई से भी रैंडमली किसी को भी सिलेक्ट कर सकते हैं भाई ही विल बी माय आईआरपी to resolve this all insolvency process and all. But this will be my new one. Okay. Now what happens now? What is RP? IRP suppose कर लीजिए अभी जो market में चल रहा है कह रहे हैं कि minimum IP को IP को at least डेढ़ लाख रुपए मिलना चाहिए महीना. If he is doing any insolvency case. अब by the way मैं आ गई मैं कह रही हूँ नहीं भाई बहुत ज़्यादा दे रहे हो इसको तो दो लाख रुपए दे रहे हो I am not agreeing मैं committee of creditors it is the last when committee of creditors if they appoint anybody else तो वो जो anybody else होता है वो RP होता है that is resolution professional ये वाला point है ना अभी एक slide और आ रहा है मैं आपको उसमें और better समझाऊँगी फिर भी नहीं आया समझ में you do ask me okay remember that point now who is the insolvency date और बता दीजिए एक बार ICD insolvency commencement date आपका दिवालियापन चालू होने की date मतलब आपने apply की authority को आपने NCLT के पास गए that C by yes Raju sir I could not understand Hindi please kindly shift to Hindi don't shift to Hindi please give your answer in English there is a question to explain in English Okay, 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 sir, for sure, sir. Sorry for that. I am okay, from sir. Andhra Pradesh. I am from Andhra Pradesh. I could not understand okay, Hindi. Okay, so sorry, sir. Many times we are going in Hindi. Right. Okay, okay, okay. Now not a single word would be coming from Hindi. Only English. Okay, sir. So what is a corporate person? Corporate person could be the company. Okay, I remember your ICD date also. So two things are pending from your part. Okay. Who is a corporate person? He can be a company, he can be a limited uh, partnership, limited liability partnership or any person incorporated with a limited liability. The three of them come under the same connotations only. Then that point, what I told you that I will be telling you in the coming uh, slide. Who are the adjudicating authorities? 
it is basically for corporate persons the adjudicating authorities are the nclt and nclat what are lat they are basically the appellant tribunals okay and for individuals that is the drt and the drats now now who can give application to say that i want to be under the insolvency thing i am now about to insolvent and uh, resolve me or liquidate me for what is the minimum benchmark if you want to go for a corporate insolvency resolution it is only possible when there is a default of minimum 1 crore rupees yes earlier when the act was made it was rupees 1 lakh only but it has been amended to rupees 1 crore so if you have to go for crp you need to have a default of rupees 1 crore thereafter this amount can be increased by a central government by the notifications now what is the process how the thing starts upon you know this can be applied by fc fc i am telling for the finance creditor or by the operational creditor that is oc or the corporate debtor cd the three of them any of them can go to the nclt and say see i am not in a position kindly in so i am into the insolvency phase so kindly resolve me up so it is all dependent upon nclt you know it is all on the nclt whether he will say that you are you need to have a crp process or not now you were asking me icd am i right akashi your point has came over here i have applied to the nclt for uh, getting me into crp process within 14 days nclt either have to admit my application or reject my application okay suppose if uh, nclt admitted my application and the date of admission of the application is say 1st july so 1st july is the date of icd that means my insolvency commencement date it has been started you know that's day from this date the 180 days number have started upon and the nclt have to appoint the irp either you give the name of the irp in the you know the applicants can give the name of the irp uh, if you have not given the name of the irp then who will appoint them it is basically the nclt okay so within 10 days they have to appoint the irp who will solve the total processes and all then after that within 30 days of appointment of irp there is a need of appointment of coc that is committee of creditors because see they are the lenders na they need the money out of the the corporate debtor so their committee needs to be made upon now who should be uh, now uh, you know whenever the committee is made upon within 7 days of committee making there needs to be a first meeting of coc then coc may replace uh, you know it is the will of the coc that coc says i don't want to keep this irp more we want to you know eradicate him they can you know eradicate the irp and they can appoint some another person as a rp then they have to prepare a memorandum of information and thereafter the coc needs to give the plan that how can we escape this this insolvency then that resolution plan of coc must be sanctioned by 66% of coc members if only 65% have uh, only sanctioned then there is no resolution plan and after the sanction this plan must be submitted to the uh, you know res, uh, to the adjudicating authorities like for a uh, corporate person it is basically the anclat or nclt then it is the nclt whether it may approve it or it may reject it it is its will suppose resolution plan has been approved by committee then nclt approves the plan or if nclt rejects the plan 
then the company will directly go into the liquidation or resolution plan have been rejected by the coc only then also in this case also there will be liquidation of the company there is no resolution process then now how the uh, uh, your both of the queries have been uh, cleared out one was icd and another one was what irp i am mm. then when no plan is there then also there is liquidation when plan is there but plan is rejected then also there is a liquidation what is liquidation number one like you are liquidating your assets in this also our register value report uh, is needed sir have you done any ibc case till now raju sir have no. you done any no no okay so in ibc when we have gone into liquidation what will happen that's you know we will be realizing the assets and whatever the money we would be receiving we will be receive uh, we will be distributing the money in this particular priority okay and good part is that you know if you see the slide government is standing on fifth point and we people that is the in the you know irp people and register valuer people we are standing on the first means we will be getting payment first other than other creditors then after us they will be getting payment they will be giving payment to the secured creditors in pro rata basis to the workmen fees then the work then rest of the workmen dues and employee dues then they will be giving money to the financial debts to the unsecured uh, creditors then thereafter comes the government dues with the unsecured uh, creditors then at the last uh, last three was the operational uh, dues and all and the last on the things are the equity shareholders and the preference shareholders they are the least in the priority then uh, whenever you will be doing the ibc case you have to see what is a fair value what is a liquidation value now what is a fair value fair value is between is the basically the value that is between the two parties a willing buyer and a willing seller is you know uh, like is willingly they are exchanging the goods on that particular value it is basically the fair value and what is the liquidated value it is basically the estimated realizable value of the asset like i am having a car okay if i see if the if there are willing buyers and sellers it must be at least of a fair value of 10 lakh but if i see its liquidation value if i go and sell it readily in the market it is of 8 lakh only so in liquidation you need to see both of them what is the fair value and what is the liquid value uh, liquidation value of the assets because you know sometimes things look and seem good and seem but when we convert it in, into money it is not that exact fair value only now who are the members of committee of creditors number 1 normally okay normally coc are only of finance creditor finance creditors are always on priority why because they are the creditors who have given finance to run the company to have a finance so that they can you know run their company well and why not the uh, operational creditors because they have just given money for the operations not for running the main company so but suppose if we are not having any finance creditor in the company then the coc would be comprising of 18 operational creditors by their value largest in that and one representative of workman and one representative of employee so in total there will be 20 uh, people if there is no fc in the company and uh, you know they need to held their meeting uh, within 7 days of forming of their uh, coc then whenever it is uh, there so at least the you know quorum should be of 33% of the voting rights and minutes should be circulated for uh, within 48 hours and see fees of irp is always fixed by applicant why because he was appointed by applicant or the adjudicating authority fees of rp because rp is always been by the coc so if you are substituting rp for irp 
then it fees will be fixed by the COC only. Okay, now here is our work that is register valuer shall within seven days of the appointment of you know this IRP needs to he needs to appoint two from SFA asset class, two from LN building, two from PNM class. They need to appoint us because their uh, you know our valuation is main uh, in this particular cases. And see, suppose like for SFA, they have uh, appointed two valuers. Suppose one valuer is giving a value of 40 rupees and another valuer is giving a value of rupees 200. So that means their valuation is north and uh, south, okay, at extremes. In that situation only, they will take the, they will appoint the third valuer, otherwise they don't. And I will tell you a recent amendment that has been made. There will be third valuer appointment only when the differences between two of the valuer is more than 25%. It is just a two day before amendment in the IBBI, okay, for 25%. So now we are done with IBC. Now uh, I want this 10 minutes time so that we can talk good related to examination. First you tell your query, then I will uh, start an examination discussion with you. What are the tips and tricks to clear this exam? First you tell me your points, then I will come to that. Any queries? So now I want your, uh, you know, uh, your videos to be on upon because now I want to see you people so that I can see your reactions and all. Okay, yes, thank you so much. Now, a simple straight funda. These uh, our trainings are for what? For clearing this particular exam? Just a minute. So, whenever I end my session, I always ask one question to each and every session people that what is your distance between completion of your training, that is receiving your training certificate and going to the examination center? Have I discussed any examination related things to you people? No. So give me the distance between the two. Your training certificate and your examination date. 30 days. 15 days. Okay. What about other? Seven, Seven days. Okay. So it is really important question to pass this examination. Raju sir uh, will disruption. definitely uh, agree with me. sir. Uh, in your uh, earlier examination, how much time you took to give your exams? Yes, I never appeared. So I you, haven't appeared. You have? I, I haven't appeared for any examination. So you have cleared your uh, LNB examination, no? No, no. Okay, you have not cleared. Not cleared. Okay, okay, okay. I was in the notion that you have cleared your LNB and PNM. That's why I was asking, have you done any IBC case no, or no, not? No, no, no. Okay, 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 okay. So, point to be noted. I will no, not do it. Civil 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 wale. Come again? Come again? Uh, civil people can do these uh, uh, two things also. Security civil state. Means? I didn't get the point. I'm a civil engineer. Can I do uh, land, uh, other than land and middling? No, there is a requisite of uh, qualifications that you need. If you want to be in a CFA, you uh, sorry for SFA, you need to be a CA, CA, CMA, or uh, MBA with a finance, something like that. Then only you can uh, go for that. Okay, ma'am. Right? Okay. So the point is, sorry, sorry, sir, Raju sir, I uh, no, no, misunderstood no, no. you. Actually, day before I was taking session in another one. There was a person who have done an LNB and PN. So I was, okay. uh, he That's resembles you okay. a lot. Okay. Uh, there is a person who have done uh, in LNB, in SFA, and now he's uh, in LNB and PNM, and now he's uh, doing for SFA. So, first listen that. I am not going to give you a day time, week time, or a month time. Only four letters. ASAP. I'm telling you, if you want to really clear this exam, give the exam as soon as possible because this is the only way to clear the exam. There is no shortcut in this. You know, if you think 
if you are a person like that no no neha i always first study the total uh, course then only i am going to go to the examination center so a very clear point point from my side if you are like that then sit for a year you are not able to complete your syllabus see the volume of the syllabus it is not less than 4 to 5 pages so it is like that complete the thing and go for the examination center that is only the way to clear this examination now another question to you people how much marks you want to score in the examination very simple question more than 60 more than 60 that's a nice answer okay bhavesh ji saying 60 to 65 good enough okay minimum 60 Yes, please. Minimum sixty. Okay, so that means no territory student is sitting among us. No okay. one is. <laughs> just a minute. Okay. Am I audible? I am not able to. Yes, yes. You are audible. You are audible. Okay. 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 Now your videos are there. So that means there are no uh, meritorious student with us for eighty, ninety, yes. something like that. <laughs> yes. All are like me only. Okay, okay that's good. so so the point is see you get 80 you get 90 you get any uh, marks you will get the same payment from client client is not paying you higher if you get higher marks okay he will not say okay you got 90 i will pay you 10000 extra no client is going to do the same so it is the thing we just need to pass the examination we don't have to bring any sort of merit in that okay and important thing is that uh just a minute what ashish ji is saying important thing we are bank benches i am also the same ashish ji i am also one of them so the point is i will never say you ki get exact 60 why you just listen to me what happened as i to i hope i have told you that i have cleared this particular examination in my third attempt in first one i got uh, 55 marks in first attempt second attempt was here my second attempt marks very carefully that was 59.5 marks yes i got failed by half a mark and my third exam was not a simple exam i was very strategical in my third exam you know like i was not taking it as a exam now like that half marks didn't let me sleep for so many days so i made a strategy i have changed my strategy earlier i only used to think i have to get 60 i have to get 60 then i kept my margin in my third attempt i kept margin as 70 marks you know if we aim to the star at least we will land to the moon so i aimed for 70 and and i landed with a 65.5 marks because in our examination this uh, negative marking is the biggest villain in our way so we have to you know have a tight hold of that particular thing so please be very aware about the negative marking it really ruins our uh, you know a result like anything so uh, so this is the only way by which you just i am telling you the only way to clear this exam is to go and give the exam and for you the countdown has begun uh it's only 2 months left now the september is approaching and we have to clear before that because the amendment of cooling period of 2 months is a too much you know it will really uh, uh, i i don't say that if you take too much time you cannot clear the exam you can clear the exam but after taking too much time it become a challenge to clear this particular exam so take as less as time and just go and give the exam right any particular question regarding the topic regarding the exam you want to ask me ma'am how many number of questions and how much uh, negative marking is that for each question okay negative marking is uh, 25% like if a question is of one marks and i attempted it wrong it would be minus 14 right okay okay and if you are talking about how many questions are there like from 1st july only the syllabus have changed as you know major syllabus is not changed the marks weightages are changed 
तो प्रायरली देर वर एटी थ्री क्वेश्चन आउट ऑफ विच एटी वर ऑफ वन मार्क्स एंड थ्री क्वेश्चन वर ऑफ ट्वेंटी मार्क्स ओके थ्री क्वेश्चन वर द केस स्टडीज बट एज यू नो नाउ द केस स्टडी वेटेज हैज बीन इंक्रीज फ्रॉम ट्वेंटी टू ट्वेंटी सिक्स ओके सो आई 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 एम नॉट अवेयर ऑफ द वॉट इज द लेटेस्ट आई एव नॉट टॉक टू माई पार्टिसिपेंट दैट वॉट रियली द एग्जाम इज कमिंग इन द वे लाइक सो द कमिंग फैकल्टीज लाइक यू नो दैट प्रैक्टिकल केस स्टडी फैकल्टीज वुड टेल यू बेटर दैट हाउ मेनी केस स्टडी हाउ मेनी क्वेश्चन आर कमिंग ऑफ केस स्टडीज एंड एग्जामिनेशन इज ऑफ टू आवर्स एंड आई एम टेलिंग यू टू आवर्स इज सेल्फ सफिशियंट आई वॉज नेवर आउट ऑफ द टाइम इन माई थ्री अटेम्प्ट Two hours is more than sufficient. But one point I want to add is that in my third attempt, because I was doing a strategical base exam, the third one. So what I did in my first hour, I just solved all my you know that uh, theoretical questions. And in my next hour, I, I took up the practical questions because you know practical questions though they are in uh, three or four in number, but they consume lot of time. so uh, you know in second uh, attempt that uh, that mistake happened with me i first tackled the practical questions thereafter i tackled the theoretical so i was having a lot of pressure in my second attempt so please uh, i tell i am telling you it is really very tricky but you can decode the trick you know and many participants ask me whether i can leave the question yes definitely you can in my last attempt which i passed i left 70 i left 28 questions because i was not knowing the answer so it is very normal to leave the questions you just need to see your you know how much you are assured that this question is 100% right that you need to maintain the list that is the thing any other question yes please i mean is there any limit to give the exam or like just after the finishing of the course we can give the exam or the number of attempts we can have is it like so see it is uh, basically uh, when we are uh, uh, you know giving fees for examination it's a revenue to them so they say they they say that give n number of attempts it doesn't matter to them but what Your is the your voice problem? are not coming now it is also not coming no coming okay. it's add to us <laughs> okay to see there is no restraint on number of the attempts but yes after september there will be you know frequency restraint is there like right. if you have given the uh, attempt today then you can attempt for the next examination after two months to two months is too much you know right. like you know like till the uh, september 6 before that you can give two attempts in a day nobody is going to stop you but i am telling you lot more uh, you know slots will be booking up because the persons who have already taken the training they are not able to you know clear the exam so they are also having the pressure to everybody is now having a pressure to clear before the september so that we be free from this uh, cooling period things and all so i am just telling you do not study uh, do not study i mean to say bye do your training just book your exam and go for that now you will say me neha uh, you have also given but you were not able to pass in your first attempt you count it as failure i don't count it as failure i count it as you know experience gaining like what the examination really looks like paying 1500 and taking a experience to the real examination is not that a bad deal okay and that gives me more confidence like in second attempt i was more confident and third attempt i was sure i will nail it up i was really so strategical in my third attempt ki i have to do or die because you know getting out on 99 is really pinching than getting out on uh, 30 so uh, the point is just you have to go and give the exam this is only the way and if you will ask me yeah i do i need to uh, buy any book so i will tell you very true thing things can be done through the google concepts and all and you are having uh, you know like i will I, with the things which i have not done why will i tell you to do that you know teacher should teach what she preach itself right so i will not give you any fake things and all just and i will not say no study for the whole day do this no not at all we are a professional not the students we don't have that much time we have other commitments also so just 50 hour listening is not a small uh, deal but listen 50 hour then that is the important thing right
and you don't have to go towards each and everything you know some people say i will see the total recordings my goodness you have heard us 50 hours and again you will watch us my goodness then you are having a, you know such a patience who is having a patience just see the ppts just go for the exam okay and see whenever i used to come after getting failure in an exam what i need to do what i used to do i just jot down the questions what i remember by my memory that are a big help why because questions are repeating a lot in the examination and more the more than theoreticals practicals are rep repeating in you know higher frequency so uh, that is the only way what you know if my mistakes can be your learnings nothing would like that our, our, uh, our obtained marks are displayed uh, uh, after the uh, exam only? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Submit button and you will get P or F. And I pray okay. to God that you will get uh, P only. P for Thank pass, you. F for fail. Thank you. And I will tell you a good incident with me. In my first, uh, in my first report card, which came F, I bought it at my home. My daughter okay. saw that. Mama first time, Mama. First. Sorry, sir, for Hindi, but she said in like okay, no, 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 no. only. Mama yeah. first time, Mama first time. I no better. I got failed in this examination. <laughs> My daughter looked at me and said, Mama, you failed in the examination, really? Now, no mobile, no outing, just go into the room and study. So that one month was a very troubling month for me because I was not allowed to scold my kids because they say, Mommy, at least we pass. You were not able to pass the examination. So don't talk about the percentages in all to us. So really, uh, exam is, you know, only I'm again repeating only way. Just go and give it. That is the only way, right? Thank you so much for listening to me so patiently. And I hope uh, I know the it would be a heavier one because laws, laws, theoretical. I tried to accumulate the day to day examples so that it could be quite, you know, friendly to you but uh, later on also if you have any problem just mail and message me no calls because many times we are in the session but i will definitely give the answer it is possible that you message me today and i'm giving you answer after two day days that is still possible but definitely i will be giving the answer right so very bye bye to everybody and all the best for your exams thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you, ma thank you. Thank you, ma Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, abhi uh, lunch time hai ye. Please apna lunch time enjoy kijiye. Enjoy kya kijiye? Bas lunch kijiye. Lunch time apna lunch time aap pura spend kijiye aur koshish kijiyega ki apna time cover hone se aaj session mein pehle session join kijiye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I request my coordinator to please mark my present because I joined the session somewhat around 8.35. Hello, Anji Navinji. Uh, actually, I joined the session at 8.35, so I request to please mark my present in the na? No problem, nahi hai, sir. Five minutes ke koi se dikkat nahi rahegi. Session, do paanch minutes baad hi start ho pata hai, kyunki aap jaise sabke liye bahut mushkil ho jata hai. Morning 8:30 utna aur session join karna. To do Actually, I got confused. I thought that today also it is at 8:45, so I just saw no. the message in the WhatsApp that it is. Every day the time. Nee, to basic time is between nine to six, but every day the time can be changed. Sometimes it's from 8:30, sometimes it's from 9:30. So, it right. depends on your faculty, which we have times available. Yes. Hai, uske no, no, it is totally fine, actually. It is my fault. I didn't get the message correctly. No, no, I didn't no, interpret no. it properly. I didn't interpret it properly. You link around 4, 4.30. You will get a link around 4, 4.30. You will get a link around 4.30. Sure, sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Just need at 2.30? No? Next session? Yeah, it's only 2.30, sir. 2.30. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
हाँ ले लो ना नहीं 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 तुम ले लो ठीक है मेरे को काम है तुम ले लो मैं यहाँ से अप्रूव करता हूँ हेलो हाँ बोलो हाँ एड्रेस टू सेवन सिक्स नाइन जीरो सेवन फोर नाइन एट यही है ना फाइव डबल सेवन सिक्स थ्री सिक्स टू सिक्स नाइन नहीं मेरे पास यहाँ पे ये ये आ गया है फाइव डबल सेवन फाइव डबल सेवन सिक्स थ्री सिक्स टू सिक्स नाइन
गुड आफ्टरनून सर गुड आफ्टरनून सर नवीन जी वक्के बड़े पाबंद है आप थैंक यू बस मैं उम्मीद कर रहा हूँ बाकी भी इतनी पाबंद निकले पूरे टाइम पे भी आ जाए तो गनीमत सेशन जस्ट गिव मी अनदर टू मिनट सर मैं उम्मीद कर रहा हूँ बाकी सब भी एक साथ ज्वाइन कर लें No, it's a not a joint session, sir. It's only it's for only... Uh, landed building. It's already two twenty nine. Uh, after yeah, just two thirty, yeah. I just take one minute, and oh, then you can continue, sir. Vishal ji, how did you like the session? आपको अच्छा चल रहा है अच्छा चल रहा है उम्मीद करेंगे आगे थोड़ा और बेटर हो क्योंकि छः दिन छः दिन में मोस्टली फैकल्टीज आपके बार बार चेंज होंगे सबका अपना अलग अलग एक्सपीरियंस है सब अलग अलग तरीके से आपको सजेशन दे रहे हैं तो जो आपको आपके लिए सबसे बेहतर लगे उसे समझिएगा वैसे तो सबका ही अपना एक्सपीरियंस बहुत अच्छा है और अभी जो आपके नेक्स्ट फैकल्टी है वो तो क्या काफ़ी तजुर्बेकार है ओके मैं आप सबसे बस एक बार आपका अटेंडेंस मार्क करूंगा उसके बाद आपका सेशन और डिले नहीं करते एक मिनट दीजिएगा बस मुझे शिव शंकर हर्ष शिव शंकर हर्ष अभी कम ही लोग हैं वेद प्रकाश पंकज चौहान क्या पंकज चौहान जी हैं नागाभूषण नागाभूषण नवीन चंद्रा नवीन जी से तो खैर बात ही हो रही है yes, पल्लवी पल्लवी वीरल चेतन क्या चेतन जी हैं क्लास में शिवराम राजू भरत कुमार पाटिल भरत कुमार पाटिल शैलेंद्र सिंह विशाल विशाल जी से भी बात हो रही है ऋतुराज मिश्रा ऋतुराज जी हैं क्लास में शुभम थैंक यू सर विकास जी आशीष आशीष जी ज्वाइन कर चुके भावेश आयुष्मान थैंक यू सर और आशीष आप में से बाकी अब जो ज्वाइन करें आप प्लीज अब ऑलरेडी आपका सेशन लेट हो जाएगा सर कैन वी कंटिन्यू सर या आपकी क्लास को इंटरप्ट नहीं करेंगे ठीक Course, I have others, uh, and uh, today's topic we are going to discuss about principles of insurance and loss. Uh, how when a when a claim comes, how to go about it? 
that this is this subject is uh, focusing only on fire insurance okay which is a vast area and it covers it has got a major uh, areas of marine fire and miscellaneous that is how it is categories and under these uh, types there are so many types of uh, policies and so many so many property insurance so many other things are covered but we are uh, concentrating only on the fire insurance as far as the IBBA syllabus for you uh, prescribed is concerned and we are, we are going to see only the basics we are not going very detailed into it because insurance it, it takes years to understand an insurance and the, the practice of course that's not necessary for you why this insurance uh, thing is being uh, prescribed for you is valuation for insurance is also a, a part of uh, insurance is also a part of valuation whenever somebody feels what is the sum insured for the, uh, of the property which he holds what should i uh, in, uh, opt for the sum insured somebody uh, want to know that they may be going for a valuation so that is the very purpose of uh, uh, making this so that you understand the basics and how to go about the valuation as you practice when becoming a course so let me share my content Hope the screen is visible and I am already doing Okay, right. So, principles of insurance and loss assessment. So, you see this uh, picture I am, which I am going to uh, put it on the screen. This is a word, and there are so many things happening around the world each and every time uh, throughout the uh, throughout our life. So, one is fire, earthquake, lightning, flood, storm. Subsidence, riot, accidents, lack of damage, explosion, health hazards, and so many other things are happening around the world. And this has been constantly, we people are put constantly through this. This may happen to any on any day to anybody. That is that uh, uh, likelihood of the events. Okay. So, what we conclude is no thing without the risk, whether it is a living thing or a non living thing. Or till this existence on this earth is always subject to these types of risk. And of course, the brighter part is nothing without risk. Whenever we want to come up in life or in our profession or in our, whatever be the case, uh, we'll have to take risk at some that's that is a speculative risk, and the upper one is the other form of risk. So, what is that risk? Is how it is defined. It's an exposure to events which cannot be predicted with absolute certainty, of course. With the uh, with a certain, some degree of certainty, we can predict, predict it, but not with 100% uh, uh, certainty. It is classified into two two ways. One is pure or statistic risk, static risk, and the second one is speculative or the business risk. What is the static risk? Is occur with a degree of regularity over a period of time, and as a result, are generally predictable based on past <laughs> experience and statistical models like your uh, weather conditions. Your uh, uh, weather or storm and all those things, it it is uh, it comes under pure risk, and of course the speculative or business circles do not occur with any precise degree of regularity, and as a result are generally less predictable. So this one, pure risk can be minimized, in the sense not the risk, the effect of the risk can be minimized, but cannot be eliminated totally. Right? If, if it happens, it it, it has we will have to bear that. But the effect of this operation on a operating of a risk can be minimized. It can only be managed by strategies and techniques as far as the business risk is concerned. So when these things happen to us, so what, what is the result is we economically become very weak. We, lo we lose our wealth, we lose our, uh, so many things we lose. So what, what to do in that case, because this is a certain to happen to anybody else, on anything, so what to do? So we have to make, do some risk management, and for this business risk management, the solution is management strategies. Of course, you have you are based on the type of industry or whatever be the profession you are there, and you have to do some strategical uh, things to overcome this uh, risk. And for this pure risk, the solution is insurance, nothing else. 
So this, what is this insurance? Insurance is the solution to deal with pure risk. It's not to deal with the business risk, but it's a pure risk and it's financial consequences. That is what the insurance will uh, cover you. And it is a protection bought by an individual by payment of small amount for the uncertain loss he is exposed to. Maybe, maybe having a property of worth of several crores, but for a fire fire policy, the premium you may pay maybe thousands, 10,000, 15,000, something like that. But the protection you are buying is to, to a larger extent. And it's a process, how this insurance is working, it's a process of shifting a risk from an individual to a group, okay? Or of sharing losses on some equitable basis by all the members of the group. I'll explain it with a very small example. Suppose in a, in a village or a small town, there are about 1,000 people and each people is having a bike. Let us assume this small scenario. And the cost of the bike is 50,000. The experience of this group of people who are all in the town is that on an average, two bike is getting lost for, uh, for due, to some, some, due to so many reasons. So whenever it happens, the loss is particular to the about only to, uh, to the persons whom it happens to the tune of 50,000. So what these people thought, okay, we'll all come together and make a fund and, uh, and put our contribution. And so that uh, uh, if the, this, the person who is affected is not affected to the, to the extent of 50,000. So they contributed 100 rupees, making the fund as one lakh. And whenever this happens, based on that, uh, when, that, uh, when this, inch, uh, when this uh, uh, damage happens, this is paid from the fund. <clears throat> this is a shifting of a risk from an individual to a group and sharing of losses. Of course, their contribution is only 100 rupees, but the uh, the loss to an individual person is going to be 50,000 rupees. The 50,000 rupees is shared among these people. This is a fundamental basis on which the insurance is working. Of course, in, uh, in actual scenario, it's a very complicated thing and it has been separately dealt with an uh, area called an actuarial science, which deals with all these types of uh, calculation of risk and all, all uh, uh, formulating of a policy or fixing of the premium and all those things. That's a very big area. So let us try this, let's stop with this with the understanding about how it works. So what is an insurance contract? So you have a contract, it's called an insurance contract. What is that? It's a written contract between an insured, who is that fellow, who is the, who is the person, proposes it's between an insured and the insured, and the, in the in that process, he proposes the insured proposes for a protection to his assets against losses due to certain perils by paying the premium as consideration. Here, perils means cause of loss. That's all. The meaning of peril is cause of loss due to certain uh, causes of loss by paying a premium as consideration. The premium, what he's paying, the small amount as a premium, is a consideration from the insured, and when the insure, insurer, after accepting it, this, uh, this proposal, promises to indemnify any financial losses the insured may suffer due to any perils insured. So in the contract, they'll be mentioning what are all the perils that is being covered. And if, if, it, if at any day, uh, the, the insured suffers due to the perils covered in the, in the, due to any one of the perils covered in the policy, the insurer promises to indemnify. This is an intangible asset what we are buying. It's not a tangible asset. He gives only the promises, promise. It becomes tangible only when the loss occurs. So this is what uh, the insurance contract is. Of course, these two contracts are subject to, for a stated period of, uh, stated period, maybe uh, normally it is for one year, subject to the limits of specified amount. The specified amount is your sum insured. What uh, sum insured I should uh, insure my property. Uh, that is what the amount, that is specified amount. And of course, the terms and conditions of the contract. If you see insurance policy at the backside, there may be so many terms and contracts uh, being uh, uh, given on that. It's subject to all these things. So this is how this is uh, how the insurance contract works. And of course, syllabus, I have divided into uh, three chapters. One is the, dealing with about the principles, contracts, duties, and all those things. And second one, uh, what are the types covered? What are all the perils covered? There are some exclusions, general exclusion, general conditions, and what are all the type of fire policies? What are all the add-on covers and add-on classes we can take? And of course, the third one is when a claim happens, how to go about it. 
yeah uh, of course uh, we'll see what first thing we'll see what are the principles this basically the six principles are there and we'll see one by one what is that the first and foremost one is utmost good faith it's called uberima fidai in latin what is that the insurer neither knows anything nor he has the opportunity to verify the related risk and fully relies on the disclosure of the insurer at the time of the proposal whenever i i go to a insurer for asking for coverage of my property they will give a proposal form and i'll have to <clears throat> fill up the form uh, so as uh, so that uh, i give whatever the details i know about the property which i'm going to insure uh, whatever i know or i ought to know all those things i will be declaring at that and based on the declaration nothing will be verified at the time of issuance of any policy nothing will be verified the whatever your declaration state it stated in the declaration but they will believe you and issue you the policy this is what is called utmost good faith and if in a, in a, any other contract other than the insurance contract it is good faith in the sense the seller suppose a seller is there a buyer is there seller declares whatever be the all the, uh, the characteristics of the product what he is selling declares all those things it is for the buyer to verify all those things and then buy a product Uh, that is why it's called a buyer beware uh, in a, in a, any other contract but in insurance contract it is utmost good faith Na nothing is verified and all these things will be verified only on happening of an incident or on, and on settlement so this is called utmost good faith a positive duty so, to work sir, yes so i had one question yes please sir so if the if the buyer is unaware of uh, whatever uh, the disclosures in the uh, insurance are okay isn't it the responsibility of the governing body to uh, make sure that the insurance contracts are made such that each and every uh, matlab uh, the interest of the consumer is taken care of Uh, see uh, uh, i understand i understand your question the thing is there are cross and cross of policies are there okay practically it is not possible that is of course that's so that I can, that is why the, they say it's on utmost good faith whatever declaration you give okay other than uh, some few things what the, suppose i got a house uh, i am going to say it's, it's it's the construction type i am going to say how many stories it has got and what is the type of construction all those things and whether it is uh, uh, in an earthquake prone zone or it is by the side of any river or pond or something like that so all these things is what he is going to declare he knows everything about that the about this property so all these things they are called material facts material facts are the things which is going to affect the acceptance or rejection of any claim so all these things yes but each and every time this fellow insurer come insurance company cannot come and verify all those things and then give you insurance that is that is not possible that's why they made it utmost good faith i believe you whatever you you are telling i believe you and give you the contract so it is the duty that's why it's said it's a positive duty to voluntarily disclose even something it is not as if you go to take a life insurance uh, policy they would say are you a smoker are you a drinker or you have any pre uh, ailments all those things they are not going to complete uh, check each and i uh, they are not going to come and check you whether you are smoking or drinking but for the very uh, age suppose your age only they'll they'll put you to some uh, the, some doctors uh, surveillance otherwise they are not going to check it what only say that uh, they will they will believe you and give you the policy so it is a positive duty to warranty disclose accurately and fully all the material facts to the risk being proposed whatever the thing the fellow is 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 known about all the facts he has to discuss whether ask them or not that is why it is not uh, the, the responsibility of the insurance company it is the responsibility for the insured to declare all those things whether they are asked or not anything which is adverse or which is going to affect this uh, uh, the in a enhance the risk uh, risk associated with the property he has to declare that of course it is up to the insurance company to decide whether to accept it or not or even if it accept it but what premium what is that material fact is the fact that would affect the judgment of a prudent underwriter underwriter is nothing but a insurance uh, company in designing the acceptance of the risk so based on your declaration only the fellow will see what type of uh, policy is going to, he, he is going to give it to you 
uh, with what type of coverages and what are all the terms and conditions all those things are dependent on this material flag and of course at what premium subject to the terms and conditions the duty of disclosure ceases when the proposal is accepted so once you give that duty and you got your policy there ends but is again uh, revokes at the time of when at the time of renewal or at the time of any alteration in your in your property in your uh, in your uh, subject of uh, insurance during the currency of the uh, insurance policy that is in it, suppose your insurance policy is from january to december that is uh, that one year period suppose i got a good one i have been storing uh, some normal goods and all of a sudden one day i started storing hazardous goods okay my risk factor is changing so it is my duty to go and declare that yes uh, from this day onwards i am going to store this type of goods and i have to go and declare to the fellow based on your declaration uh, he may accept it or may not accept it if at all he accept it he may he may decide at what premium uh, he is going to uh, charge you on that so that is and, and get it endorsed in your policy all these alterations all those things you should declare once they are accepted they will endorse endorsement means correction in the policy they will make a correction and give it to you and make it current policy this is what the principle of utmost good faith is and the second one is your insurable interest it is the legal right to insure arising out of a financial relationship under law between the insured and the subject matter of insurance suppose i got a my property i should have the legal right i should be the owner or or have a financial relationship i should be a owner or i should be a lender so so many relationships financial relationships are there under law it should be recognized by the law it's not it's not an unlawful uh, relationship between the insured and the subject matter of insurance then only i can go and insure my property i cannot if, if i don't have any insurable interest i cannot go and insure the property it is not the property that is insured but it is the pecuniary pecuniary means monetary interest in that property so it's not the stones and if i say i insure my house it is not the bricks and mortars it is the financial uh, financial value of that property is what i am going to insure <clears throat> so requests for insurable interest is there should be a property capable of being insured the property the proposed property should be a subject matter of insurance the insured should have a legal relationship with the subject matter of insurance and the insured can recover the loss only to the extent of his insurable interest in the sense suppose i am i am buying a flat uh i i have paid 20% margin and balance 80% would have been lent, given by the <coughs> by the financial financial institute or bank or whatever who are with the case suppose uh, i i will be start paying on my emi on any of the day uh, the some close that is total loss for the property the bank cannot do yes lend 80% the bank liability is to the extent of uh, outstanding loan outstanding on the day of happening and the other the, the balance has to go to the insured this is what they can recover only to the extent of his insurable interest the institute the financial insur insurable interest is the outstanding loan on the date of happening and the balance of course it's by the insurable interest of the person it goes to the uh, insured this is what the meaning of the fourth one and the period what is this uh, oh, sorry now what is this a subject matter of insurance what is that uh, what is that uh, property or going to insure should be a subject okay. matter proposed property should be a subject matter of insurance it is okay, the property is property is a second yeah. name like we are naming it as subject matter of insurance right yeah yeah, 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 yeah. thank you sir and the period is uh, should exist uh, the, the in all policies insurable interest should exist throughout the period insurance except in marine policy only in marine policy the insurable interest because the during the voyage right so it's uh, from a starting point to the destination the ownership may change okay it may change it, it changes because so many transactions would have happened even the voyage itself uh, this fellow will start selling to so many people and it it, it it happens so that is why only when the happening of the incident the insurable interest should be there in a marine policy but in all other policies it should exist throughout the currency of the policy in the marine policy it should exist only at the time of happening the transfer transfer of insurable interest from the insured does not automatically affect the transfer of policy to the transferee except through a bill or operation 
and uh, either it is a will or operation law, law it is automatically transferred otherwise uh, you will have to go and inform the insurance company saying that from this date onwards i am not the owner of this property i have sold my property uh, to this fellow or he is the current owner and get it endorsed with the policy otherwise the insurer the contract will become void other transfers such as sale have to be endorsed on the policy otherwise the policy ceases to be operational it it uh, it, it, it does it has got no meaning because uh, as far as the new owner is concerned then the principle of indemnity after a loss place the insured nearest to the pecuniary position he was immediately before the loss the words are very very beautifully uh, uh, in the, uh, phrased in the sense i am going to this is what indemnity the principle of indemnity says that after a loss place the insured nearest to the pecuniary position suppose uh, whatever the pecuniary financial position he is enjoying just before the date of the loss i will put you in that place nearest to the place because the insurance policy is subject to too many terms and conditions and all those things so i cannot put you exactly to the position i can i will put you only to the nearest to the pecuniary 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 position i was enjoying be immediately before the loss this is what the policy of indemnity says the principle ensures that the insured is prevented from making profit out of a loss the indemnification of loss is subject to terms and condition because it's all the 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 the, the, poly, the whatever be the amount they are going to compensate you on happening of any incident is it's all subject to the terms and conditions of the specific class of insurance and any event cannot exceed the sum insured sum insured is the maximum liability of any insurance company over and above even if your property is worth it is they are not going to compensate you their liability is restricted insurance companies liability is restricted only to the sum insured what you have opted the sum insured is not fixed by the insurance company it is you the insured who is the person who is fixing the sum insured so their liability stands to that extent only then the subrogation principle of subrogation subrogation is the transfer of rights and remedies to the insured to the uh, of the insured to the insurer who has indemnified the insurer for his losses it is the corollary of indemnity law that has evolved to uphold the principle of indemnity suppose uh, uh, there is uh, something happens to your property then it is an implied condition in the futures i'll tell you uh, the features of subrogation is is an implied condition it is not explicitly sold it is an implied condition of an insurance contract and it comes into force only after indemnification of loss suppose there is a property if there is a cell phone tower next to your uh, next to your uh, building and because of a heavy storm uh, portion of a tower has fallen on your uh, property and got, i mean property got damaged and if that is covered that peril is covered uh, then you can get it your claim from the insurance company once you get the claim you implicitly transfer your rights of recovery to the uh, to the insurance company so that this insurance company can sue this fellow who is responsible for this loss who is primary responsible for the loss and get it compensated to the extent possible this is what the principle of subrogation is transfer of your uh, rights and remedies you i am transferring it once my i get my compensation i am transferring my right so that it is for the insurance company to get it uh, compensated from the fellow or from whoever may be the case who has who are the reason for this loss subrogation rights may arise through a salvage suppose if it is a total loss then the property becomes the uh, becomes the, the, the insurance company is the owner of the property and yeah, whatever be the recoveries from the salvage it goes to the insurance company so that their loss is minimized to that extent if it is a partial loss it is it is only they cannot claim the entire uh, property as their own property their uh, subrogation right is restricted to the uh, particular pro component or product whatever be the case in case of a partial loss if the loss of insured is to third party subrogation entitles the insurer to recover the loss from the third party who is primarily responsible so this is what your subrogation rights is then the principle of contribution says contribution is the right of the insurer who has indemnified a loss under a policy to recover a proportionate amount from the other insurers who are liable for the loss there is no hard and fast rule that for any 
property, I should have only one insurance. You can have two, three, whatever be the case. In case if you have that, then how this is going to be, uh, how you are going to be get compensated. This is what the, all about your principle of contribution is. Then the futures are in the event of the insured having a multiple insurance for the same subject of property. I got uh, say two or three policies for the same uh, thing. Then the uh, contribution principle of contribution obliges the insurer, insurer insured to recover his full loss with the sum insured from any one of the insurance. So I can choose whichever insurer I want. I can go and um, make my claim there. I will get it compensated by the insurance company. And in turn, the insurance company who has compensated you to the fullest extent, they will get their portion of uh, other uh, their portion from the other remaining insurance company. This is what your uh, principle of contribution says. The request is are the subject master must be common to all policy. If it is your house, then all the policies should cover your house only. It means all the policies must cover the item in respect of which the claim is made. Though in addition, each policy may cover other items. Suppose I got a, a factory building, uh, uh, my stocks, my plant and machinery and thing, and I can I got a, a three insurance company I'm for a, for my building. That is the building is common for all the three insurance company, and in any any of the, any 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 of the policies I can cover it uh, in whatever way the fashion I want it. But the principle of contribution to to take place the subject matter of insurance should be common to all the policies. The peril sir, will cost, oh yes. Sir, in case we are taking three insurance against the building and in at the case of loss, mm. we are choosing one. Mm. Say I have chosen A as an insurance company and uh, get the claim for that company. Okay. And so the ownership would be given to the A, right? The A company. Okay. Then what about the B and C insurers? That is what they is are also. They are, that is what, you cannot go and keep on claiming from B Keep on claiming no, no. from C. Just no, I am not claiming, but B and C should also have some amount in uh, uh, share of amount in that property. No? That is what because the contribution. That is what this contribution says. I will give you an example. That's what I have been telling. That's what it, it will go and take it from their share of loss from the other company. How it takes, I will show it with an example. Okay, A will pay P and C, right, sir? Yeah, yeah. Okay. See, suppose a loss is forty thousand rupees. And I got a, a insurance policy with insurance A, B, and C. My sum insured uh, with the with the insurer is fifty thousand. It is one lakh and one and a half lakhs. Forget about all other factors. This is concentrated only on this data. And how this loss is going to be get shared? I can choose either A, either B, or C. And when the claim is found to be okay and all those things, I will be declared by the uh, insurance company of my choice. And the insurance, uh, the loss will be shared among. Uh, like this one, how they share it, amount of uh, payable by each insurer is sum insured by total sum insured into loss. That is, A will pay 40,000 into 50,000 by total sum insured is 3 lakhs. Again, uh, C will pay 40,000 into 1 lakh by 3 lakh. In that proportion, they will pay. That's why it comes to 6667, 1333, and 20,000. This is what the, uh, the insurance company whoever contributed to that uh, uh, to the asset will share the loss among them. Then the proximate cause among the several causes that may operate, the proximate cause will be the one which is direct, predominant and efficient in causing the loss. For happening of any incidents, there, there may be so many causes, but uh, the insurance company is concentrating only on the proximate cause that, that is, which is direct, predominant, and efficient in causing the loss. So what is the definition of proximate cause as per the insurance, insurance versus the active efficient cause that sets in motion a train of events which brings about a result without the intervention of any force started and working actively from a new and independent source. This is a, how the definition is says. If you read that, you get confused. I will explain it to you with a simple example. Suppose uh, there is a property is there. I will give you two scenarios. One first scenario is a property is there. It was on fire on a day and you call the fire uh, tenderers. They have come and dosed off the fire. In the process, only a portion is getting uh, is under fire. So they want to save the to the maximum extent. In that process, they have removed something from the property and kept it outside. And after putting up the fire, 
they went off and immediately rain has started and they uh, whatever it is kept on the open all get damaged this is scene one and scenario two is the same uh, event uh, but uh, the rain came after two days okay not immediate after two days and the property got damaged so in this case which one uh, the insurance company will pay will be a question mark so which one will the insurance company pay they will pay only for the scenario one the reason is there the proximate cause is uh, fire though the actually the damage is actually due to the the damage of the uh, property the uh, things which are kept in the open is due to the rainwater but the proximate cause is fire if that fire is covered in your policy then the if had the not the fire would not have happened these people would not have come there and removed it and kept it outside and this is what there was no breakage of the event fire came it was put the items were removed put it outside fire was put off and rain came and got damaged there is no breakage of events the link is maintained in that case the proximate cause is fire in the second case though the proximate cause is fire but for the damage of the things which was caught come uh, just kept outside is purely rain rain only but uh, it big why the link is breaker broken it is after two days the rain has come and it is the responsibility of anybody to protect the property which are all subject to the uh, loss but the, the i have failed in protecting my thing so here the proximate cause is rain and it's not a fire you got all the time to save your property from this rain and rainwater da damage is an exceptional cover means meaning that they will not pay for you so they will not pay you this is what the principle of uh, proximate clause says if the loss is caused by one one period deciding on the liability will not be a problem it's a simple uh, straightforward thing and that thing is covered in the policy then uh, policy then nothing is uh, uh, going to stop you but in the event of loss caused by two or more perils operating either simultaneously or one after another it may, it may happen simultaneously also okay or one after another it become necessary to conclude on the proximate cause that had brought the lo loss disregarding other as remote this is what the principle of proximate clause says if the chain of events is broken by an intervention of a new and independent cause now the, as in the second scenario the chain was broken and the new cause new and independent cause is rain liability will be established based on whether that new cause in an insured peril is an insured peril or accepted peril in this case it is an accepted peril so they will not pay this is how a surveyor uh, will go and see what was the proximate cause which causes your damage and if that proximate cause is is, uh, is covered in your policy then only your claim will be admitted then the last one is loss minimization principle of loss minimization this principle says that the insured must take all necessary steps to curtail the loss insured property in the case of events like fire blast and etc what the it says is the insured must act as if he is uninsured suppose i am i have not insured my property and something happens to my property what care what degree of care i will be taking to protect that the same sense of degree of care i should take it even if i am insured that's what this principle of loss minimization says and in the process of uh, of, uh, of minimizing my loss i am incurring some expense they will the insurance company will pay you as loss minimization expenses uh, suppose if you take some protective action to protect your uh, items for for further damages then that uh, amount what you have spent to protect the unaffected items is going to be paid by you as loss minimization expense it is the main responsibility of the insured to act diligently and take all steps to cut losses to the insured property. So these are all the six properties on which the insurance company is mainly uh, drafted. Then insurance contract. So it is uh, based other than on, uh, along with that other six principles. It's also based on the Indian Contract Act. So what are what are all the essentials uh, of an insurance? These are all some of the things. There are so many things in an insurance contract that what is applicable to this insurance policy is offer and acceptance. An offer to enter into the contract of insurance usually comes from the proposer. Here the insured, the insurer may accept or reject. It is up to the insurance company based on your declaration. 
or if we offer to accept it subject to certain terms as a counter offer. So there is should be an offer and acceptance. Then consideration, payment of premium is the consideration from the insured, whereas promise to indemnify, promise, it's only a promise, an intangible asset. Promise to indemnify is the consideration from the insurer. Under section 64 BB of Insurance Act 1938 as amended, the contract does not come into existence unless premium is paid. Suppose uh, uh, I take policy today and I have issued a check. Okay, the insurance company will immediately give you the policy effective from today. For some reason or other, okay, we do not know something happened, and the insurance company could realize it only after 10 days. Suppose this this happens. Suppose it happens, then the from the day one to day 10, if something happens, the insurance company is not responsible since it has not realized their premium on the date of effect uh, operating of an insurance policy. That is what your section 64 will be says. Then capacity of the parties to contract, all these things are laid down as per the insurance contract act, Indian contract act, as it should be an age of major and sound mind, not disqualified from contracting. All these stuff comes under Indian contract is applicable to the insurance company, insurance contract also. Then common intention. Both parties of the contract must have a common intention. Okay, that is, it is otherwise called in Latin consensus ad idiom, meaning meeting of mind. The contract is invalid if it is not so. So, so whatever declaration I give, that fellow should have understood it and give it uh, whatever uh, thing applicable, uh, appropriate to that your declaration. If that meeting of mind is not there, then the contract is, uh, is void. It's not. Uh, it, it becomes invalid. So these are all the some of the, the legal concepts about the insurance policy. Then duties of insurer and insured. There are some duties of insurer and insured. First, we'll see about the insurer. Always act in the client's best interest in good faith and fair dealing. So the main prime responsibility of any insurance company is to compensate the eligible uh, uh, claimant of the any, any property loss. They are to act in his interest, okay? Fully investigate the insurance claim, not just parts that support that position. Provide all necessary information so that the insurer can protect his claim under the policy. Suppose any in the, in the process of a, a claim, they suppose miss some of one or two properties. They have to say that, yes, uh, please uh, give me all these details so that I can process your claim. Respond to insured communications. Once the communication communicates you uh, about the loss, they, may, they should immediately respond and send a surveyor for that. Then promptly pay the claim if the insured claim is bound valid. If it is valid, everything is okay, and the claim is found to be a valid claim, they have to immediately pay the uh, uh, insured. Indemnify or defend the insured under certain circumstances. Suppose liability insurance, if you have taken it, uh, the first and foremost thing is they should support you legally so that you can uh, go and get yourself protected under if you are not uh, uh, found fault. You can do that. Suppose that verdict goes against you, they will have to, uh, they will have to pay it as per the policy what you have. Then explain to the insured the reason or rejection for his claim in a convincing manner. Whatever happens uh, is the person who is suffering. So even all the, there is, there are all the more properties that your claim may get rejected, maybe due to the type of policy or due to the uh, uh, terms and conditions, whatever laid down in that. So. It's all subject to that. In, in in as per that, all those things. If your claim is getting rejected, even then you have to say in a polite manner and convincing manner. Yes, this is because of this reason we are not able to process your claim. Do not withhold from a proposer that any risk prevention activity adhered to by the proposer will entitle for a substantial discount on his premium. Suppose if you have a fire protection equipment in your in your house or in your in your high rise building or all those things. There is a discount in the premium like this. So many things are there and whatever be the thing applicable for the particular asset bought under insurance under consideration, they should uh, tell that insurer uh, insured that these are all the things we will give you. These are all the benefits you are going to get it from this. Never accept an insurance which they know is unenforceable at law for the sake of business. They should not accept it whatever as it comes. Do not make untrue statements during negotiation at the time of proposal. So whatever, what is that they will never make this untrue statement. So they, it is, uh, it is all laid down. So because it, insurance language is an universal language and 
so it it is it is universally applicable to uh, all the parts of the world so they will be very careful in for farming all those things so they should not make the, the person the agent or the broker he, they are the person who are going to be uh, misguiding you they should not do that and insurance company will never uh, do that then the insured what are the, some duties of the insured make voluntary uh, disclosure fully and accurately that's what we have seen it declare past claim history suppose there are uh, previous claims in the currency of the policy you should declare that give notice to the insurance on happening of any loss within 15 days so whenever a loss comes you cannot uh, sit and write to the insurance company you can communicate in the shortest way either by a phone or a mail or a whatsapp or whatever be the shortest way of communicating you can communicate it but put it in record within 15 days then exercise the principle of loss minimization we have seen submit a claim form so what whenever you go there they will give you a, a claim form called claim form where you have to fill up all the details like your name the policy number what it covers and what has happened the narration of the incident and your estimation of the loss and all those things you should uh, uh, declare that in the claim form at all times and their own expenses so whenever you go for a claim the surveyor who is going to process your initially process your claim recommend your claim is going to ask you for so many documents and whatever he asks in support of your claim you will have to produce procure produce and do whatever the thing at your cost not the insurance company cost and submit it to support your claim produce particles of all the other insurance if any so we have seen it so these are some of the duties of the insurer and the insured then what are all the types of coverages is got we will see that so in a fire policy you can cover building either it is residential industrial or commercial plant and equipments under this you can cover machineries accessories utilities like wtp water treatment plant effluent treatment plant dg sets boiler whatever be the utilities there then electrical insulations in the buildings then pipelines which carries gas or air or whatever be the case or oil they can be covered and and others you can cover as furniture fixtures fittings contents contents mean whatever is there in the, in the inside is in dwelling shops and hotels and all etc stocks also you can cover it could be either raw material or a stocking process or a finished good and and the things are in godons and stocks in open almost everything uh, you can cover it under the fire insurance policy perils covered there are uh, certain perils they say the fire insurance policy says that i will cover these per these are all the things which a fire insurance policy will cover what are all they will see that the first and foremost thing is fire so excluding you will say that i will i will pay you for fire but excluding what its own fermentation natural heating or spontaneous combustion number one spontaneous combustion is there are some materials which have an inherent property of getting themselves heated and, and going on uh, flames. Like in coal, if you see that coal heaps, if you happen to go and see in a port or wherever it is stored, you'll be seeing uh, smokes coming out of it. Uh, always smoke is coming out. People will always be putting water to dose down those things. It is, it is called a spontaneous combustion. It's an inherent property of any, 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 any property. That is called a spontaneous combustion. Fermentation, under fermentation, heat may be, it's an, uh, exother uh, endothermic uh, this thing uh, heat may be generated and uh, you you may get uh, things uh, go on fire so all these things it is excluded and itself undergoing any heating or drying process suppose some item is there in the heat treatment it is already the, uh, there in the heat then again you cannot pay claim for any fire losses so i'll pay fire excluding a and b this is what it says and burning of the property insured by order of any public authority. Suppose there is a public authority and if, if they find that uh, it is illegal or whatever be the case, uh, they order you to burn it down or pull it down, then in that case also they will not be. Then explosion or implosion. The explosion is the outward burst, implosion is the inward buckling. It, they will pay that, ex excluding what? To boilers other than domestic boilers. Any boiler which has got a capacity of less than 22.75 liters is called a domestic boiler. Only I will pay only the domestic boiler. Other than excess in excess of 22.75, I 
all other boilers, economizers, or other vessels uh, or apparatus where steam is generated, that is excluded. And also their contents, whatever it is there in that uh, uh, in that in that uh, boiler or uh, thing, that is also excluded. Caused by centrifugal force because of some centrifugal force, something as uh, heat has generated and happens and explodes, then that is also comes under exclusion. So whenever you go through these perils, they will also always say some you know, in many cases that I will cover this but excluding this. I will cover this, excluding this. This is how the insurance policy will go. Why they are doing it? It is an universal thing. It is not a tailor-made property for each and every property. It is a universally made law. So that is why they will they will say some exclusion under this. But whatever be the exclusion they are saying it, you can buy back in the sense, you can pay a higher premium and get it covered. But generally, this goes like this one. Then aircraft damage, a uh, cost by air. Yes. So, what about short circuit in a building? Short circuit is not paid in fire. Okay. Malab fire caused due to short circuit. Fire caused due to short circuit is payable, but the source of uh, we'll see then the, the thing that is, that has got a uh, separate exclusion is coming under that. I'll, I'll tell you when that comes. Okay. And what about the explosion in uh, 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 various factories using uh, inflammable uh, materials? See, whatever I am seeing, uh, these yeah. perils, it's all subject to the fire policy only. So, there are yes, so many sir. empty number of policies. If at all you want to get a uh, boiler, you can get it covered under boiler insurance policy. There is a separate okay. policy. So, this is a generally uh, thing, wordings for the fire insurance. So, we are concentrating only on fire insurance. So, these are all the perils. The third one is your aircraft damage. So, uh, caused by aircraft or aerial or space devices and articles drop there from it. So, anything, uh, even if an aircraft flows very low at your thing, uh, it comes and hits you, or yeah, something is dropped from that and spread and uh, damages your property, you are covered, excluding those caused by pressure waves because of the uh, height of the thing, uh, the, uh, because of the sonic pressure, your building gets cracked or damaged, and that is excluded. Then lightning discovered without any exclusion. Then they call it as a riot strike malicious damage, RSMD. They will cover it. Uh, loss or visible physical damage or destruction by external violent means. That is what they are going to cover it. Loss of or visible physical damage. These things happen due to an external violent means directly caused to the property insured. They will cover it, excluding these things. Total or partial cessation of work. Suppose a factory is on, immediately they declare a strike and switch off the machine immediately. And many of the materials will be in the process. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a stoppage of work immediately. Then whatever be that the process get affected, then they will not pay you. Permanent or temporary disposition or destruction by order of government, it is also not payable. Burglary, house breaking, theft, Lawrence all these things committed, they are, these are all the things which they are not excluding in the, they are not payable in the fire policy. Please remember that. You got separate policy, you got a burglary policy, you got a, uh, so many things, whatever they say that, sometimes they design a special policy for that. And terrorism damage, terrorism is an exclusion warranty, it's never covered in the fire policy, but you can get it as an odd and cover. Then storm, cyclone, typhoon, tempest, hurricane, tornado, flood and inundations. So storm, cyclone, tempest, typhoon are all uh, categorized based on the wind speed. Because the speed is around 80 kmps. They call it as a storm. It's higher. They call it as a cyclone. If it's still higher, typhoon. So all these things are categorized under the, uh, as per the wind speed. So that is all covered. And flood and inundation, because of the rain and all those things, your property is getting flooded and inundated and damage is caused then that is covered. So all these things are covered, uh, excluding those resulting from earthquake or volcanic eruptions. So if it is, suppose an earthquake is there and your house is near a small air pond or any, anything it does, and because of the earthquake, the bund breaches and uh, bund breaks and water flows and flood inundates your property and got damaged, then that is not covered. But still I can cover that if I take an exclusion, uh, uh, Add on cover my earthquake as an add on cover in the policy, then I can get it even if it is due to earthquake. This is how the 
term six. And the seventh one is impact damage. So physical damage or destruction due to impact by three things. One is rail, road vehicle, or animal by direct contact. That happens, I'll pay you, but not belonging to or owned by the, it should not be a, a property that is owned by the insured or any occupier of the premises, their employees while acting in the course of their employment. So these are the two things which are excluded. Suppose there is a factory is there and a vehicle has come and it has hit in the, in the process of delivery, it has uh, hit, a, hit your compound or got damaged. If that vehicle is the is the is owned by the owner of the factory, in that case, impact damage under impact damage is not paid. If it is a third party vehicle, then it is paid. Then subsidence landslide, including rock slide, all paid, excluding normal cracking or settlement or bedding down of new structures, that is all excluded. Settlement of movement of made up of ground. Suppose some big cavity is there and they have put some uh, something to fill it up and over that they have made a construction and that the construction gave on the made up ground is given away, then that is not paid. Then coastal or river erosion is an exclusion. Then bursting or overflowing of water tanks, apparatus, pipes, so whatever be the thing, anything under this uh, things, if it uh, damage due to the bursting or overflowing of water tanks, apparatus and pipes, then that is covered. Missile testing operations, it is covered, no exclusion. Leakage from automatic sprinkle insulations, they are covered, excluding repairs or alteration to the building or premises during that process. If that sprinkler get damaged and the, your property get damaged, that is not covered. Repairs or removal or, or while repairing the sprinkler, uh, the it, uh, something happens to your property, then that is also not covered. Defects in construction known to the insured. So all these things are exclusion under the point number level. And the twelfth one is bushfire. Excluding bushfire is covered, but it excludes forest fire. So there are about 12 perils. The insurance company say that I will pay uh, subject to certain exclusions. So exclusion particular to that uh, uh, particular peril. It is all associated with the particular peril. There are exclusions. There are about general exclusions out there, but as far as the perils are concerned, these are all the 12 perils with the fire policy covers with the associated exclusions. And the power fire policy reads like this. Provided that the liability of the company shall in no case exceed in respect of each item the sum expressed in the set schedule to be insured thereon or in the whole the total sum insured hereby or such other sum or sums as may be substituted therefore by memorandum hereon or attached here to signed by or on behalf of the company. It's a very lengthy and a very complicated uh, wordings they give it. The meaning of it is the liability of insurance company. Suppose I got a factory, I got building, as I told you, building, plant and machinery, stocks, computers. So I have specified in the policy my building three crores, plant and machinery five crores, computers one lakh. So like that, the stocks five crores. I have given us breakup of some insurance, totally comes to add up of all those things. In the event of uh, suppose that there is a damage to a building alone. So they will pay the maximum liability will be the sum insured pertaining to the building. That is what it says that uh, in the schedule, sum insured experts in the schedule. Schedule is what? What the uh, classification given? Corresponding sum insured they will pay. Or in the case of total loss, that add up of all these sum insured, they will pay that. Or any other sum or sum may, as may be substituted. Even in the currency of the period, you can enhance your uh, sum insured if it is enhanced and it is duly endorsed in the policy, then that sum insured, then the insurance company liability is to the extent of that sum insured. That is the meaning of this uh, big sentence. And then I told you, yes. So one question, sir. Seven, and, seven, eight, and nine are not related to the fire. Even they will cover under the fire policy? Pardon, I don't understand. Yes. Even number seven is impact damage. Number eight yeah. is landslides and nine is bursting of water. They are okay. not subjected to, not because of fire. Even it is fire, fire, it is a literally not, it is not, not a literally fire meaning. Okay. Now, okay. They call all these things as, they, that's why I told you there are three categories, major categories. One is fire, another is marine, and third one is, uh, called it, uh, miscellaneous, they call it. So under miscellaneous, there are so many things, engineering and all so many things are there. So this is the broad category. So fire is a 
broader category. Okay. It's not literal meaning of fire. Okay. 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 Uh, put all together. Okay. Then I told you there are uh, general exclusion. These are all general exclusion. Other than the particular exclusion, these are all general exclusions. This is not applicable for dwelling. These exclusions are not applicable for dwellings. So when uh, excess as applicable will be mentioned in the policy. So any any policy, insurance policy, you will see a word called excess, and that will be specified as some amount. So that is what what that means is that portion of your claim. You will have to bear because insurance is a participative uh, mechanism. You are also a party uh, part uh, person to be participate in the in the even in that even even though it has happened to you, you also should have uh, take some uh, hit on that. So that is what they call it as an excess. They they put it as five percent subject to minimum of ten thousand as per your syllabus. But in now it is not like that. It is amended. It is five percent remains same. But the sub minimum amount is varies as per the sum insured, uh, as it is 10 crores, 100 crores, it varies. But let us concentrate only as the prescribed in the syllabus. Then the first 10,000 for each and every loss arising out of other bills indemnified. So the, this is what the first minimum is, first 10,000 will have to bear. The excess shall apply per event, per insured. So even in any, any, any year, two events, two times you may, the property may get damaged. And each and every time the excess is applicable. Then loss or destruction caused by your this war, uh, innovation, act of foreigners, all these things are war-like operations. All these things come under general exclusion. And the third one is cost to the property by ionizing radiation, contamination, or something. Suppose uh, your property is nearby your, your any nuclear reactor thing or something like. By any chance, uh, it get damaged because of the radioactivity and all those things. Then that is not covered. That is in general exclusion. Cost due to the private property, pollution or contamination. So, pollution and contamination is a general exclusion. Even in that, they say that excluding A and B. What you mean is pollution and contamination is excluded, but in that, these things are covered. That's all you can do. Minus into minus is plus. That's why exclusion in, into exclusion, it becomes coverage. What they say, what they cover is. Pollution or contamination, which itself results from a peril here by insured against. Suppose something you, have, you have, if you see that some barrels, chemical barrels are there, and it is uh, it is take and due to a flood, say uh, these things topple and get contaminated. If that uh, flood is covered in your policy, and because if it is covered, then this pollution or contamination is I will pay that. Or any peril here by insured against which itself results from a pollution or contamination. In the process of uh, uh, toppling or it's, it's some leaking has happened and some chemical reaction has take place and fire has emanated and because of the fire, uh, the property, other properties getting damaged, that is also I'll cover under pollution and contamination. But other than these two things, uh, any other thing due to pollution or contamination, it is a general exclusion. Then loss or destruction due to stocks in cold storage premise caused by change in temperature. So I told you this also uh, anything stored in a cold storage because of their suppose a compressor has failed and uh, or it has not working with fullest capacity or efficiency and there is a fluctuation in your temperature and because of that whatever there in the cold storage is getting damaged and then they, they come some general exclusion but you have got a separate policy for this. Then these are all the things which will not be covered bullion or unset precision stones any curious of work of art. For the not amount, of, uh, suppose you got a tangible art, you say that it's five lakhs worth, but insurance company will pay only ten thousand under the fire policy. But you can put it to the value policy. They got a separate policy called value policy. They are under this that they will pay them. Good selling trust or in commission, not not an exclusion. It's an exclusion. Plans, drawings, securities, whatever with the papers, stamps, and all those things, coins, paper money, checkbooks, accounts of books, all these things. Explosive, unless otherwise expressly stated in the policy, all these things are comes under general exclusion. Then electrical machine apparatus, loss or destruction damage to any electrical machine apparatus, fixture or fitting arising from an occasion by an overrunning, excessive pressure, short circuiting. Somebody asked uh, uh, short circuiting, what will happen? Uh, Self-heating, then that is excluded. Provided that exclusions apply only to the particular electric machine. 
suppose a spark comes from a motor or some machines and and there is a fire is there and it spreads okay spreads and damages other properties also what they say is the source of fire the source of fire is that like particular spot electrical machine motor or whichever from where short circuiting happened that is excluded but the spread of fire the fire has emanated and it is damaged the spread of fire damages due to spread of fire that is covered source of fire is not covered but spread of fire is covered that's all out you have to understand this seven then expenses necessarily incurred in architects surveyor consulting fees they got some uh, amount fixed three percent or one percent three percent for uh, architect surveyor fees one percent for debris removal they will they will restrict only to that excess of that they will not uh, pay so continuing that uh, loss by delay loss of market or consequential or any consequential or indirect loss a uh, loss of business and all those things it is all excluded then spoilage resulting from retardation interruption or cessation suppose uh, even a uh, due to some uh, heavy wind or something like that suddenly uh, there is a power failure and even any something is there in the heat treatment process and because of that the property get damaged whatever the materials are there that is not covered then step during the occurrence of any suppose uh, something has happened it is all the responsibility of the insured to protect it and some theft or something happens in that process uh, if it found to be there, it is an exclusion. Then caused by earthquake, volcanic eruptions, and other conditions of lands, all these things are general exclusion. That, that's why I say any exclusion, these people say you can either cover it in a separate policy or you can uh, pay, take it as an add on cover by paying extra premium. If removed to any building or place other than in which it is here stated to be insured. So, fire policy is address specific. Matlab, whatever you say that should be there in the given address what you have, you have specified in the policy. If it is moved from there, then it is an exclusion. They don't pay it. Except, even then there is an exception. Except for machinery and equipment, temporarily removed for repairs or a, a sort of maintenance and all those things and subject to a maximum of 60 days. Suppose if your machine is going to a service provider, uh, uh, they, you are taking it there outside your campus and something happens at that end, they will pay you, but that is if it is within 60 days from the date of removal to the date of happening. So these are all the 13 general exclusions. And there are about general conditions also there. Here also these are applicable to dwellings. In the event of misrepresentation, misdescription, non-disclosure of material facts, if you make any uh, either uh, error or, or voluntary, you do that. Then that is all becomes voidable. Then Paul Descartes says, they said policy ceases after seven days from the date or fall of displacement. Something happens to your property, not because of the peril uh, you have included, but, but because of some other thing. An uh, insurance company can continue the policy subject to the acceptance. That is what condition two says. And uh, ceases to attach as because of property affected unless the insured before the occurrence of such, so that's what I told you, any change in material fact. Okay, you should in, in, you should inform the insurance company and get it endorsed. After having a risk, and you say that uh, there is a material uh, change in material fact, they will not accept it. Then, if there is a concurrent marine policy, claim will be provided in marine. Then, and suppose you got a marine and fire policy, the first thing to response would be marine, and the, anything over and above the marine only uh, marine uh, policy, the fire policy will respond. Policy can be cancelled by insured. So yeah, you can cancel or the insurance company cancel, cancel. The insured cancel, they calculate, they take the premium on short period basis. If the insurer uh, cancels on a pro rata basis. Insured after happening of claim to give notice, I told you 15 days. After happening of a claim, insured cannot abandon the damaged property. Until his claim is settled, he has to take care of the property. Fraudulent or false claim with willful negligence, all these things will lead to uh, forfeit the benefits of the policy. So the insurance company can exercise the option to reinstate or replace instead of playing the claim. Suppose if you under the reinst we'll see what is that uh, reinstatement, all those things under the policy. They play, play uh, they feel that your claim is exorbitant, 
they got they they themselves can uh, undertake the green statement and do it to you and give it to the property in the event of claim if it is found that the insurer has not covered the property to its full value then the insured to bear a portion of the claim on its own account as per condition of average we we'll see the definition and uh, what is the condition of average on that slide now uh, suppose my prop the insurance company expects you to pay a premium or take a sum in uh, take a uh, represent a sum in of a property to the value that will be on the date of happening of an incident suppose i bought a machine for 1 crore some some 5 years back now it would have depreciated and the value would have come to say 30 lakhs or 40 lakhs suppose i i insure only to 40 lakhs only say i, I mentioned my sum insured as 40 lakhs and on the date of happening that is where this valuation comes if the reinstatement value that is the cost of reinstating on the date of happening of any property if it is found to be suppose uh, it may be 1.1 crore 1.1 crore or something like that but you insure only to 40 lakhs if that is the case then this condition of average will operate in sense if a claim is there for 20 lakhs they will not pay you 20 lakhs but they will pay you only as as per this thing uh, 20 lakhs into what is the, the sum insured you have done to the what is the sum insured you should have done in that ratio they will pull down your claim and pay you this is what the condition of average says then condition of contribution you have seen that condition of subrogation also seen insured as option to go for arbitration for the quantum suppose you feel that the amount what the insurance company has paid is very less you can go for arbitration only for the quantum and not to the uh, not to the not to the claim total if you find anything wrong with the uh, disallowance of the claim you can sue it but arbitration is subject to only quantum then all communication should be in writing after the claim is settled the sum insured is to be reinstated by paying the difference in premium a property you insured one crore there is a 25 lakhs uh, claim is there then the uh, sum insured will come down to 75 lakhs so you'll have to reinstate reinstate the sum insured in the sense you'll have to pay the difference in premium again top it top it up to one crore so these are all the some of the conditions that's why we tell you 12 perils 13 exclusions and 15 conditions and there are uh, so many uh, type of policy we'll see only the major uh, policies under this uh, chapter so reinstatement value policy this called this is generally a policy settling for new for old <laughs> so i'll call you back please i'll i'll, I'll call you back this is essentially a policy settling for new for old without any depreciation no depreciation is applied the sum insured uh, but under one condition the sum insured and the premium charge on on the current replacement or reinstatement value that's what the sum insured should represent that value otherwise this under insurance or the condition of average will apply this is what it says the items must be necessary so for that to happen you should necessarily reinstate you cannot if you have taken rid policy you, you cannot say that x this is my value i have taken the, the correct sum insured you pay me they will not pay you you will have to necessarily reinstate and they will give one year one year for that and if that's if you if some, if some for some reason or other if you're not able to get uh, reinstated within one year subject to their acceptance we can extend that period also then comparing the sum which the cost of that's what under insurance even though you have taken a reinstatement policy this is also subject to condition of average or under insurance if that sum insurance is found to be not adequate as it should have been then the uh, under insurance will apply the total amount recoverable under any item of the policy uh, so, so whatever be the case the maximum liability will be the sum into maximum liability this is what the condition of average says if the property here by insured shall be at the breaking out of any fire or at the commencement of any dissection or damage to the property by any other peril peril here by insured against be collectively or greater value than the sum insured thereupon then the insured shall be considered as being his own insurer for the difference and shall bear the rateable proportion of the loss. That's it. If it is 
if it is sum insured, it's not going to represent your reinstatement or the replacement value on the day of happening, then your claim is going to be proportionally reduced. This is what the condition of average says. Then there is a floater policy. There are about floater declaration policy and floater declaration. All these policies covers for stock. Suppose you have got a, a three or four goodons. It is not uh, necessary that you should take policy for each and every goodon. You can take it under one policy, a floater policy, and suppose uh, and and get it covered for all the thing. The condition is you should have mentioned the address of uh, those places in the policy. Anything which is uh, which is not mentioned in the policy, if you uh, if you are making a claim, that is not covered. This is what your floater policy says. Then declaration policy. I'll just tell you. Otherwise, if I read it, you will get confused. The declaration policy. Insured has to declare the highest sum insured that he envisages during a policy period and has to declare the actual value of risk periodically at the end of every month. So under declaration policy, suppose I got a factory and I've been running it and the stocks, as I told you, all these things, fire, fire, floater declaration and floater declaration are all pertaining to the stocks. Suppose I do not know what is the value of the stock because it is uh, keep on changing it as according to my turnover and all those things. I do not know how to fix it. So I got a provision for that based on my uh, turnover, based on my expected orders and all those things. I'll be having some idea. Okay. This will be the maximum stock I should hold. So that amount, if you are confident of that, that it will not exceed in the currency of the period, then you can fix that as a sum insured and pay the premium. Then once I've got your policy, each and every month, at the end of each and every month, you will have to declare to the insurance company the value of the uh, stocks you have been holding it in two fashions. One is the highest of the uh, of any day in a month, or the average of the values on the in a month. So in any any one of the fashion you can declare, and at the end of the policy period, they will add take the average of your all your total declaration, and if they feel that that average comes to uh, a thing which is less than your sum insured. Suppose you are taking a sum insured 5 crores and the declaration comes only to 4.1 crores, then you have paid premium for excess premium for that 0 0.9, 0 0.9 crores. So what the insurance company will pay? They will pay 50% of that excess premium, they will return it to you. This is what all these things under declaration policy, this is what I have told you. And uh, Minimum declared sum insured should be 100 lakhs. That is the only condition. Then floater declaration. Of course, it's a combination of floater and declaration. So many locations. You can cover it. Uh, uh, and, and you do not know when you do not know the stock of all those things. You can take it a floater declaration and declare the sum insured pertaining to the particular, uh, uh, particular address. And the other features of calculating all your premium, it will, it will go as per the declaration policy. Here, what they do is, if, you, if, your, uh, if your declaration is found short of your sum insured, they'll pay, they pay, they will return only 20%, 80% they will return it, 20% only of the excess premium, what you have paid, they will return it. There, they have paid 50% of the excess premium. Here, they will pay only 20%. And the sum insured must be uh, minimum 2 crores, and each uh, place should have minimum of 25 lakhs. This is the condition of the floater declaration. Then there is a policy called industrial all risk policy or called IAR. Other than petrochemical, petro petrochemical, they got a different uh, policy. If the sum insured is more than 100 crores and if it is in different locations, then you can go for an industrial all risk policy. The benefit of this is everything is covered. So you need not have to take each and every policy. Suppose you have, there are so many things you may, you may have to take different, different policy. So all these things are covered under one policy. That's why people take this industrial all risk policy. Uh, cover is granted under two section. One is material damage. Second one is business interruption. So in the business interruption means uh, suppose something happens because of the loss, you have lost your pro profit. And, and, and if the material damage is accepted, then they will pay you the loss due to the loss of profit they will pay you. So it covers everything, whatever they say in the fire spell policy, all those things will be covered. In addition, burglary is covered. Machinery breakdown, boiler explosion. I told you, you have to take each and every policy if you take a fire policy. In IAR, you can take everything covered. That's why they take it as they call it as an all risk policy. You can cover it. 
So then there is a concept called FLOP, business under business interruption. If it is FLOP, if it is fire loss of profit, because of fire, there is a loss of property that is covered, it's an inbuilt. And MLOP, if it is machinery loss of profit, it is an optional. Suppose a bigger machinery breaks down and your business stops and you lose in property. If you opted for MLOP, then you can get it covered under MLOP. Then loss of profit uh, policy. Well, while fire insurance cover losses due to material damage, the consequent loss or loss of business, loss of profit due to reduction of turnover is covered in the business interruption policy. The policy provides indemnity for loss of gross profit. So what they give under this loss of profit is gross profit. I given what is the gross profit is? It's a net, net profit plus your fixed charges. Fixed charges, and then these are the charges, whether they, you, you run the company or not, these are the things you will incur, like your rent, your, uh, your insurance uh, premium, like whatever is a fixed thing. Uh, all those things are comes under fixed uh, charges and net profit. This is called a gross profit. I uh, given ex, uh, explanation for what is a standing charge and all those things. And in addition to that uh, loss of profit, they will also pay. Suppose uh, your, your, your factory is under a fire policy and the, the material damage is covered that is accepted under the fire policy and uh, you are claiming under loss of profit. In the process, to keep up your turnover, uh, increased cost of work, what do you mean by that is, you have taken some other place for uh, lease or some other mich extra missionaries or you're giving overtime. So these are all the, your increased cost of working to maintain uh, to the extent possible your turnover. All these things also covered under this, they will also pay you in addition to the loss of profit. So the only one thing is claim under LOP is payable only when the material damage is payable. So it should be material damage should be accepted in the fire policy. Then only your loss of property profit will trigger. Otherwise, it will not trigger. Then there are I told you add-on covers and classes. Uh, these are all some of the add-ons. I told you only three percent and one percent of architect fees and the debris removal respectively. You can go up to 7.5 and 10 percent. Whatever the add-on covers, you have to pay extra premium. Spontaneous combustion, that is a specific exclusion fire, you can get it covered. Earthquake, you can get it covered. Forest fire also, you can get it covered. Impact due to insured own vehicle, spoilage damage, leakage and contamination. So whatever they say, exclusion, exclusion, you can buy back, uh, you can buy paying additional premium. And there are so many classes, major classes are agreed bank class. Suppose a uh, bank has uh, been given loan on that, uh, and if you if if you want it, uh, uh, any claim comes, it will go to the bank. It will not go to you directly because they are the major lenders of the property. It will go there, and if at all you want it to be get it paid, the bank should give no objections at it. That is called your agreed bank class. Then local authorities class under reinstatement policy, what insurance company says is you should consult it in the same way. It is as it is existing before the damage of the incident. Under local authorities, we have opted for that. Suppose due to the uh, uh, current uh, uh, restriction and all those things, if your if your reinstating cost goes up, okay, then uh, uh, you can uh, the the company will pay that excess cost. Then reinstatement value policy (RAV) part. Uh, yes, we have seen that voluntary deductible class. Uh, the policy says only five percent. Suppose you say that I will bear 10%, you can, that comes under voluntary deductible class. The benefit is your premium will come down. Then there is an expiration class. There is a provision for inflation. Suppose, for example, I have taken policy from January 1 to December 31st, and in I have taken, uh, I have estimated a value of some insured on December, uh, uh, January 1st, say about the two crores. From January to December, the, the sum insured can increase, it can escalate, we do not know. But we cannot also keep on uh, changing sum insured each and every time. So because of inflation, there may be an uh, increase in sum insured. For the protection, this class is there. They call it as an escalation class. So up to 25% of sum insured and paying 50% for the escalated sum insured, you can get it covered under this escalation class. The sum insured increases by one by 365th of the escalated amount per day. Suppose we take 25% of 
of the amount water will be the 25% converted to it increases 1 by 365 for day 1 it is 1 by 365 of the sum ensure day 2 it is 2 by 365 of the day sum ensure. that is what it escalates so they will calculate the escalated value on any happening of the day suppose if it is on the 95th day or 120th day they will calculate the, uh, the increased sum ensure and if it falls within the percentage what we have specified they will pay you to the fullest extent then loss of rent class if the property you are given it on rent and if you are if it if you because of the happening you're not you have lost your rent if, if you take after for this class you can get it the designation of property class what they say uh, any property as how you have designated in your uh, uh, fixed address register or any other thing they will consider it in the same fashion they will view it if you say that uh, a pins, uh, pen you are saying it uh, as a writing instrument they will take it only as a writing instrument, not as a pen, and accordingly settle your claim. Then omission to insure. Suppose uh, it is a very big factory and you have missed out something <coughs> to, uh, to cover it. Then up to 5% of the sum insured, you can get it covered under this class. So these are all the, some of the major classes and add-on covers. <coughs> then claim comes. When a claim comes, how do you go about it? I have given an explanation. I will tell you uh, whatever I have told you. Uh, suppose a claim comes, you know, immediately inform the yeah. insurance company on your receipt of the uh, uh, claim uh, intimation. They will immediately send the surveyor with all the necessary documents and all those things. Even if, if they are not able to provide the complete list, then that doesn't matter. The survey will go to the spot. <coughs> he will make a spot. Uh, he will make a. He will be a witness to the damages, and he will make a estimate, rough estimate. Then two things you will do. One you will you will you will prepare two reports. One is called ILA, immediate loss advice, and you'll give it to the insurance company. What is that? You will say that this is the insurance policy. This is the insured person. This is the cost for the reason, and this cost peril is covered in this. So you can accept the claim. And this is my rough estimate. If, if you need not have to give an exact thing, it will come later. Suppose this is that my estimate of damages to the tune of say about some amount you will estimate and give it to the insurance company. So that based on your estimation, they will make a provision for your <coughs> loss when, when it is to be paid. Then you will pay, a, you will issue another thing called LOR, which is letter of requirement that is meant for the insured. Therein would have stated that I witnessed your property and everything. And in order to process your claim, please submit all these documents. You will, you will list out so many documents on that. Whatever it is there, you will have this for the you to respond to it and then <coughs> give it to you. Then salvage disposal, anything which is more than 2 lakhs, it has to be uh, sold in open auction. Otherwise, any less than the 2 lakhs, the survey, uh, whatever the survey fixes, that will be accepted by the insurance company. Then on all those things, when, when on the receipt of all those things from the surveyor and his, and his recommendation, the insurance company will go through all the details and when it is found, they, uh, okay, they will pay that. Or any clarification, they will clarify with the surveyor or the insured. And then finally settle your claim. So arbitration procedure is there for the claim amount. If you are not happy, you can go for arbitration. This is about how to proceed a claim settlement. Then there are different types of claim settlement. One is standard. If there are claims are which are clearly within the terms and conditions of the policy, nothing is deviating, then you call it as a standard claim settlement. Non-standard, these are the claims where an insured has committed a breach of condition or warranty. If you see the insurance policy in the back side, they would have mentioned it as warranty. Warranty is are those which are to be adhered come what may. That is what we learned that if you breach the warranty, insurance company are not liable to pay you. Suppose an incident happens and there is a warranty in your, a flood has come and there is a warranty in your policy says that you should store your, your uh, raw material at a feet of, in pallets at a feet of one feet from the ground level. Suppose that is a warranty is there. And in the case the flood has come and gone up to a level of four feet. Then uh, then and you have breached that warranty, you have, you have put it on the ground itself. In that case, though you have breached your warranty and pertaining to that particular situation, whether you store it at one level or one, one feet level or ground, all are same because flood has gone to it. The insurance company may waive off this breach of warranty. Still, you have breached the warranty, but they will not pay you the full amount. They will pay you a, a amount less than what you have to get it. This is called a non-standard settlement. 
then ecclesia settlement is there these are all the losses which fall outside the scope of cover even if you are a very big company and you have been paying uh, cross and cross as premium and you have not been a regular claimant of uh, claimant then if you are all you got all this background and something uh, in any one instant something it is not in the scope of the cover even still the actual company can pay that but this is without any precedent okay this should be repeated each and every time at one time as one time settlement, settlement they can pay it but this decision has to be taken only at the director level not at all at the level only at the director level and here also they will not pay you the full amount they will pay you the uh, very uh, whatever they feel like or whatever reasonable uh, the amount that is less than what you are eligible to pay so that this way as pay, pay, uh, settlement is called escrescia settlement so one small example i have given you how to go about it in case of a claim settlement got two two minutes just complete it there are two types of settlements in a in a in a, in a insurance policy uh, insurance policies are all indemnity indemnity policies in the sense they will all pay you only market value that is depreciated value only they will pay you because they what they say is i will put you to a financial position immediately before the loss what is the position financially you are enjoying before the loss i will pay you this is the basic principle of indemnity so that means any depreciated value only they will pay you in if if you opted for a market value policy they call it this is how the insurance uh, company will settle i'll just explain it this is the different categories building plant and m furniture fixes all those things this is the sum insured which you have given it and uh, suppose a claim comes the valuer or, or the surveyor will make a, a reinstatement value estimation of reinstatement you will value make a valuation and and estimate the reinstatement value uh, and you will give it like that if it is for for building of 1 crore it is will be 1.2 crores it is 5.25 like that it goes then there is a depreciation factor also that will also uh, be considered then they will calculate the market value from the reinstatement value they will multiply the depreciation and they say that this is the market value in the sense these are all the sum, this is the value of the sum insured under market value settlement that you should have mentioned in your policy here market value is 1.08 but you have made only 1.0 so there is an under insurance of 7.4% that is to the extent you are insured only to the extent of so much thing they will pay you not pay you full amount they will pay you only 92.6 percent like that it goes the stock of course there is no under insurance they will pay you 100 percent so next comes your loss adjustment so these are all the loss assessed by the surveyor value of the loss assessed they will apply the depreciation the net of depreciation they will calculate this is what the net of depreciation is then what is if there is an under insurance they will apply on the net of depreciation the under insurance and this will be the total loss assessed these are all the values of the salvage so how they will assess you are you have made you are, they have assessed the loss of 1.16 crores and they assess loss after applying the depreciation and under insurance and all those things is come to uh, 90 lakhs then there is a salvage value of 1.2 they will detect that because and allow you to keep that salvage and net of salvage they will add one percent as a debris removal charge if you are not opted for any other thing they will as per rule as per standard they will apply 1.1 percent then they will add to it then they will detect the policy excess pertaining to the particular policy and net of it it comes to 89.5880 this is what uh, that's why i told you uh, these are all subject to the terms and condition the type of policy what i got 1.16 though it is it is the lost assessed loss by the surveyor because of the terms and conditions other things of the policy it comes to 89.58 and the second type of set the value at risk what is that value at risk is var table i told you value at risk it is the reinstatement value of the assets on the date of incident that is what is that i am going to pay for that asset if i going to reinstate on a particular day or on the date of accident is called the reinstatement value in the described premises as per schedule covered in the policy this is what the definition of var says and if it is for riv that is reinstatement policy that is no depreciation policy the settlement will be the same process uh, except there will not be any uh, depreciation for that but the under insurance if it is there it will be there and all other calculations are same 
and your claim will be settled accordingly. This is how a claim settlement will be made by a surveyor and will be recommended to the insurance company. So they, what the rule of uh, settlement says, this suffer, that is depreciation, uh, how you should uh, detect all those things. First one is from the assess loss, first you de detect depreciation, then you detect salvage, then you detect franchise or excise. What do you mean by franchise is, uh, in some bigger policies, project policies or things, they call it, instead of excess, they will call it as a franchise in the sense, up to that percentage, okay, the insured, insured has to bear. Suppose they say the franchise is 15%. So up to 15% of the sum insured loss, the insured, come, insured person, the person who's got the property will bear. And over about that uh, franchise percentage, insurance company will pay the full amount without any detection. That is called your franchise and excess, of course, I told you. Then they will finally detect that reinstatement premium that is the excess of premium you have to pay to reinstate your premium to the to the original level so all these things will come from your directed from your assess loss and will be settled so with this i'm coming to the end of course i i would like to, i want to give you a maximum of information that's why as a as a whole thing to understand this fire insurance policy that's why i was a bit fast in that sense but anyhow, it's a very simple thing to understand all those things. So any doubts you can uh, discuss or else and add it over to the other. Sir, what is the weightage of uh, this uh, three, insurance? Three months. In three, three, months. months. three months. Okay, and any practical uh, uh, is, uh, 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 is it is it completely theory based? Pardon? Uh, any practical questions or is it completely a theory based? Whatever I told you, I have covered it fire insurance in fullest extent in, that, in a nutshell. Okay, it will not go beyond that. So whatever they I told you to be covered under this, of course they will put it, uh, you will be taught how to answer an MCQ and all those things. I got a set of MCQs with me, I will share it to your RVO, my course material and my MCQs. I will share it to you once you go through that. You, can, you will know how to answer a examination. Okay, sir. Yeah. Any other doubts pertaining to that? Uh, or else I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with this. Right. All the best. Okay. Sure. Landon meeting. Sure. Okay. All the best. Thank you, sir. For the examination. And it's not a, Yeah. So just in case if we have any doubts, then uh, how do we uh, convey? Matlab, uh, can we mail or uh, message or something? You do you, you, you put a thing with your doubts in my WhatsApp number. My number and everything, I put it in my slide itself. This slide will be shared to you. You can give a WhatsApp call. WhatsApp I mean, message it because uh, all the time I will not be able to attend to it. So message, whenever I happen to see that, I will try to answer it to that. Okay. 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 Bye. I am leaving the meeting. Yes, sir. Uh, hi. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Puneet Sethi, and I have the next session with you. Uh, do you guys want a five-minute break or something to uh, catch a glass of water? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. We need a break. Okay. So it's four. 06 let's meet at uh, 415 is that okay okay all right fine see you Jabarga.
<laughs> okay uh, welcome and good afternoon good afternoon sir uh, my name is Puneet Sethi and I'm a practicing architect, planner and valuer. I work out of Gurgaon and I've been associated with uh, the assessor's RBO for some time and it will be a pleasure for me to take this lecture on environmental issues and valuation. Uh, while I'm presenting, uh, I will not be able to see the chat box. So if anybody has anything to say, I would request, please switch on your mic and, you know, talk to me directly. Or if you do not have a working mic and you have to type it out, I would request somebody else to, you know, please read it out for me. You know, I will, while I'm presenting with uh, WebEx, you know, it's not possible for me to see. I don't know for what reason. I cannot see the uh, text box along with that. So just quickly allow me to share my screen. Is the uh, slideshow visible to you? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. So, what are the of this topic? I'm just coming to that. Just coming to that. So, environmental issues in valuation. This is the uh, syllabus as laid down by IBBI. So, we will be uh, discussing in my, there are two parts to it. Okay. Uh, basically environment and valuation and the other second part is outlines of environmental legislation so legislations and acts and rules pertaining to environmental pollution that is what uh, the uh, content is so this is how i have structured my lecture today we'll be talking about various aspects of environment valuation pollution uh, contaminated property and how the valuation is done and then outline of environmental legislations to answer your questions, one and a half hours is allocated to this topic and three questions of one mark each will be asked in the exam. <clears throat> so now, since most of you would be architects and engineers, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, this thing about knowledge about environment and uh, environment you already have. But then I'll try and put it into a perspective, which is going to bring you closer to what the syllabus uh, is all about and how you need to you know study uh, eventually of course you will be getting this uh, uh, presentation uh, you know for your records and study so as you are all aware you know environment basically means water air and land so not only these three components but also the interrelationship between these three elements and subsequently their relationship with human beings other living beings and property so that is what we are going to get yes yes please okay so as you are uh, you know aware that you know we are part of the biosphere which is a living world which is encompassed by the hydrosphere the atmosphere and the lithosphere so the community of living organisms which is known as the biotic world in conjunction with the non-living or the abiotic world is basically called an ecosystem we all we are all familiar with this word and the linkages between these components is through energy flows and nutrition cycles which we also call food chains now humans are the only species on earth which continuously interact with the environment and alter the environment by various activities including industrialization urbanization population growth and modern lifestyles and this alteration of the environment basically means that we are altering the composition of the environment. Whatever its composition is, we end up altering it, which in, in turn has negative effects on human health as well as our quality of life. And environmental pollution through the presence of pollutants and contaminants in the environment has an adverse effect on the marketability of an asset. All these things, our health, our quality of life, and even marketability of an asset is affected by the environment. So let's understand the relationship between environmental factors and asset valuation. See, environmental factors are associated with asset valuation due to the potential adverse effect of pollutants and contaminants that are present in water, soil, land, or other assets. Now, you know, it is very important for a valuer to be knowledgeable about 
various environmental factors and their effect of their effect on the value of, of an asset. We as a value, we as valuers, wherever we go for any asset valuation, it is not just that we have to look at the asset itself, but we also have to understand the environment around it. And if at all that environment is polluted, and if it is, what kind of pollution and what is the possible impact that it is going to have on the marketability of that asset. So our role is two pronged. Number one, to identify the basic environmental risk involved in order to calculate the likely effect upon the property in question. And number two, to make initial inquiries regarding environmental factors which may potentially affect the value of the property. So you are not going to look at any uh, property valuation in isolation. It has to be looked at in the overall uh, perspective of the environment in which it exists. So we have noted that there is a presence of pollutants and contaminants which cause adverse effect on the value uh, on the value of an asset. So let's understand what pollutants and contaminants are. So a pollutant is nothing but a solid, liquid, gaseous or other substance which is present in such a concentration which may be or tend to be injurious to the environment, giving rise to effect adverse effect on the marketability of an asset. So a pollutant is basically a substance or energy which is introduced into the environment either purposefully or through some act of nature which changes the composition of the environment significantly and has undesired effects or on the usefulness of a resource. So when we talk about a resource, we are basically talking about real estate here when we talk about land and building. So usefulness of the resource is about how uh, you use it and the potential that it has. And if that potential is getting affected, then its marketability is getting affected. So a pollutant can cause uh, a long-term or short-term damage by interfering with the uh, animal species, human amenities, comfort, health, property values, etc. But whether it's long-term or short-term, the fact is that it is going to affect the usefulness of a resource. Contaminants, oh, sorry, contaminants on the other hand are substances that exist in a place where they should not be. It is the presence of an unwanted constituent or impurity in a material, physical body or a natural environment. So what do contaminants basically do? They alter the physical, chemical and the biological characteristics of an environment. But this alteration may not necessarily create a an undesired effect. However, if these contaminants are present in concentrations beyond certain levels of acceptance, then they become a pollutant. And this eventually will lead to the degradation or deterioration of the value of assets. While pollutants refer to a harmful substance, but contaminant is not necessarily harmful, but it is simply present where it should not be. This means all pollutants are contaminants, but all contaminants are not necessarily pollutants. Let me give you some examples and maybe you know, you know you get a better picture. So pollutants in air could include particulate matter, PM10, PM2.5, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, and methane. In water, you can have pollutants like arsenics, uh, nitrates, microorganisms. And then on land, you can have hydrocarbons, fossil fuels, solvents, and heavy metals. These are all pollutants. Contaminants on the other hand can include in air, you can have nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, and wood smoke. Uh, in water, you can have ammonia, lead, sediments, and chloramines. And on land, various pesticides, asbestos, and lead are all contaminants. So all these contaminants, up to a certain acceptable concentration, are all right. But beyond that, then they become pollutants. Now, there are five types of environmental pollution that are recognized. Air pollution, water pollution, thermal pollution, and noise pollution. So let me, you know, you are familiar with all these things, I know. But I just try and put them, uh, put these concepts in perspective as far as this syllabus is concerned. And this examination is concerned. Now, as I told you, there is a second part to uh, this uh, topic, which is environmental legislation. So I am going to relate uh, the definitions and the uh, context of all these kinds of pollution as much as possible with the legislation also, so that you know uh, you can understand where the context is coming from. So 
so let's look at air pollution now air pollution is defined in the section 2b of the air prevention and control of pollution act 1981 and it is defined as the presence in the atmosphere of any air pollutant that is what the definition of air pollution is and the same act air air prevention and control of pollution act 1981 also defines air pollutant in section 2a so uh, an air pollutant is basically any solid liquid or gaseous substance present in atmosphere in such concentration as may be or tend to be injurious to human beings or other living creatures or plants or property or environment so it encompasses the entire uh, uh, story behind it so basically what is air pollution now it means presence of one or more pollutants or contaminants in the atmosphere such that their concentration characteristics and exposure is injurious to public health and welfare you get my point now what is our concern here as valuers we must remember that you know buildings and building elements including masonry concrete steel ceramics glass decorative finishes paints furniture plant and machinery furnishings the all these kind of things get affected on account of air pollution because air pollutants have the potential to degrade organic coatings and polymers in buildings while the increasing amount of fine you know soot that comes out of diesel uh, vehicles you know that can spoil smooth area characteristics of buildings so pollution will have a direct impact and a visible direct impact on the buildings air pollution is caused by two sources natural sources and man made sources natural sources include dust storms which bring in suspended particulate matter forest fires which will bring in carbon and smoke acid rains will bring in acidic water then sulfur chlorine and ash will be produced through volcanic eruptions uh, uv radiations is going to be there methane gas is produced due to digestion of food by animals and radon gas will be produced because of radioactive decay within the earth's crust man made sources on the other hand are far more severe you know compared to what natural sources are man made sources include stationary sources like mining quarrying refineries sewage and waste treatment power plants industrial and chemical facilities then you can have community sources like heating of buildings laundry services etc mobile sources like uh, diesel and gasoline powered automobiles trains marine vehicles and aircraft and then indoor uh, sources like uh, tobacco smoking combustion emissions asbestos and volatile organic compounds so all these are causes of air pollution so air pollution uh, basically comprises of as i said pollutants and contaminants so in a nutshell they include suspended particulate matter like dust fumes mist and smokes gases pollutants like gases and vapors various kinds of odors radioactive materials noxious chemicals and criteria air pollutants what are criteria air pollutants basically those contaminants which are allowed in the ambient air up to a certain concentration there are six of them they, they are carbon monoxide nitrogen dioxide sulfur dioxide particulate matter pm10 lead and ground level ozone so these are known as criteria air pollutants so all these are going to cause air pollution now one of the uh, one of the uh, problems associated or resultant associated with air pollution is what is known as acid rain as you are all aware acid rain basically includes any form of precipitation with acidic components so acid rain results when sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides are emitted into the atmosphere and then they get transported by wind and air currents these will then react with water oxygen and other chemicals to form sulfuric and nitric acids which then eventually falls down after mixing with water uh, as rain now a very small portion of this sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide that causes acid rain is from natural sources like volcanoes and vol volcanoes don't erupt every day but most of it comes from burning of fossil fuels through vehicles through heavy equipment through manufacturing through oil refineries and other industries so you will realize that all these things are human activities which are responsible for this kind of pollution resulting in 
acid rain. So the the problem is that you know wind can blow these uh, oxides, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides, over long distances, even across borders. So what does that mean? That acid rain can actually trouble people who are even living far away from where the source of this pollution was. So acid rain is a problem for everybody, not only for the people who live close to the uh, source, but for anybody across the globe. And just for your, uh, just as a reminder, as you are aware that, you know, distilled water has a pH value of 7, acid rain has a pH value of 4.3. So just uh, keep that in mind while we discuss the effects of acid rain. So acid rain will have effects on aquatic environment. See, rain will either fall directly on water bodies or the water, rain water will get run off from forests, roads and fields into streams, rivers and lakes. So over a period of time, this acid will keep on getting accumulated in water and will begin to lower the overall pH value of the water body. So the aquatic plants and animals need a particular pH level of about 4.8 to survive. So if the pH level falls below 4.8, then the conditions begin to become hostile for the survival of the aquatic life. This then affects the overall biodiversity and the ecosystem. As I told you earlier, you know, whenever we talk about the ecosystem, it's about the abiotic and the biotic world living together. So if anything gets disturbed, which means we as human beings and as human species will also get disturbed because we are an integral part of the ecosystem and the environment. Then the acid rain will have effect on forests because it makes the trees vulnerable to disease. This presence of acid which is falling on our forests will uh, make the trees vulnerable to disease, extreme weather, as well as insects because it destroys their leaves, it damages the bark and even arrests the growth of trees. Then a similar effect you will also see on soil because acid rain will disturb the soil chemistry and biology and the soil microbes and the biological activity as well as the chemical composition such as the pH uh, value of the soil can get damaged because of acid rain. Then effect on vegetation cover and plantations at higher altitudes as we know you know you see the clouds are right there where people are so cloud, clouds are uh, you know, encircling the higher altitude uh, forests. So when they come in such contact with uh, the uh, forests, they will, you know, damage the uh, vegetation cover and plantation, the way it was affecting the forest. And it will also lead to stunted growth and even death of forest and vegetation cover because of the concentration of acid that might be there in the acidic fogs and clouds. Then there is going to be effect and impact on architecture and buildings. So acid rain can basically corrode buildings, especially those constructed with limestone, which means most all our heritage buildings will always be susceptible to further damage and decay because of acid rain. Then modern buildings, cars, airplanes, steel bridges, pipes, or any other metal and fabrication that you do in buildings can be affected by acid rain. And acid rain will also lead to weathering of buildings, corrosion of metal, as I said, and peeling of paints on surface. So it's going to also affect the aesthetics of buildings directly. And then effect on public health is another uh, major uh, challenge because when these assets are there in the air, so these are, this is, these are basically dry depositions. And these gaseous particulates in air, in, in this case, you know, in the case of air pollution and uh, this thing are nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide, they cause health problems such as bronchitis, asthma, nervous and digestive disorders. So as we are all aware, you see that people living in polluted cities have tremendous health issues. Also, we have seen that, you know, buildings tend to show a lot of decay on their external facades. And we sometimes wonder maybe it's poor quality construction, maybe there was some water seepage. No, many a time it is on account of the damage which is being caused by environmental pollution and we don't see that uh, damage you know occurring but over a period of time if you uh, compare you will realize how badly that environmental pollution has damaged a 
a particular building. The next very important impact of air pollution is ozone layer degradation. As you are all familiar, ozone layer is nothing is a layer uh, which is present 15 between 15 and 35 kilometers above the Earth's surface. This is in the lower portion of the stratosphere and has a very high concentration of ozone. Now, the thickness of this layer is measured in what is known as a Dobson unit, DU. And the thickness is just about 230 to 300 Dobson unit, which is very close to 2.5 to 3 mm. So, such a thin layer, it's not this much, it's such a thin layer which is present um, all around the uh, earth has the capacity to protect us from the harmful effects of UV rays. And ozone layer depletion is nothing but the gradual thinning of this ozone layer which is present in the atmosphere. And the main cause, the main cause of ozone depletion and even the ozone hole, you know, if there is a puncture that can occur in this layer, it's called the ozone hole. The main, main cause of ozone depletion and ozone hole is, are basically manufactured chemicals. Various kind of manufactured chemicals which we use in different kinds of applications like we have uh, manufactured hello uh, you know, hello carbon refrigerants, various solvents, propellants, foam blowing agents. Foam blowing, foam blowing agents can include chlorofluorocarbons, uh, you know, uh, isocyanates, hydrazines. You can have uh, halons, which are basically chemical compounds used in firefighting. So any of these kind of manufactured uh, chemicals are basically responsible for ozone layer depletion. Again, all human activity based problems. Nothing is natural here. So what are the effects of ozone layer depletion? Basically, it can cause sunburn. It can cause various kinds of cancers. It can affect your vision and eyesight. It can cause dizziness. It has the ability to alter DNA. It can weaken our immune systems. It can reduce plant growth. It can also affect aquatic food chain and has a, at a larger global level is responsible for climate change. So major uh, issues because of uh, pollution, you know, uh, we can disturb the entire ecosystem. Moving on, let's look at water pollution. Now, water pollution occurs when the level of pollutants in water is more than their prescribed standards. So, the definition of water pollution comes from Section 2E of the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974, which basically says that water pollution is nothing but such contamination, alteration of physical, chemical, or biological properties or any discharge of any sewage or trade effluent or any other liquid into water, whether directly or indirectly, which is harmful. So this is what water pollution is. You can uh, read the entire definition. But where does this definition come from? It comes from Section 2E of the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act, 1974. What is our concern here? You see, we always, as valuers, have to take into consideration the source of water supply and the water quality characteristics of any real estate for which we are doing valuation. So we have to make a broad assessment of the water resource, potential assessment of treatment of, of water for the individual estate or assessment of quality of water supplied by municipal transmission for the given estate. So if there is a problem with the quality of water, if the water is polluted, it is going to impact the kind of valuation we come up with. Where is the water pollution coming from and what are the main pollutants? The main pollutants in water are basically various organic and inorganic chemical compounds, oils, grease, silt, heated water uh, uh, from thermal power plants, fertilizers and pesticides, pathogens present in domestic wastewater, and various gases dissolved in rainwater. And our water supplies can get contaminated through various human activity and other uh, sources like sewage disposal can cause contamination of water supplies, storm water, discharge of effluents from industries, then pesticides brought through agricultural runoff, runoff from the solid waste disposal sites, corrosion of material used in distribution of water. Many a times this is not visible to us, but it is there. Oil spills, 
then growth of algae in rivers, use of chemical agents such as chlorine and aluminum in water treatment processes, then discharge and dumping of toxic substances and waste material into water bodies, which is a rampant practice done by humans, sediments from soil erosion, and surface runoff from contaminated land, as well as leaching from landfill sites. So all these uh, can cause contamination of the water supply. So when, whenever we are doing any kind of valuation, you know, we will have to be aware of whatever is going on around the real estate for which the valuation is being carried out. If we are, uh, you know, if we kind of close our eyes towards that, then we have not done our job completely. So as valuers, even this part has to be very carefully studied and understood. Moving on, thermal pollution. Thermal pollution is basically defined as an abrupt change in the ambient temperature of a natural water body. How does this happen? It happens through activities that suddenly decrease or increase the temperature of a natural water body, which includes lakes, rivers, oceans, and ponds. What are the sources and causes? Volcanic eruption or geothermal activities under ocean or land, then release of heated water from power plants and industrial units, deforestation, deforestation will cause water bodies to be exposed to more sunlight and therefore they end up absorbing more heat. Removal of vegetation can cause uh, you know, erosion uh, of soil into water. This will make the water muddy which increases the absorption of light thereby increasing its temperature. Then sewage water which can enter bodies of water with minimal or no treatment will have higher organic temperature and this can change the temperature of the receiving water. Again, you see something that human beings are many a times very callous about. Then urban storm water runoff from parking lots and roads also discharges water of elevated temperatures into adjacent water bodies. And just building on that, the urban heat island impact will also cause the nearby water bodies to receive warmer water, which is getting transferred from the city to it drains and sewers and thereby and then released into nearby lakes and creeks thus impairing their water quality while this uh, differential of temperature may you know you might think that you know the water is going to cool down but we also have to understand that water entered at a very high temperature many times we you don't realize at what temperature the water is entering and eventually when the water is reaching the receiving water body it is at an elevated temperature and then there could be a possibility that unnaturally cold water is released from a reservoir or a dam. So when you have a reservoir or a dam, as you know, you know the warmer molecules of water will always rise to the top, which means the water will be coldest or coolest at its base, at the base of the reservoir. So when water is released from the base of the reservoir into the receiving water body, it will be at an unnaturally cold, uh, unnaturally low temperature, and that will reduce uh, the uh, decrease the uh, ambient temperature of the receiving water body. Now, what is it that we're talking about when it comes to thermal pollution? See, temperature plays a very vital role in, in, in determining the conditions in which living things can survive. So when any industry or organization discharges water into a natural resource upon heating it or cooling it down, this will consequently change the oxygen levels of that receiving water body. Now that will have devastating effects on the local system and population. So the local ecosystem will get affected if the oxygen level of the receiving water body is getting altered. And then uh, because of which the entire uh, thing gets disrupted. So we have to keep this in mind uh, that thermal pollution is basically one aspect of the wider subject of water pollution. Though it is recognized as a separate type of pollution, yet it is a wider subject of water pollution. Uh, yes. So in the previous slide, uh, how can deforestation lead to an increase or a decrease in the temperature of water? Because uh, forest, uh, usually uh, we are talking about the forest on land, right? Yes. For, uh, see, uh, when, uh, when you do deforestation, the uh, overall land is going to get exposed to more uh, sunlight. Yes. The, uh, the the land will begin to absorb more heat. So any water that runs off from the land will automatically be at a higher temperature. 
Yes, right. So it will uh, again. There is going to be a change in the oxygen levels. Of course, if the temperature uh, variation happens, then the oxygen level changes. Also, many times forests may even in, uh, may even cover water bodies. Suppose there is a uh, you know a channel of water which is flowing, and it has trees on either side. So uh, the the sunlight may be cut off because of these uh, forests, and the water body may not get warmed up. But if you start cutting these trees, even this water body can get exposed to sunlight. Mm. So deforest uh, both over water bodies as well as well as on land will have uh, an impact. Yeah. Sir, can you please explain urban heat island? Urban heat island is nothing but you see what is happening these days is that as our uh, cities are expanding, you know we are losing out. Number one, we are losing out on green cover. Number two, we are losing out on soft surfaces. so most of our surfaces tend to become hard either because of roads or because of concretization we want to create parking or we want to create plazas or we want to create other uh, areas where hard surfaces required and we are losing out on soft surfaces so when sunlight is falling on uh, an urban area the heat is getting absorbed if it is earth if it is softer surface the uh, earth has the capacity to act as a heat sink you know it absorbs the heat yet if you are walking on uh, say uh, grass or even uh, uh, soil you will never feel the heat even though the surface might be very hot you know but the, the adjoining road or hard surface if you stand on that you won't be able to stand bare feet because the surface becomes very hot and now this surface which is now becoming warmer begins to radiate this heat back thereby increasing the temperature of the adjacent air so this is what is called the urban heat island so it becomes a heat island the moment you move out of the uh, urban area into the hinterland when the soft surfaces begin to increase you will suddenly experience a drop in ambient temperature so the ambient temperature in the urban area is always going to be higher compared to the hinterland that is what is called an urban heat island okay sir it is because it's like an island within the entire thing you know the urban area is like an yes, island sir. Which at which is at an elevated temperature. Got it, sir. Got it. Okay. We move on to land pollution. Now, land pollution is a very very vast subject, and this is what we, you and I, will be dealing with when it comes to environment and pollution. But we have to understand this in detail. Now, pollution, as we all know, is generally viewed as a land-based phenomenon because. all pollution is basically generated on land whether it's air pollution or water pollution it will get generated on land somewhere uh, the term land pollution has not been defined or i would say cannot be defined due to the expansive uh, subject or the comprehensiveness of you know of involved in the same and interestingly unlike air and water land pollution is something which is entirely overlooked and hence is not being specifically defined or dealt by any statute in the country no act is dealing with land pollution specifically like the water act or the land uh, or the air act are dealing with water and uh, air pollution but land pollution is not being dealt with anybody though uh, land is recognized as an important component of the environment as per the section 2a of the environment protection act 1986 but even this act nowhere deals in detail with land pollution so what is our concern now before we go ahead first let's understand where is our role and then you know i'll delve upon into this topic see we have to remember that with luck and with right atmospheric conditions air and water pollution can disperse and even disappear so if you have a lot of pollution you know like for example during the winter months in the national capital region we have this huge amount of smog which gathers one major reason is there is no air movement happening so the moment air breeze is there this will get blown off and if the air you know fresh air keeps on coming in it will even disappear similarly when pollution is happening in water and if you have good quality water entering the chances are this will keep on going down and eventually disappear but unfortunately land pollution is such a big problem because land is static land doesn't move you can't have fresh land coming in to disperse land pollution so the land pollution stays exactly where it is until such time someone comes and cleans it up 
Now both these things are a problem. How are they? The simplest problem or the simplest effect of land pollution is that it will take land out of circulation, which means the land cannot be used for the purpose that it is meant for. Nobody is buying it. Nobody is therefore selling it. So it goes out of circulation. It is a resource which has value. And if a valuable resource is not being used, that's a problem, problem number one. But the bigger problem is when contaminated land is returned to use after it has been cleared up, whether to be used as agricultural land or whether it's to be used for building is a different issue, but that's a bigger problem. So we will now deal with and understand all these uh, things in detail. So remember, the simplest effect is that land is of no use to anybody and uh, being a valuable resource. And then a bigger challenge is now that it has been cleaned up and it's coming back into circulation, now what is going to happen as far as valuation is concerned. Okay. But before we go ahead, let's try and understand land pollution through some uh, you know, certain definitions that we will try. These definitions are not coming from any law, any statute, anywhere. We are just trying to uh, put them into perspective by you know whatever way we understand land pollution. So, one, land pollution is the destruction or decline in the quality of Earth's land surface in terms of its use, landscape and ability to support life forms. It is directly and indirectly caused by human activities and abuse of land resources. Land pollution takes place when waste and garbage is not disposed of in the right manner and ends up introducing toxins and chemicals onto land. So that is one way of looking at land pollution. So fundamentally caused by human activities and resulting in that land cannot support life form or can be used or can be used for landscaping. Another way of looking at it is land pollution. Any physical or chemical alteration to land which causes its, its use to change or render it incapable of beneficial treatment without treatment. So whatever benefits we draw out of land is like that is how the land is treating us. You know, we are getting beneficial treatment out of land. But if it is contaminated land, we have to treat it first, which means we have to clean it first before we can draw any beneficial treatment out of it. So that is what this sentence means, which causes its use to change and render it incapable of beneficial treatment without treatment. And finally, another way of looking at land pollution is to define it as misuse of land disuse of land and chemical contamination of land. So all these things can give us a perspective as to what land pollution is all about. So what causes land pollution? Acid rain, construction sites, solid waste. Sir, sir what is this, disuse of land? Disuse means you're not using it. Okay. So acid rain, construction sites, solid waste, mineral exploitation, Agricultural chemicals, deforestation, atmospheric deposition, soil erosion and urbanization, all these are causes of land pollution. And there are two types of land pollution that you know we are uh, looking at. Number one, contamination of land in the form of herbicides, fertilizers, pesticides or any other form of consumer byproduct which is uh, you know being either kept in an uncontrolled manner or uh, it is being disposed or dumped uh, you know, in an uncontrolled manner, or there are other kinds of chemicals and wastes which are being uh, uh, dumped, which are causing the soil conditions to deteriorate, or even the underground water conditions to deteriorate, that is contamination of land. The other is alteration of land, which is due to land use changes, like deforestation, farming, mining, Devel, you know, developmental works like transportation and communication. So you can also relate it with urbanization. So whenever you do urbanization what are, and you prepare a master plan, what is happening? You are now allocating a different land use to uh, land which was outside the urban area. So, you know, the hinterland, suppose it was agricultural land and you are now bringing it into residential or industrial activity or anything of that kind. Or you decide to, you know, build a railway track or you decide to build a road or a highway or you want to now lay high tension lines of uh, electricity going from one 
city to, to another. All these things will cause some kind of alteration of land use. And when that happens, you will end up destroying the, uh, the conditions that were existing, causing uh, you know, alteration of land, which will cause land pollution. So we'll be looking at uh, both these things in detail, but we have to remember in this entire thing that all these things, if they're not managed properly, they will always threaten human health, the environment, and they will always have the potential to affect the current or the future land use. Either today I'm not able to use the land properly or the way I, it is intended to be, or there is a possibility that tomorrow this land will become useless for me. In either cases, as valuers, we have to assess, you know, what is the likely uh, situation that is going to happen. And that is going to have a direct bearing on the property values. So we'll be looking at contaminated land in detail later. The final uh, type of pollution is noise pollution. It's defined as uh, an undesired sound or an unwanted disturbance. So it's basically a non-physical environmental phenomena because it is not directly affecting media like air, water and land. It's a non-physical uh, uh, phenomena. So transmission of noise is capable of producing psychological impact on individuals. It can interface with various activities of human beings like work, communication, rest, sleep and recreation. It can create annoyance and stress. Hearing loss is becoming a frequent phenomenon in many urban centers. And motor vehicles, trains, jet aircrafts, etc. can create uh, substantially serious levels of noise even beyond acceptable levels. Then various construction activities, machinery, equipment, they are all capable of creating noise, even uh, loudspeakers, which are again another human activity. Uh, though it might not be happening throughout the day, but if, if it's happening very close to where uh, the activities are, it will have a serious impact. So what is our uh, concern here as valuers? You see, you know that valuation of the property is always dictated by its location. So for example, if you take an apartment which is located very close to a railway track, or to a school that will always be valued less than properties which are not affected by noise emanating from these facilities. So if there is a noise disturbance going to be happening all through, you know, the same property might be valued less. So for example, let's say there is a row of houses and there is a railway track which is going here. So the uh, row of houses which are directly facing the railway track will be uh, subjected to a lot of noise pollution, which may not be true for the rows behind that. They may all be uh, houses of the same size, yet you know their property value or their market value is going to be different. So, and then on one side of the colony, suppose you have a school. So when the school is there early in the morning, again in the afternoon, there will be so many vehicles coming in, buses are coming to drop the children and then to pick up the children. And there are other uh, you know, traffic jams and other noise uh, related issues that can come up there. So the properties which are getting affected by noise pollution are likely to be valued less compared to those which are not affected by that. So noise pollution is taken like that. So now let's... One question, sir. Uh, yes. In some of the valuations, we have seen that easy uh, property located very near to schools and other things, then they are given more value. You're saying it because of noise pollution, which will go... Very I'm high. talking about if there is, let us say there is a residential apartment or a, a residential building, which is located right next to a school or very hmm. close to a school, will yes, not sir. be valued more. It will be valued less, definitely. Okay. There is so much amount of nuisance. I mean, I the, the colony I live in, there are at least two schools that are very close by. Uh, you know, one inside the block where I live. So in the afternoon, in the mornings, there is a traffic jam. Because of traffic jam, so much amount of honking going on. The buses coming in, cars coming in, two wheelers coming in, three wheelers coming in to drop the student. In the afternoon, the same thing is getting repeated. How can uh, the properties in, uh, on those roads be valued higher? They cannot be valued higher. If I have to go and buy a property there, I will never pay the amount of money that I would pay two lanes behind. They say that the residence is very near to the business, which is comfortable to go to the school and somebody claim in that fashion. No, I'm saying, see, if if my, uh, let us say my house is 200 meters away, it's walking distance, but I'm not affected by noise pollution, no. Okay. I'm enjoying the... You say it's very adjacent. You mean that very, very adjacent? Very, very, yeah, which is affected by this uh, by okay. noise. Okay. That's what I mean. Okay. 
I see, I am I am within about 400 meters from where the school is, but I am not affected by that noise. I can walk to the school, which is which is fine. But if I am if the school is right there around me, it's the same. then I am in trouble. That's what I mean. Okay, so when we look at contaminated property, this is the most important fallout of environment and pollution. Okay, and this is what you know we have to be very uh, we have to understand in a great bit of detail. So, the UK Environment Act states that contaminated land is any land in which significant harm is being caused. There is a significant possibility of such harm or pollution of controlled waters is being caused or likely to be caused. That is what the UK Environment Act says. Please, uh, you know, see the uh, uh, word significant which I have highlighted here. Now, as per the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change in India, there are two kinds of sites. One, a probably contaminated site, sites with alleged, you know, apparent or purported, but not scientifically proven presence of constituents of contamination. But we know that they, which can either pose a significant risk to human health or the environment or, uh, you know, exceeding specific concentration or standards prescribed for human health or the environment. So again, this is a probably contaminated site. We are not sure whether or not there is uh, contamination, but it is felt that yes, contamination is there. And we think that this has, this can pose significant risk. I'll explain this word significant. And then the other type is a contaminated site in which we know, yes, uh, in this area, uh, toxic and hazardous substances are present and they exist at levels and in conditions which pose existing or imminent threats to human health and the environment. So these are the two kinds of sites that are defined by Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. What are these significant and unacceptable levels of contamination? When do we say that there is significant and unacceptable level of contamination? One, if there is chronic or acute uh, toxic effect, which means serious injury or deaths to humans has occurred, it is considered to be a significant or unacceptable level of contamination. Or if there is irreversible or other adverse change in the functioning of an ecological system or substantial damage to buildings is happening or failure of buildings is happening. And disease, physical damage or death of livestock or crops which are being uh, kept there or reared or grown on that piece of land, if any of these kind of things are happening, it is known as significant or unacceptable level of contamination. So what is, let's try and understand, you know, what is contaminated property? Basically, contaminated properties are dump sites where, where hazardous and other wastes were dumped, resulting in contamination of soil, groundwater and surface water, thereby posing health and environmental risks. Now, most of the contaminated sites are created when hazardous wastes are disposed by occupiers in an unscientific manner or in violation or absence of the rules prescribed. So one, human beings are callous and careless. So they just go and dispose uh, hazardous material without uh, looking at the scientific processes through which they should be disposed of. Or they either violate certain rules in disposal or there are no rules specified for that particular area and then you know disposal happens because of absence of rules so uncontrolled burning of solid waste on land improper uh, storing of toxic substances discarded chemicals industrial reject materials toxic substances of various kinds industrial effluents all these are significant causes of contamination to land and contaminated sites may include production areas landfills, dumps, waste storage and treatment sites, mine, mine trailing sites, spill sites, chemical waste handler and storage sites, etc. located in different land uses. And the trouble actually happens, you know, the bigger trouble is when the people who are responsible for this contamination contaminate the land to such a level that it goes beyond their control or their you know, the cleaning up cost or the remediation cost is so high that it is beyond their capacity. So they just leave the site 
and move their activity or production or whatever manufacturing that they were doing to some other location. Now they have left a, a, a contaminated site behind without any treatment, without anybody to take care and this land will continue to remain threat to the environment. So these are perils that are associated with uh, the kind of activities that uh, human beings do and the kind of damage they can cause to the environment. So there are four types of contaminated sites. There are point sites. Point sites are basically dumps of waste or individual contamination. So I might have, let us say, there is a one acre parcel of land somewhere which is which has contamination or a dump. So that's called a point site. Then you might have an area site. Area site is basically it is an individual site of dump, but it is present in a larger area which has legacy, uh, you know, contamination or legacy pollution related issues. So for example, let's say there is a large industrial area where there are so many kinds of manufacturing going on. So many factories are producing different kinds of uh, pollut uh, pollutants. And within that area, I have a site in which there is major contamination. So this will be called an area site. Then there could be municipal dumps. These are, uh, uh, you know, parcels of land which contain hazardous substances dumped before the municipality gained effective control. So, you know, for example, this is my city today. This is my urban area or my municipal boundary. Now, with the master plan expanding, the municipal boundary expands. So, there was a land parcel here which was outside the municipal boundary before this expansion happened in the master plan. And, you know, some dumping was going on there. Now, the municipal uh, limit has exp ex extended out. And the municipal corporation has kind of inherited this dump. So this is called a municipal dump. And then there could be brownfields. Basically, brownfields are those sites which had contamination, but they also have the uh, developmental uh, de uh, development potential if the contamination problems can be successfully resolved and they can be brought into use. So these are the four kinds of uh, Sir, please explain area sites. Area site, let us see, uh, there is a large industrial area where okay. there, there are so many kinds of uh, you know, industrial units which are creating some kind of a pollution or the other. And within that, there are uh, issues which are uh, happening at the entire industrial area level. Now, for example, there is a stream going in which, you know, uh, effluents are being discharged and this stream, when it goes through the uh, you know, entire industrial area is going to affect the entire area per se. It's not going to affect just the stream portion, but it is going to contaminate the water body. It is going to, it's going to contaminate the underground. This thing is going to create smell. Various kinds of issues are there. And within a large, such large area where there are other legacy issues going on of contamination, you have another, uh, you know, contaminated site, specifically all industrial units which are operating, they are not contaminated properties. Huh? They are causing contamination elsewhere. But within this industrial area, if you have a parcel of land which is contaminated and there is other uh, there are other issues. So if you have to deal with this area, this, this particular site, you have to clean it up, you have to deal with it. You will also have to look at the entire context of the area in which it is present, that industrial area or whatever it might be. So that is what is called an area site. So an individual okay. site in a legacy, uh, in a larger area with legacy uh, contamination going on. The basic difference between point site and area site is that area sites must have uh, uh, two, uh, more than two industries in that area, more than one industry is in that area, right? No, 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 no. A oh, point oh, site is something which is individual, everything else around it is fine. So I can just go and look at this individual uh, site and, you know, treat it. You know, maybe there was just a, a parcel of land which was being used for people to, you know, dump waste. Everything else around it is fine. There is nothing else happening, but people are coming and dumping waste there. So this becomes a point site. But suppose this site exists in a large industrial zone where everybody from the industrial sector is trying to dump something. So just cleaning up that site individually may not be, uh, you know, possible to look at. You have to look at the solution, looking at the entire area as a, a context. So there is a context to that site. Okay. And what and is that brownfield? What happens to the brown brownfield? Is basically brownfield is basically a site which is contaminated, but has the potential that if you clean it up, you can bring it back into 
रीयूज आई लिव इन भोपाल आई हैव अ लाइव एग्जांपल हियर आई जस्ट वांट टू लाइव एग्जांपल हियर या भोपाल इज अ लाइव एग्जांपल देयर वाज अ देयर वाज अ डंपिंग साइट ऑफ म्युनिसिपल काउंसिल म्युनिसिपल कॉर्पोरेशन एंड दे जस्ट चेंज्ड इट टू अ पार्क टाइप समथिंग हां and they have changed the whole landfill to something else now uh, so what happens to the valuation of that uh, uh, brown field sir after it has changed no just changing the land use will not solve your problem has the site been cleaned up site has been cleaned up the fly problems has been cleaned up but i think the uh, the water problem the water contamination problem is still persisting in that area right right but so when you when you when you change to a garden so when you do the valuation you will have to look at whether or not the contamination has been has been resolved so let me come to that i just talk about when we talk about valuation of contaminated property i just come to that okay. okay so just to sum up what is the contaminated property basically doing number one it is posing multifaceted health and environmental issues then dumping or or spillage of uh, hazardous waste or chemicals would adversely impact and affect the surrounding environment particularly soil chemistry surface Uh, surface water and ground water and will result uh, uh, and will cause people in the impact zone getting affected knowingly or unknowingly by the toxic substances that they are exposed to so what is our concern now uh, i'll start answering your question here you see we have to investigate these sites in detail and thereafter we have to uh, understand that remediation activity will have to be carried out to reduce human health risks and environmental impacts so whatever you know proper uh, remediation technologies have to be adopted they will have to be adopted so remediation will involve cleaning up of contaminated media that is soil ground water surface water by adopting various in situ or ex situ clean up technologies so that the contamination levels can be brought to a pre defined you know target level so that the health risk and the environmental risks can be uh, taken care of so this will require a good bit of understanding as to what are the issues uh, associated with that so let's look at when we are doing valuation of contaminated property what are the issues that we are going to be looking at number one there is going to be fall in demand demand for a contaminated property is low because no buyer would be interested in purchasing it or renting it because they know it's a contaminated property what are you going to do with it then there is going to be fall in price because if there is no demand for such a property there is going to be a fall in price the fire the fall in price will also be because of stigma attached to a particular property that or a bad reputation which is attached to a property though it is a non measurable uh, factor but yet it has an impact we'll talk about stigma in detail also then the third impact will be that the assets will go off the market now if i own a property which is contaminated nobody wants to buy it nobody wants to rent it the demand is so poor that the, even if i start reducing the uh, uh, property value nobody is still buying it i can't reduce the property value to zero or to a level which is going to cause loss to me so what will i do i say i am not selling this property or this property is not available so the asset goes off the market then there are various risks of lawsuits a general fear is going to be there that if you buy or rent a contaminated asset it may create contingent liabilities associated with the lawsuit at a later date you don't know what is going to happen reduced market value because of stigma getting attached to a property there will be a poor demand even if we know that the property has then there will be difficulty in getting finance you see i want to buy or rent a property but no financer or no uh, the you know mortgagee is willing to mortgage that property because they will wonder you know why should we put money into this property or give loan tomorrow this might end up being a non performing asset similarly i have a land which is contaminated i want finance to you know clean it up the banks and financial institutions are not willing to give me finance because they are not sure whether or whether or not i will be able to clean up this land to the level at which i can start using it the way it is intended to then with any contaminated property are associated various kinds of costs 
So cost to cure are basically costs arising from contamination, which are related to either controlling the contamination or repairing the contaminated part of the property. To cure the, uh, the, the, the contamination is cost to cure. Cost to control will be uh, the gross cost for controlling a hazard in a property, which will include uh, systematic operation, maintenance, renovation, various other suitable steps to mitigate the impact of contamination. Then there could be cost to public liability. This is a cost to be incurred as the public at large may be affected. You know, I may end up uh, contaminating a water uh, supply or an underground water body or anything of that kind, something which belongs to the people. And I may be held responsible tomorrow and I have to pay up uh, a cost to uh, cure all that. So this will be cost called uh, cost to public liability. Then there is cost of disruption or cost to disruption for it. Sorry. This is cost of disturbance which is experienced during the remediation stage. So when the whole thing is being cleaned up, I may have to stop using the property. I may have to remove uh, the tenants that are there or I may have to move the activity somewhere else. So my entire process that is, or you know, whatever that I'm doing on that piece of land is going to get disrupted. That's cost of disruption. This will be applicable to situations where, you know, the land is still under use. Okay. And now I realize that, okay, you know, this portion of my property has got contaminated. I have to clean it up. So I will have to put it to some uh, time of disuse till such time, you know, this can be cleaned up. So that will be cost of disruption. And then cost to utility is basically, uh, you know, lack of utility. Now, I have a, a parcel of land which I have to utilize for a particular activity. If I'm not able to utilize it, th that's cost to utility. I'm not able to do what I was supposed to do in that uh, parcel of land. Even if it might mean that, okay, for a given period of time, I cannot use it till such time it is the cleaning up process is going on and this cleaning up process is not going to be overnight. Huh? Uh, depending on the kind of contamination, the cleaning up process can be very long. So even if it's for that duration, it's still disrupting my activity. It's cost to disruption. Then cost to operation. For the cause of contamination, I may end up increasing a lot of expenditure to uh, you know, for uh, a lot of expenditure in operation and maintenance of that property. So it may need extra supervisory personnel, additional testing facilities, or careful monitoring and security. I may need special insurance packages for the property and so on. I may end up using, uh, end up spending higher utility expenses in ventilation systems, etc. Any of these kind of things which are going to make my operational costs go higher are costs to operation. And then the, in this entire story, when my revenues are dropping because of poor market value and so many amount of outgoings as far as, uh, so the amount of revenue is dropping and I am, uh, you know, ending up spending a lot of money uh, for running and maintenance, etc. So overall, my revenue structure is going to get affected negatively. And then stigma due to environmental factors will all, is always going to be there. This is the loss in property value resulting from a property's bad reputation. This is called environmental stigma. Stigma. So basically, we have to remember that the uh, value of any property is always dependent on how the market perceives it. So if if people in the market feel that this is a very good property, the prices will go higher. But if the people start looking at a property in a negative manner or attach a stigma to it, then the value will get dropped. And finally, what is our liability? as uh, valuers when it comes to contamination, we have to remember one thing, that public may or may not be aware of the potential impact of contamination due to the environmental hazards. So we have to be aware of the impact of such environmental factors as may be applicable to a given uh, asset. And we are also liable for value determination and valuation calculations considering environmental factors when we are doing the uh, valuation of an asset. And if there is any such factor involved in the property in question, in our uh, valuation report, we also have to encompass a detailed uh, a report or uh, explanation or description of the various environmental factors that are uh, that were considered in uh, preparing the valuation. And 
in doing so we should be able to you know delineate each factor try and understand the impact on the property what are the uh, you know mitigation or uh, uh, you know the environmental stigma costs that are there under consideration we will have to be aware of all these things so i will now sum up uh, this particular topic before uh, moving on to the next part i have already taken about an hour more than an hour okay so you remember that in a contaminated property the buyer is devoid of the property rights what does that mean the buyer is is not able to exclusively uh, or partly own possess enjoy or dispose the property due to contamination i own this property but i can't do anything with it and then the contamination can result or has uh, resulted or is likely to result in the diminished utility of the property eventually the property uh, utility is going to diminish the environmental factors will play their role in interference of the property rights by creating an indirect restraint in the use of property owned so i own this property nobody is holding me back to use it but it's an indirect restraint i even if i want to i cannot use this property and it is immaterial whether this diminished utility is for a short term or a long term Uh, duration, but the value of the property has got affected, and the monetary value of the contaminated property is always diminished because the monetary value is a matter of demand and supply in the presence of buyers and sellers. So, if there are no buyers, the demand is low, the uh, you know prices are affected. So, this is what we have to remember. Finally, as I was talking about the environmental stigma. it's basically a market imposed activity or a market perception which has a direct bearing on the property value and this can be of four types number 1 environmentally contaminated properties so these are those properties they were known to be contaminated they have had an adverse effect on its value due to the market's perception of increased environmental risk so everybody knows yes this was there was contamination here and there is a risk which is there so therefore adverse effect on land uh, if, uh, if adverse effect on market value then there are environmentally suspected properties these are suspected properties where people suspect that, that there is contamination but there is no confirmation available they contribute to stigma on account of risk of hidden remediation costs trouble factor fear of lawsuits lack of saleability and mortgageability you know why this fear happens why this suspicion comes up is not uh, easily you know explained but there is some suspicion because of some reason or something that has happened in the past there might be so whenever we are doing comparative uh, assessment you know through comparative market approach uh, to valuation and then every you try and understand so you know these these are data that will come out of the market when you understand people's perception about a particular given uh, real estate then there could be environmentally remediated properties they were once known to be contaminated they have been cleaned up which means they have been remediated but still the stigma continues because people are not sure or people are not convinced whether or not they have been totally cleaned up and they still believe that there might still be some additional risk or some remediation uh, cost may have to be incurred or some additional clean up future uh, may be required in the future so that you know people still continue to uh, look at that parcel of land with the same uh, outlook and finally environmentally adjacent or proximate properties properties which were never contaminated but they are located either adjacent to or in proximity in proximity to a contaminated property so people begin to believe since this property is contaminated so therefore this one will also be so you know this again uh, environmental stigma is all about market's perception but you know when we are doing uh, valuation of real estate this is something that we will have to be aware of okay so with that i conclude the first part which is environment and valuation and though i mean this takes much longer uh, time duration i'm coming to second part 
This part is called the outline and overview of environmental legislations. So as valuers, you know, you also have, like for example, there are topics in law that you are studying. So you also need to understand environmental legislations as to what, what they are and what is their impact on, you know, the kind of work that we are going to be doing. So I'm going to try and give you an outline of this whole thing. There are certain important acts that are there in the syllabus. I will talk to you uh, about these acts in uh, you know, some bit of detail. But before I do that, uh, you know, let me give you a background as to how environmental uh, laws have come about in our country. So, you know, that if that will give you a background. So every time, if you, if you understand this background well, that will be very easy for you to understand legislation pertaining to environment. So historically, if we see the UN conference on human environment was held in Stockholm in 1972. This conference influenced the need for an integrated legal mechanism to conserve the natural resources, protect the environment, and ensure healthy human life in India. So this was the outcome of or a response to the UN Conference on Human Environment, 1972. Then, as a response, the National Council for Environmental Policy and Planning within the Department of Science and Technology was set up in 1972. This council evolved into a full-fledged Ministry of Environment and Forests in 1985. Then, in 2014, Climate change was explicitly made a priority uh, and the ministry was renamed as Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change in May 2014. Now, way back in 1976, constitutional sanction was given to environmental concerns through the 42nd Amendment Act, which incorporated them into directive principles of state policy and fundamental rights and duties. And uh, like what our friend from Bhopal just said, uh, you know, Bhopal gas tragedy of 1984 called for urgent legislation in the field of environment. So in 1986, the Environment Protection Act came about and so on. So this is the historic background of, uh, you know, how environmental legislation has happened. Let's look at some of the constitutional provisions related to the environment that are there in our country. Article 21 of the Constitution gives right to pollution-free environment to every human being in India, every citizen in India. Then Article 48 a imposes a duty on the state to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forest and wildlife of this country. And Article 51 AG imposes duty on every citizen to protect and improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife, and to have compassion for other living creatures. So, this is something I don't know how many of you uh, really knew about that it is our duty to conserve the natural environment and have compassion for all living creatures. And major legislative measures which are there in our country for the protection of environment, human health, can be broadly grouped into these following five categories. Water, air, general environment protection, forest and wildlife, and industrial health and safety. So we'll quickly look at some important acts in uh, in all these five categories. Okay, before I really talk about this act, uh, see, the syllabus says that you have to have understanding of, uh, you know, some, some very important acts which are there. But going through the act and reading the whole thing out to you is not going to make any sense. What is important for us to understand is the uh, points which are related to environment uh, that you know concerns us. So if you want to do that, let me just give you an explanation as to what is the structure of any legislation. When we say legislation could be an act or, or rules or whatever it might be, there is always a structure in which the act is written. I mean, I'm just talking about a very general structure. So if you understand that structure a little, then it will be very easy for you to grasp the as various important aspects of these acts that are there in the syllabus. So, you know, if you are noting down, it will be nice for you to note that the first important thing about any act is its intent and purpose. What does that mean? What is the need for the law? What is the objective? So, I just try and relate all these things with the act that you see on the screen, the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974. So, the objectives of this act are prevention and control of water pollution, 
maintaining or restoring the wholesomeness of water, establishment of boards for prevention and control of water pollution. So these are the objective, the need for the law, the intent and purpose of this law. Then what is the jurisdiction? So what does that mean? Where is it applicable? So certain acts may be applicable in the entire length and breadth of the country. They may be uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, applicable to a certain region or a certain state or a certain group of people or whatever it might be. So what is the jurisdiction of the act? That is the second important part that we should know. And then time. The third thing is time. When was it enacted or it is effective from which date? So this, for example, this act was promulgated in 1974 and then it was amended in 1988. So these are uh, important dates that, you know, the time, the, the time or effective from which date this is something that should be known. The fourth very important thing is definitions. You know, definitions of words or terminologies or their interpretations that may be applicable or new terminologies uh, coming out of uh, uh, you know any such act are another very important aspect that acts uh, do for us. So for example, the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act defines water pollution. Okay, and then it also talks about establishing administrative machinery. So, like for example, the Air Act talks about the definition of air pollution and air pollutant. So other various acts will have various definitions. Some may have definitions, some may not have definitions, and so on. So if there is any important definition which is associated with an act, uh, especially the acts that are there in our syllabus, we should know. Because any kind of MCQs can be uh, created on uh, this information. Then fifth portion is the body of the act. The body of the act has various sections and clauses. And through this, it talks about various provisions so provisions could mean uh, what, what all are people supposed to do? What are the provisions of the act? Then it can talk about procedures. It can talk about conflicts with any previous provisions, if, if at all there were any. It can talk about various rules and regulation. It can talk about uh, establishment of statutory bodies. So if you are putting in a, a, a body like Central Pollution Control Board or State Pollution Control Board, or any such body has to be created. You know, that will be like, for example, if you have the uh, Architects Act, it says that you have to create uh, a regulatory body called the Council of Architecture. Like the Medical Council, it says you have to, you know, uh, the Medical the Act says that you have to create a Medical Council and so on. So if a statutory body has to be created, that will be also defined in the Act. And then the Act will also define various provision of penalties as to if people do not follow the act or if there is contravention, what kind of penalties are going to be uh, imposed on people. So this is broadly the legislation structure. So intent and purpose, jurisdiction, time, definitions and the body of the act giving provisions, procedures, penalties, rules, regulations, statutory bodies. So if you fundamentally put all these uh, acts into this kind of a chart, it will be very easy for you to uh, you know, answer any any question that comes in. You see, it's not going to be possible for uh, any one of you to be able to go through the entire act in detail and memorize it. It's not going to happen. So, but you have to understand what is related to our uh, syllabus so that at least that part you can focus on. My strong recommendation, please do download these acts from the internet. They're all available and do go through them once so that you, know, so that you are familiar with, you know, what we're talking about. This uh, presentation, of course, I have tried to pick up all these important aspects and put them uh, together for you. But then you have to understand and relate it with the context of the act. Just reading it on this uh, slide is not going to be good enough. So you must uh, also try and relate with that. So very quickly, let me just take you through some of the important acts and you know whatever provisions that we are talking about here. And then you know, of course, I will uh, request that you please read them in detail. So, Water Prevention Control of Pollution Act 1974. I've already told you the promulgation time, the amendment, what the objectives are, what definition is coming, and that uh, administrative machinery like Central Pollution Control Board and State Pollution Control Boards have to be established. It, the powers of the board, uh, they, they come from this act. They, you know, what work the boards are supposed to do, that comes from this act. 
section 24 of the act now these are things which are related to our uh, knowledge uh, you know that we must be aware of so section 24 prohibits dumping of poisonous noxious or polluting matter into any water body and according to section 25 proper consent of the state board is required for establishment of any industry in which there is a possibility of uh, effluent discharge so as a as a valuer it is our duty to ensure that whatever industry we are doing uh, valuation for whether or not that industry has fulfilled the obligations under this act and if it has not and if it's causing any kind of issues that uh, must be encompassed in our report so that anybody who is going to do any transaction based on our report should be familiar with you know what is going on in that uh, property looking at the air prevention and control of pollution act 1981 it was promulgated in 81 and 1987 and the, the this also has three objectives prevention control and abatement of air pollution in the nation so when it says in the nation the jurisdiction is the entire country uh, water act is also applicable to the entire country regulate and control emissions from automobiles and industrial plants establishment of boards for prevention and control of air pollution so now you know that okay certain statutory bodies also have to be created uh, as i already told you uh, the definition of air pollution and air pollutant come out of this act it prescribes emission standards for industry and automobiles so all your uh, virus stage two three four six etc are somewhere coming out of uh, the provisions of this act based on which the uh, bodies are creating benchmarks for controlling uh, vehicular emission section 19 is important because it gives uh, power to the central board to coordinate the activities of state boards then section 21 says that a person can establish or operate any industrial plant only with prior consent of the state board section 22 says that any person carrying out or any uh, carrying on any industry or operating any industrial plant is prohibited from discharging or causing or permitting to be uh, discharged the emission of any air pollutants in the uh, area and without the consent of the state board you cannot operate an industrial plant so all the you know, permissions that one has to take from various boards are defined in this act and under chapter 6 of the act the penalties are uh, defined as to what will happen if there is failure in complying with the directions so as uh, in the case of water act for air act also it is our duty to be a little vigilant about the uh, you know, say an industrial unit whether or not uh, it is complying with the provisions of this act the environment protection act 1986 was promulgated in 1986 and amended in 1981 the objectives were protection and improvement of the environment and prevention of hazards to human beings other living creatures plants and property so which so there is i mean the, the multiple choice question could be which act talks about property prevention of hazard to property so you should know which act is talking about that four definitions are coming out of this act environment environmental pollutant environmental pollution and hazardous substance so once you read these act uh, you know you will also become familiar with all these definitions this act authorizes the central government to protect and improve the environmental quality etc and it also gives central government the powers to take all needful actions for controlling pollution in the country the uh, act also uh, you know includes power of handling hazardous substances and how you know prevention of environmental accidents what is how is the research going to be uh, carried out what kind of inspection of polluting units should happen all these things are coming out of this act this act is also known as an umbrella legislation so this is a very common question which comes you know which act is known as an umbrella legislation because this was designed to provide a framework for coordination of the central and state authorities established under the water act and air act the central pollution control board and the state pollution control board they are all getting controlled through or coordinated through under this act so from time to time the central government issues notifications under this act for protection of ecological sensitive areas or can it issue guidelines uh, you know under this act so various other acts rules and notifications related to the environment be a little familiar some of them uh, you know uh, you can definitely 
uh, read about the National Green Tribunal and uh, coastal regulation notifications because coastal areas are very sensitive. So a little uh, familiarization of this is required, but uh, this is just for your information that so many acts and rules are there in our country. But you please focus uh, <clears throat> in understanding of the main acts that are there in your syllabus. Moving on, uh, the Indian Forest Act 1927. It is one of the you know, surviving colonial statutes and uh, uh, this was passed so that uh, you know th there were various previous laws relating to forests before the 1920s. Uh, the transit of forest produce and the duty levyable on timber and other forest produce. So this was uh, enacted to consolidate all this. Now three important types of forests came out of this act. They were uh, reserved forests, protected forests, and village forests. What are reserved forests? Uh, these are forests which are uh, which are only for government use, and the state governments have the right to use these reserved forests. Then there are protected forests in which the use of resources by local people is to be controlled. And some forests which were to be controlled by the village community are called village forests. This act remained in force till 1980, after which you know, it was also realized that only forest produce and timber is not the only thing that forests give us. They are far more valuable. There is bio biodiversity and so on. So, you know, we had the Forest Conservation Act of 1980, which was amended in 1988, which came in. So, uh, Forest Conservation Act 1980 and Rules 1981. So, is something that you know uh, is in is in force today. Uh, planned, you know, basically, forest conservation is the planned management of forest environment and prevents prevent its exploitation, destruction, or neglect. That is what the main uh, this thing is. So, uh, <clears throat> this act lays down the prerequisites for diversion of forest land for non-forest purposes. So if you want to say uh, do deforestation for some other activity which is a non-forest purpose, so the provisions are given in this act. What are non-forest purposes? Basically this includes breaking up or cleaning of uh, clearing of any forest land or its portion for cultivation of tea, coffee, spices, rubber, palms, oil bearing plants, horticultural crops or medicinal plants for, or for any other purpose other than reforestation. So you can't say that I am removing a forest to replant another forest. That is not going to, uh, that is not going to be allowed. Then you can have uh, you know, a bit of uh, understanding about the uh, Wildlife Protection Act 1972, its amendment in 93 and rules that were framed in 95. Basic objective was to effectively protect the wildlife of this country to control poaching, smuggling, illegal trade in wildlife and its derivatives. The Biological Diversity Act and uh, the Diversity Rules 2004 framed to provide for the conservation of biological diversity, sustainable use of its components and fair and equitable sharing of benefits that are there. Various industrial safety and occupational uh, health laws are there of which uh, three are important uh, part of the syllabus. So we'll talk about the Factories Act, the Mines Act, and the Building and Other Construction Workers Regulation of Employment and Conditions of Service Act 1996. So these are the important, but I've put them together a complete list of other acts that are also there in the country. You know, you have to have an idea as to you know what all is going on as far as environmental legislation is considered in our country. So very quickly. I know I'm going to run out of time, but I I, I think you don't have another session after this, is it? Do you have another session after this? No, no. no. okay. So if there is a 15 minute overrun, I, I, I hope you will be able to bear with me. So uh, Factories Act 1948 was promulgated in 1948 and amended in 1987, basically meant for protecting factory workers from being subjected to unduly long hours or bodily strain or manual labor. So this is a very important act at that point in time. This is applicable only to factories that employ 10 or more workers. So this is this is the jurisdiction. Where is it applicable? To factories that employ 10 or more workers. So you know all those five aspects that I talked about, if you familiarize yourself 
with those five aspects of each act that is there in the syllabus, it will be very easy. So this act defines who a worker is. Okay, the uh, act is enforced by the state government through factory inspectors. These are the important aspects of the uh, Factories Act. And the Mines Act 1952 is an act to amend and consolidate the laws related, relating to regulation of labor and safety in mines. So all the three uh, types of mines are included here, coal, metal and oil, and it extends to the whole of India. So Mines Act 1952, the Mines Rules 1955, for example, stipulate the formation of safety committees in every mine where more than 100 persons are employed. Then this act prohibits employment of adolescents who have not completed 15 years of age in any mining operation. Act also tells you as to how periodical examination of minors is to be done, how any notifiable diseases have to be handled, and what are the powers of the directorate of mines to undertake safety and occupational health surveys in mines and so on. So all these provisions come out of this act. Finally, the last one for the day today, the building and the other construction workers, regulation of employment and conditions of service act, 1996. This is an act which is there to regulate the employment and conditions of service of building and other construction workers, and then to provide for their safety, health and welfare measures. So these are the objectives of the act. Uh, two definitions come out of this act. One, building or other construction work and building worker. These are the two definitions which are there in this. This act provides for regulation of working hours, welfare measures, wage payments, and other conditions of service for these people. Section 31 prohibits employment of certain persons in certain buildings or other construction work, like people who have deafness, they have defective vision or they have tendency to giddiness cannot be employed. Sections 32 to 37 stipulate provision of drinking water, toilets, accommodation, creches, first aid and canteens for workers and their families. And sector, section 47 contains various penal provisions for the contravention of provisions of uh, anything that is given in the act. So with that, you know, I conclude uh, you know, what was uh, to be told to you as far as the syllabus is concerned. If you have any questions, we'll take that first. And if you allow about uh, an extra 10 minutes to me, we can go through some nice uh, uh, MCQs that we have. So that will just give you an idea as to how. Please, sir, please. Sir, I think crashes. Yeah. Sir, what are crashes? Crashes are, uh, uh, you know, kind of a place where babies can be kept during the day while the mothers and fathers are at work. Okay. Uh, or crash is something, uh, you know, once the child has come back from school, uh, where does that uh, child stay if the parents are working on a construction uh, site? So it's a place where the child can be from, let us say, the afternoon till the evening by the time the uh, parents finish work and come home. Okay. okay. Uh, sir, also there is a question that... Uh, uh... Uh, the act which you told that we have to read the act. Sir, the whole act, uh, uh, if we uh, will go to read, sir, it will take a hell lot of time. Uh, can we get See, some that's what I said. Points? See, that is why to make your life a little easier, I have given you and tried to explain to you the legislation structure. So if you look at all those five aspects, uh, see, you will have to read the act at least once. It's not, unless you read the act and familiarize yourself with the, uh, and then you can uh, read these associated notes and that can be very easy for you to understand. Which kind of questions uh, generally come uh, from these uh, acts? I mean, we, we'll, 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 try we'll do some samples. We'll, do just, we'll, we'll just do some samples after I finish taking your question. We'll do some samples. Okay, do we have to remember some sections or, or what kind? The name, the number of sections. Yes. Uh -huh. See, this section multiple choice question, question can be anything. You know, under which section are penalties um, I mentioned in uh, Building and Other Construction Workers Act? Okay, so these kind of questions. Kind of knowledge, some, uh, you know, the basic knowledge will be required. Basic knowledge will be required. 
as far as this uh, pollution controlling uh, minimal pollution control effect minimizing uh, equipment is concerned like uh, this esp as well as uh, fuel gas desulfurization or other units are concerned uh, if they are not installed in any uh, property or plant so how we can going to reduce the value of uh, that particular uh, plant being an valuer any percentage uh, is there I'll tell you. Number one, uh, through this topic particularly, we are not looking at how uh, you know remediation is going to be carried out. That's a separate uh, study altogether. Okay, that's point number one. Point number two, whenever you have a property which is now contaminated, it might need specialized intervention or specialized input to understand as to how uh, you know that contamination will be taken care of. Now, if, so let us say there is a a radioactive dump somewhere you know none of us will be uh, our radioactivity scientists right so you might have to look at you know somebody uh, as an expert to come in and try and address that portion of it to be able to give you an idea as to or an assessment as to you know what will be the cost of remediation of such a property and then based on that input you can then further go on and uh, figure out as to you know how uh, the property price is going to be adversely affected Okay, okay. That expert, uh, yeah, yeah. technical expert, is required for that. Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. But see, the purpose of this uh, this uh, this particular topic is that we have to be aware of issues of pollution and the likely damage. If you are not familiar with the if you're familiar with all the legislations and all the issues related to uh, pollution, we will never be able to address it. We will we'll just uh, overlook them. Okay, let's take some, uh, yes, and I would request all of you to please uh, switch on your mics and please try and answer these questions. But before we start doing that, uh, you know, one bit of advice that we will, I will always give you. Uh, number one, IBBI exam is not going to test how much you can memorize. It is going to test how much you have understood. So the fundamental understanding of every topic that is there in the entire 50 hour syllabus is necessary because questions can come from anywhere they can be framed in any manner all the four answers are there all of them may sound absolutely all right but which is the correct answer you will only be able to pick up if you are fundamentally you understood the topic number one number two do not be in a hurry to answer the question many a times the question will look very similar to what you've already studied but it may not be so and the, or the options that are given may have been worded in a different manner so always read the question very carefully and all the four options very very carefully then answer don't be in a hurry to answer enough time is there you will be able to complete the uh, exam very comfortably in two hours okay so uh, with that let's uh, uh, try and attempt some of these questions uh, please feel free to uh, answer. The rise in global atmospheric temperatures can be attributed to thermal pollution. No. Please feel free to. It doesn't matter. Let the answer be wrong. It doesn't matter. Burning of fossil fuels. Burning of fossil fuels. Burning of fossil fuels is correct. Yeah. Burning of fossil fuels. So, major uh, source of carbon monoxide is? Vehicular emission. Vehicular emission. Yeah, absolutely correct. Which of the following is normally not considered an air pollutant? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is correct, sir. Dash is likely to make an asset less desirable even though its complete cleanup has been accomplished. Stigma of contamination. Sir, stigma, stigma of contamination. Okay, mm -hmm. just a minute. Uh, before we answer this question, now I have given a choice saying all of the above. Now in the main IBPI exam, there will be no question which has an option like all of the above or none of the above no such question will be there but i have included 
these kind of options only from the academic perspective of you know trying to test our understanding okay but in the main exam there will be no such question which says all of the above none of the above okay now let's answer this question once again sigma sir correct answer is c stigma, stigma of contamination which of the following is not a cause to cure for environmental contamination sir uh, sir question 4 uh, i just wanted to know why yes. obsolescence cannot be the uh, it's a uh, uh, option which one uh, option a uh, we'll discuss uh, we, i want to discuss about option a in question 4 huh. because if even if the site is clean up Huh. Its obsolescence can be a uh, uh, reason that it is less desirable. Think again. What is obsolescence? Obsolescence is uh, uh, it has um, uh, it has become obsolete from the market. Huh? Huh? So, sir. But the moment the moment you clean it up, is it still obsolete? No, it isn't. It is back. but what is still affecting the uh, desirability is the stigma okay otherwise everything else is right a complete clean up has been accomplished so it is not obsolete anymore okay yeah. but uh, yeah but a good question you see this is important for us to you know when you are especially when you are studying for this exam many a times to be able to understand why the other three options were not appropriate answers will also help you in understanding the subject so okay which of the following is not a cost to cure for environmental contamination so many a times you know in multiple choice questions the word not tends to get ignored so you know we are always in a hurry to read the question we will uh, read it as which of the following is a cost to cure for environmental contamination and the whole thing will go wrong so that is why i am saying read the question very carefully penalties and liabilities for non compliance wrong wrong answer Give me the only four options, please. Enhancement in production capacity. Enhancement of production capacity. Sir, enhancement of production capacity. Correct, correct. Because that is something that you know I am doing for my expansion program. It has nothing to do with the cost to cure. Okay, the Environment Protection Act was promulgated in which year and amended in which year? I will we will not tax you on this. The answer is 1986 and 1991. But once you you know studied all these things then these uh, dates etc will be better remembered by you the primary causes of acid rain are no2 and so2 correct no2 and so2 which act is known as an umbrella legislation eba 1986 which one eba 1986 see this is not the environment protection act environment protection act yes correct Marine life can perish in water polluted by sewage due to growth of algae. Growth of algae. No. The changes in the oxygen levels. Correct. The Forest Act, nineteen twenty-seven, categorizes how many types of forests? Three. Three, three types. Three. three. Noise can be defined as. Unwanted sound. Unwanted sound. Yeah. Absolutely correct. Which act stipulates provision of drinking water, toilets, accommodation, crashes, first aid, and canteens for workers? Building and construction of the site. Correct. Correct. Absolutely correct. Okay. Which act prohibits dumping of poisonous, noxious, or polluting matters into the streams and wells? NGT. NGT. NGT 2010. No. Sir, the Water Act. The Water Act, 1974, is correct. The Factories Act, 1948, is applicable to. So we are not talking about the jurisdiction. Sir, does not the NGT prohibit things to be entered into stream? No, no, no. It's the Water Act which says. Very no, no, no. Clearly. Uh, national uh, i i just uh, read somewhere that the national green tribunal in uh, mp uh, in the uh, 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 the nagri prashasan jo department hai sir hamare yahan the urban administration the urban administration department of uh, mp 
has uh, recently started making these treatment plants just before the uh, water stream so that the sewage get filtered out of it before mixing it ah, so maybe the so there is a disturbance coming from your mic i am not able to understand but from you know there is a possibility the national green tribunal act is saying that okay water which enters into the stream should be cleaned out yes sir okay but i am saying what which act is prohibiting dumping that's the water act so you have to read the uh, ngt act 2010 and understand what is the act, uh, ngt act trying to say okay the factories act 1948 is applicable to b a b b it is not correct more than 10 workers yeah correct more than 10 workers the property is said to be contaminated when the contamination has resulted these are all of the answer is all of these yes oh. but remember this is uh, this, this kind of matter only for the academic purpose but the main exam you will never have a uh, an option like all of the above or none of the above the cost due to disturbance experienced during remediation stage or trouble in operations due to contamination is known as disturbance experience during remediation stage cost of remediation cost of remediation. remediation no no then cost of operation cost of disruption is the right answer yeah oh. causes of That land pollution. causes of land pollution include read this very carefully please D. 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 For Delhi or B for Bombay? D. D. D for Delhi. D for Delhi. Delhi. D. Delhi. D. For Delhi. Delhi is not correct. No. Delhi is not correct. Then sir, it A. D for Agra. Agra is correct. So whenever you have a question like this, you know, where two, three, or four words have been given, so you have to. You have to read each and every word and try and understand whether or not it is causing land pollution. Okay, sir. Uh, D option. One, I mean, it uh, comprises of all the things, na, sir. See, urbanization, urbanization, transportation, agricultural chemicals. I understand can cause land pollution, but transportation may not cause land pollution. It can cause air pollution. But it can ultimately lead to death, na. No, no, no. But transportation directly is related to uh, air pollution. Urbanization, yes, cause land pollution. Oh. But acid rain, soil erosion, and solid waste—all three of them will cause land pollution. Deforestation and dust will cause land pollution, but not migration. Right? Okay, sir. Uh, so see this is the this is the trick with uh, uh, multiple choice question that you have to be very careful in uh, answering okay the national council for environment policy and planning was uh, set up in 72 keep on 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 For Agra? No. None of above. None of the above is the correct answer. Land pollution is not defined anywhere. Pollutants and contaminants have an adverse effect on the dash of an asset. Marketability. Correct. The thickness of ozone layer is approximately. Three mm. Which one? Two point five to three mm. Two point five to three mm. Not mm. 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 
यूज इन डैश केमिकल कंपाउंड यूज्ड इन डैश कैन कॉज ओजोन लेयर डिक्रीशन कोपेलेंट सर सर ओजोन लेयर डिक्रीज इज नॉट इन एमएम नो नो इट इज अप्रोक्सिमेटली इट्स इन डॉबसन यूनिट आई नो but i am just trying to test your understanding no what is the approximate thickness in terms of mm so ozone layer is uh, in some kilometers above and its thickness is in kilometers is it what of ozone layer there when the hole is found and this is 0.5 to 3 mm so see the thickness of ozone layer is measured in what is known as the dobson unit and it is about 230 to 300 dobson unit thick which is approximately 2 and a half to 3.5 mm right okay question 22 halons which are chemical compounds used in dash can cause ozone layer depletion like which one firefighting sir fire yeah fire fighting is correct firefighting a dump of contaminated material lying within an industrial area is an example of टॉपिक सो फार बट यू नो इफ यू कैन पुट इन some bit of uh, you know study a uh, time to this uh, you will be uh, in a very comfortable position to uh, you know crack this exam that's what i uh, personally feel i hope i have been able to convey to you the topic in as much comprehensive manner as i could i'm sorry i have overshot by about 20 minutes but uh, you know it's always nice that you don't have any other class hanging so you know there is no pressure i hope uh, i'm sure you've had a very long day uh, all the best for your exams please remember study well don't be in a hurry to you know take the exam it is going to test your fundamental understanding it's a very interesting uh, subject valuation and it will you know the entire and please download the book that is given the study material which is given on the ibbi website it's about 1975 odd pages you know try and get it printed the we you know maybe four volumes you'll have to print uh, but it's a treasure of knowledge you know you can learn so many things uh, which you've otherwise uh, you know you will not be able to learn and uh, all the best if there is anything that you wish to ask me my uh, contact details are there in the given at the end of the presentation you feel free to send me a whatsapp or feel free to uh, send me a mail You're most welcome All the best, guys. Thank you. Sir. Anything? Sir, anybody sir, thank want you. to ask for anything? Any any questions? Anything? Sir, no, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so All much, right. sir. Okay. Hey, sir. Bye, 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 bye. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello, sir. चलिए दिन के दिन के आखिरी में मेरी भी आवाज सुनी लीजिए आपका आज का सेशन खत्म होता है अब दिन तो थोड़ा सा ही बचा है आज के लिए रेस्ट कीजिए प्लीज कल मुलाकात होगी इंग्लिश प्लीज यस सर योर टुडे टुडे सेशन इज ऑलमोस्ट ओवर सर नाउ इज ऑलमोस्ट फिक्स अप क्लॉक प्लीज टेक सम रेस्ट योर टुमारो सेशन लिंक वी ऑलरेडी शेयर्ड इन योर मेल प्लीज चेक दिस लिंक एंड वी विल मीट टुमारो टुमारो मॉर्निंग गुड बाय गुड बाय एवरीवन गुड बाय प्लीज सर थैंक यू Thank you, sir. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. You. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.